Phase 3 The Precipice Deepening the Effect Through Extreme Measures The goal in this phase is to make everything deeper. The effect you have on their mind, feelings of love and attachment, tension within your victims. With your hooks deep into them, you can push them back and forth between hope and despair until they weaken and snap. Showing how far you are willing to go for your victims, doing some noble or chivalrous deed, chapter 16, Prove Yourself, will create a powerful jolt, spark an intensely positive reaction. Everyone has scars, repressed desires, and unfinished business from childhood. Bring these desires and wounds to the surface, make your victims feel they're getting what they never got as a child, and you will penetrate deep into their psyche. Stir uncontrollable emotions. Chapter 17. Effect a regression. Now you can take your victims past their limits, getting them to act out their dark sides, adding a sense of danger to your seduction. Chapter 18. Stir up the transgressive and taboo. You need to deepen the spell, and nothing will more confuse and enchant your victims than giving your seduction a spiritual veneer. It's not lust that motivates you, but destiny, divine thoughts, and everything elevated. Chapter 19. Use Spiritual Lures The erotic lurks beneath the spiritual. Now your victims have been properly set up. By deliberately hurting them, instilling fears and anxieties, you will lead them to the edge of the precipice from which it will be easy to push and make them fall. Chapter 20. Mix Pleasure with Pain They feel great tension and are yearning for relief. Chapter 16. Prove Yourself most people want to be seduced. If they resist your efforts, it's probably because you haven't gone far enough to allay their doubts about your motives, the depth of your feelings, and so on. One well-timed action that shows how far you are willing to go to win them over will dispel their doubts. Don't worry about looking foolish or making a mistake. Any kind of deed that is self-sacrificing and for your target's sake will so overwhelm their emotions they won't notice anything else. Never appear discouraged by people's resistance or complain. Instead, meet the challenge by doing something extreme or chivalrous. Conversely, spur others to prove themselves by making yourself hard to reach, unattainable, worth fighting over. Seductive Evidence Anyone can talk big, say lofty things about their feelings, insist on how much they care for us and also for all oppressed peoples in the far reaches of the planet. But if they never behave in a way that will back up their words, we begin to doubt their sincerity. Perhaps we're dealing with a charlatan or a hypocrite or a coward. Flattery and fine words can only go so far. A time will eventually arrive when you will have to show your victims some evidence to match your words with deeds. This kind of evidence has two functions. First, it allays any lingering doubts about you. Second, an action that reveals some positive quality in you is immensely seductive in and of itself. Brave or selfless deeds create a powerful and positive emotional reaction. Don't worry, your deeds don't have to be so brave and selfless that you lose everything in the process. The appearance alone of nobility will often suffice. In fact, in a world where people overanalyze and talk too much, any kind of action has a bracing, seductive effect. It's normal in the course of a seduction to encounter resistance. The more obstacles you overcome, of course, the greater the pleasure that awaits you. But many a seduction fails because the seducer doesn't correctly read the resistances of the target. More often than not, you give up too easily. First, understand a primary law of seduction. Resistance is a sign that the other person's emotions are engaged in the process. 
The only person you cannot seduce is somebody distant and cold. Resistance is emotional and can be transformed into its opposite, much as in jiu-jitsu the physical resistance of an opponent can be used to make him fall. If people resist you because they don't trust you, an apparently selfless deed showing how far you're willing to go to prove yourself is a powerful remedy. If they resist because they are virtuous or because they are loyal to someone else, all the better. Virtue and repressed desire are easily overcome by action. As the great seductress Natalie Barney once wrote, most virtue is a demand for greater seduction. There are two ways to prove yourself. First, the spontaneous action. A situation arises in which the target needs help, a problem needs solving, or simply he or she needs a favor. You cannot foresee these situations, but you must be ready for them, for they can spring up at any time. Impress the target by going further than really necessary, sacrificing more money, more time, more effort than they had expected. Your target will often use these moments or even manufacture them as a kind of test. Will you retreat? Or will you rise to the occasion? You cannot hesitate or flinch, even for a moment or all is lost. If necessary, make the deed seem to have cost you more than it has, never with words, but indirectly. Exhausted looks, reports spread through a third party, whatever it takes. The second way to prove yourself is the brave deed that you plan and execute in advance, on your own and at the right moment, preferably some way into the seduction, when any doubts the victim still has about you are more dangerous than earlier on. Choose a dramatic, difficult action that reveals the painful time and effort involved. Danger can be extremely seductive. Cleverly lead your victim into a crisis, a moment of danger, or indirectly put them in an uncomfortable position, and you can play the rescuer, the gallant knight. The powerful feelings and emotions this elicits can easily be redirected into love. Some examples. Number 1. In France, in the 1640s, Marion de Lorme was the courtesan men lusted after the most. Renowned for her beauty, she had been the mistress of Cardinal Richelieu, among other notable political and military figures. To win her bed was a sign of achievement. For weeks, the rake, Count Gramont, had wooed de Lorme, and finally she had given him an appointment for a particular evening. The Count prepared himself for a delightful encounter, but on the day of the appointment he received a letter from her, in which she explained in polite and tender terms her terrible regrets she had the most awful headache and would have to stay in bed that evening. Their appointment would have to be postponed. The Count felt certain he was being pushed to the side for someone else, for Delorme was as capricious as she was beautiful. Gramont did not hesitate. At nightfall he rode to the Marais, where Delorme lived, and scouted the area. In a square near her home he spotted a man approaching on foot. Recognizing the Duc de Brissac, he immediately knew that this man was to supplant him in the courtesan's bed. Brissac seemed unhappy to see the Count, and so Gramont approached him hurriedly and said, Brissac, my friend, you must do me a service of the greatest importance— I have an appointment for the first time with a girl who lives near this place, and as this visit is only to concert measures, I shall make but a very short stay. Be so kind as to lend me your cloak and walk my horse a little until I return, but above all, do not go far from this place. Without waiting for an answer, Gramont took the duke's cloak and handed him the bridle of his horse. Looking back, he saw that Brissac was watching him, so he pretended to enter a house, slipped out through the back, circled around, and reached Delorme's house without being seen. Grammont knocked at the door, and a servant, mistaking him for the duke, let him in. He headed straight for the lady's chamber, where he found her lying on a couch in a sheer gown. He threw off Brissac's cloak, and she gasped in fright. "'What's the matter, my fair one?' he asked. "'Your headache, to all appearance, is gone?' 
She seemed put out, exclaimed she still had the headache, and insisted that he leave. It was up to her, she said, to make or break appointments. Madam, Gramont said calmly, I know what perplexes you. You are afraid lest Brissac should meet me here, but you may make yourself easy on that account. He then opened the window and revealed Brissac out in the square, dutifully walking back and forth with a horse like a common stable boy. He looked ridiculous. Delorme burst out laughing, threw her arms around the Count, and exclaimed, My dear Chevalier, I can hold out no longer. You are too amiable and too eccentric not to be pardoned. He told her the whole story, and she promised that the Duke could exercise horses all night, but she would not let him in. They made an appointment for the following evening. Outside, the Count returned the cloak, apologized for taking so long, and thanked the Duke. Brissac was most gracious, even holding Grammont's horse for him to mount and waving goodbye as he rode off. Interpretation Count Grammont knew that most would-be seducers give up too easily, mistaking capriciousness or apparent coldness as a sign of a genuine lack of interest. In fact, it can mean many things. Perhaps the person is testing you, wondering if you're really serious. Prickly behavior is exactly this kind of test. If you give up at the first sign of difficulty, you obviously do not want them that much. Or it could be that they themselves are uncertain about you, or are trying to choose between you and someone else. In any event, it's absurd to give up. One incontrovertible demonstration of how far you're willing to go will overwhelm all doubts. It will also defeat your rivals, since most people are timid, worried about making fools of themselves, and so rarely risk anything. When dealing with difficult or resistant targets, it's usually best to improvise the way Gramont did. If your action seems sudden and a surprise, it will make them more emotional, loosen them up. A little roundabout accumulation of information, a little spying, is always a good idea. Most important is the spirit in which you enact your proof. If you're light-hearted and playful, if you make the target laugh, proving yourself and amusing them at the same time, it won't matter if you mess up or if they see you've employed a little trickery. They will give in to the pleasant mood you've created. Notice that the Count never whined or grew angry or defensive. All he had to do was pull back the curtain and reveal the Duke walking his horse, melting Delorme's resistance with laughter. In one well-executed act, he showed what he would do for a night of her favors. Number 2 Pauline Bonaparte, the sister of Napoleon, had so many affairs with different men over the years that doctors were afraid for her health. She could not stay with one man for more than a few weeks. Novelty was her only pleasure. After Napoleon married her off to Prince Camillo Borghese in 1803, her affairs only multiplied. And so, when she met the dashing major Jules de Canouville in 1810, everyone assumed the affair would last no longer than the others. Of course, the major was a decorated soldier, well-educated, an accomplished dancer, and one of the most handsome men in the army. But Pauline, thirty years old at the time, had had affairs with dozens of men who could have matched that resume. A few days after the affair began, the imperial dentist arrived chez Pauline. A toothache had been causing her sleepless nights, and the dentist saw he would have to pull out the bad tooth right then and there. No painkillers were used at the time, and as the man began to take out his various instruments, Pauline grew terrified. Despite the pain of the tooth... She changed her mind and refused to have it pulled. Major Canouville was lounging on a couch in a silken robe. Taking all this in, he tried to encourage her to have it done. A moment or two of pain and it's over forever. A child could go through with it and not utter a sound, he said. I'd like to see you do it, she said. Canouville got up, went over to the dentist, chose a tooth in the back of his own mouth, 
and ordered that it be pulled. A perfectly good tooth was extracted, and Canoville barely batted an eyelash. After this, not only did Pauline let the dentist do his job, her opinion of Canoville changed. No man had ever done anything like this for her before. The affair had been going to last but a few weeks. Now it stretched on. Napoleon was not pleased. Pauline was a married woman. Short affairs were allowed, but a deep attachment was embarrassing. He sent Canoville to Spain to deliver a message to a general there. The mission would take weeks, and in the meantime Pauline would find someone else. Canoville, though, was not your average lover. Riding day and night, without stopping to eat or sleep, he arrived in Salamanca within a few days. There he found that he could proceed no farther, since communications had been cut off, and so, without waiting for further orders, he rode back to Paris, without an escort, through enemy territory. He could meet with Pauline only briefly. Napoleon sent him right back to Spain. It was months before he was finally allowed to return, but when he did, Pauline immediately resumed her affair with him, an unheard-of act of loyalty on her part. This time, Napoleon sent Canouville to Germany, and finally to Russia, where he died bravely in battle in 1812. He was the only lover Pauline ever waited for, and the only one she ever mourned. Interpretation In seduction, the time often comes when the target has begun to fall for you, but suddenly pulls back. Your motives have begun to seem dubious. Perhaps all you are after is sexual favors, or power, or money. Most people are insecure, and doubts like these can ruin the seductive illusion. In the case of Pauline Bonaparte, she was quite accustomed to using men for pleasure, and she knew perfectly well that she was being used in turn. She was totally cynical. But people often use cynicism to cover up insecurity. Pauline's secret anxiety was that none of her lovers had ever really loved her, that all of them, to a man, had really just wanted sex or political favors from her. When Canoville showed, through concrete actions, the sacrifices he would make for her, his tooth, his career, his life, he transformed a deeply selfish woman into a devoted lover. Not that her response was completely unselfish. His deeds were a boost to her vanity. If she could inspire these actions from him, she must be worth it. But if he was going to appeal to the noble side of her nature, she had to rise to that level as well and prove herself by remaining loyal to him. Making your deed as dashing and chivalrous as possible will elevate the seduction to a new level— stir up deep emotions, and conceal any ulterior motives you may have. The sacrifices you're making must be visible. Talking about them or explaining what they've cost you will seem like bragging. Lose sleep. Fall ill. Lose valuable time. Put your career on the line. Spend more money than you can afford. You can exaggerate all this for effect, but don't get caught boasting about it or feeling sorry for yourself. Cause yourself pain and let them see it. Since almost everyone else in the world seems to have an angle, your noble and selfless deed will be irresistible. Number 3 Throughout the 1890s and into the early 20th century, Gabriele D'Annunzio was considered one of Italy's premier novelists and playwrights. Yet many Italians could not stand the man. His writing was florid, and in person he seemed full of himself, overdramatic, riding horses naked on the beach, pretending to be a Renaissance man, and more of the kind. His novels were often about war and about the glory of facing and defeating death, an entertaining subject for someone who had never actually done so. And so, at the start of World War I, no one was surprised that D'Annunzio led the call for Italy to side with the Allies and enter the fray. Everywhere you turned, there he was, giving a speech in favor of war, a campaign that succeeded in 1915 when Italy finally declared war on Germany and Austria. 
D'Annunzio's role so far had been completely predictable, but what did surprise the Italian public was what this 52-year-old man did next. He joined the army. He had never served in the military. Boats made him seasick, but he could not be dissuaded. Eventually, the authorities gave him a post in a cavalry division, hoping to keep him out of combat. Italy had little experience in war, and its military was somewhat chaotic. The generals somehow lost track of D'Annunzio, who in any case had decided to leave his cavalry division and form units of his own. He was an artist, after all, and could not be subjected to army discipline. Calling himself Comandante, he overcame his habitual seasickness and directed a series of daring raids, leading groups of motorboats in the middle of the night into Austrian harbors and firing torpedoes at anchored ships. He also learned how to fly and began to lead dangerous sorties. In August of 1915, he flew over the city of Trieste, then in enemy hands, and dropped Italian flags and thousands of pamphlets containing a message of hope, written in his inimitable style. The end of your martyrdom is at hand. The dawn of your joy is imminent. From the heights of heaven on the wings of Italy, I throw you this pledge, this message from my heart. He flew at altitudes unheard of at the time and through thick enemy fire. The Austrians put a price on his head. On a mission in 1916, D'Annunzio fell against his machine gun, permanently injuring one eye and seriously damaging the other. Told his flying days were over, he convalesced in his home in Venice. At the time, the most beautiful and fashionable woman in Italy was generally considered to be the Countess Morosini, former mistress of the German Kaiser. Her palace was on the Grand Canal, opposite the home of D'Annunzio. Now she found herself besieged by letters and poems from the writer-soldier, mixing details of his flying exploits with declarations of his love. In the middle of air raids on Venice, he would cross the canal, barely able to see out of one eye, to deliver his latest poem. D'Annunzio was much beneath Morosini's station, a mere writer, but his willingness to brave anything on her behalf won her over. The fact that his reckless behavior could get him killed any day only hastened the seduction. D'Annunzio ignored the doctor's advice and returned to flying, leading even more daring raids than before. By the end of the war, he was Italy's most decorated hero. Now, wherever in the nation he appeared, the public filled the piazzas to hear his speeches. After the war, he led a march on Fiume, on the Adriatic coast. In the negotiations to settle the war, Italians believed they should have been awarded this city. But the Allies had not agreed. D'Annunzio's forces took over the city, and the poet became a leader, ruling Fiume for more than a year as an autonomous republic. By then, everyone had forgotten about his less-than-glorious past as a decadent writer. Now. He could do no wrong. Interpretation The appeal of seduction is that of being separated from our normal routines, experiencing the thrill of the unknown. Death is the ultimate unknown. In periods of chaos, confusion, and death, the plagues that swept Europe in the Middle Ages, the terror of the French Revolution, the air raids on London during World War II— People often let go of their usual caution and do things they never would otherwise. They experience a kind of delirium. There is something immensely seductive about danger, about heading into the unknown. Show that you have a reckless streak and a daring nature, that you lack the usual fear of death, and you are instantly fascinating to the bulk of humanity. What you are proving in this instance is not how you feel toward another person, but something about yourself. You are willing to go out on a limb. You're not just another talker and braggart. 
It's a recipe for instant charisma. Any political figure, Churchill, de Gaulle, Kennedy, who has proven himself on the battlefield, has an unmatchable appeal. Many had thought of D'Annunzio as a foppish womanizer. His experience in the war gave him a heroic sheen, a Napoleonic aura. In fact, he had always been an effective seducer, but now he was even more devilishly appealing. You do not necessarily have to risk death, but putting yourself in its vicinity will give you a seductive charge. It's often best to do this some way into the seduction, making it come as a pleasant surprise. You are willing to enter the unknown. No one is more seductive than the person who has had a brush with death. People will be drawn to you. Perhaps they're hoping that some of your adventurous spirit will rub off on them. Number 4. According to one version of the Arthurian legend, the great knight Sir Lancelot once caught a glimpse of Queen Guinevere, King Arthur's wife, and that glimpse was enough. He fell madly in love. And so when word reached him that Queen Guinevere had been kidnapped by an evil knight, Lancelot did not hesitate. He forgot his other chivalrous tasks and hurried in pursuit. His horse collapsed from the chase, so he continued on foot. Finally, it seemed that he was close, but he was exhausted and could go no farther. A horse-driven cart passed by. The cart was filled with loathsome-looking men shackled together. In those days, it was the tradition to place criminals, murderers, traitors, cowards, thieves, in such a cart, which then passed through every street in town so that people could see it. Once you had ridden in the cart, you lost all feudal rights for the rest of your life. The cart was such a dreadful symbol that seeing an empty one made you shiver and give the sign of the cross. Even so, Sir Lancelot accosted the cart's driver, a dwarf. In the name of God, tell me if you've seen my lady, the queen, pass by this way, he said. If you want to get into this cart I'm driving, said the dwarf, by tomorrow you'll know what has become of the queen. Then he drove the cart onward. Lancelot hesitated for but two of the horse's steps, then ran after it and climbed in. Wherever the cart went, townspeople heckled it. They were most curious about the knight among the passengers. What was his crime? How will he be put to death? Flayed? Drowned? Burned upon a fire of thorns? Finally, the dwarf let him get out without a word as to the whereabouts of the queen. To make matters worse, no one now would go near or talk to Lancelot, for he had been in the cart. He kept on chasing the queen, and all along the way he was cursed at, spat upon, challenged by other knights. He had disgraced knighthood by riding in the cart. But no one could stop him or slow him down. And finally, he discovered that the queen's kidnapper was the wicked Meliagant. He caught up with Meliagant, and the two fought a duel. Still weak from the chase, Lancelot seemed to be near defeat, but when word reached him that the queen was watching the battle, he recovered his strength and was on the verge of killing Meliagant when a truce was called. Guinevere was handed over to him. Lancelot could hardly contain his joy at the thought of finally being in his lady's presence, but to his shock she seemed angry and would not look at her rescuer. She told Meliagant's father, Sire, in truth he has wasted his efforts. I shall always deny that I feel any gratitude toward him. Lancelot was mortified, but he did not complain. Much later, after undergoing innumerable further trials, she finally relented, and they became lovers. One day he asked her, when she had been abducted by Meliagant, had she heard the story of the cart and how he had disgraced knighthood? Was that why she had treated him so coldly that day? The queen replied, By delaying for two steps, you showed your unwillingness to climb into it. That, to tell the truth, is why I didn't wish to see you or speak with you. Interpretation The opportunity to do your selfless deed often comes upon you suddenly. 
You have to show your worth in an instant, right there on the spot. It could be a rescue situation, a gift you could make, or a favor you could do, a sudden request to drop everything and come to their aid. What matters most is not whether you act rashly, make a mistake, and do something foolish, but that you seem to act on their behalf without thought for yourself or the consequences. At moments like these, hesitation, even for a few seconds, can ruin all the hard work of your seduction, revealing you as self-absorbed, unchivalrous, and cowardly. This, at any rate, is the moral of Chrétien de Troyes' 12th century version of the story of Lancelot. Remember, not only what you do matters, but how you do it. If you are naturally self-absorbed, learn to disguise it. React as spontaneously as possible, exaggerating the effect by seeming flustered, overexcited, even foolish. Love has driven you to that point. If you have to jump into the cart for Guinevere's sake, make sure she sees that you do it without the slightest hesitation. Number 5 In Rome, sometime around 1531, word spread of a sensational young woman named Tullia d'Aragona. By the standards of the period, Tullia was not a classic beauty. She was tall and thin, at a time when the plump and voluptuous woman was considered the ideal. And she lacked the cloying, giggling manner of most young girls who wanted masculine attention. No, her quality was nobler. Her Latin was perfect. She could discuss the latest literature. She played the lute and sang. In other words, she was a novelty. And since that was all most men were looking for, they began to visit her in great numbers. She had a lover, a diplomat, and the thought that one man had won her physical favors drove them all mad. Her male visitors began to compete for her attention, writing poems in her honor, vying to become her favorite. None of them succeeded, but they kept on trying. Of course, there were some who were offended by her, stating publicly that she was no more than a high-class whore. They repeated the rumor, perhaps true, that she had made older men dance while she played the lute, and if their dancing pleased her, they could hold her in their arms. To Tullia's faithful followers, all of noble birth, this was slander. They wrote a document that was distributed far and wide. It said, Our honored mistress, the well-born and honorable Lady Tullia d'Aragona, doth surpass all ladies of the past, present, or future by her dazzling qualities. Anyone who refuses to conform to this statement is hereby charged to enter the lists with one of the undersigned knights, who will convince him in the customary manner. Tullia left Rome in 1535, going first to Venice, where the poet Tasso became her lover, and eventually to Ferrara, which was then perhaps the most civilized court in Italy. And what a sensation she caused there! Her voice, her singing, even her poems were praised far and wide. She opened a literary academy devoted to ideas of free thinking. She called herself a muse, and, as in Rome, a group of young men collected around her. They would follow her around the city, carving her name in trees, writing sonnets in her honor, and singing them to anyone who would listen. One young nobleman was driven to distraction by this cult of adoration. It seemed that everyone loved Tullia, but no one received her love in return. Determined to steal her away and marry her, this young man tricked her into allowing him to visit her at night. He proclaimed his undying devotion, showered her with jewels and presents, and asked for her hand. She refused. He pulled out a knife— she still refused, and so he stabbed himself. He lived, but now Tullia's reputation was even greater than before. Not even money could buy her favors, or so it seemed. As the years went by and her beauty faded, some poet or intellectual would always come to her defense and protect her. Few of them ever pondered the reality that Tullia was indeed a courtesan, 
one of the most popular and well-paid in the profession. Interpretation All of us have defects of some sort. Some of these we're born with and cannot help. Tulia had many such defects. Physically, she was not the Renaissance ideal. Also, her mother had been a courtesan, and she was illegitimate. Yet the men who fell under her spell didn't care. They were too distracted by her image. The image of an elevated woman, a woman you would have to fight over to win. Her pose came straight out of the Middle Ages, the days of knights and troubadours. Then a woman, most often married, was able to control the power dynamic between the sexes by withholding her favors until the knight somehow proved his worth and the sincerity of his sentiments. He could be sent on a quest, or made to live among lepers, or compete in a possibly fatal joust for her honor. And this he had to do without complaint. Although the days of the troubadour are long gone, the pattern remains. A man actually loves to be able to prove himself, to be challenged, to compete, to undergo tests and trials, and emerge victorious. He has a masochistic streak. A part of him loves pain. And strangely enough, the more a woman asks for, the worthier she seems. A woman who is easy to get cannot be worth much. Make people compete for your attention. Make them prove themselves in some way, and you will find them rising to the challenge. The heat of seduction is raised by such challenges. Show me that you really love me. When one person of either sex rises to the occasion, often the other person is now expected to do the same, and the seduction heightens. By making people prove themselves, too, you raise your value and cover up your defects. Your targets are too busy trying to prove themselves to notice your blemishes and faults. Reversal When trying to prove that you are worthy of your target, remember that every target sees things differently. A show of physical prowess will not impress someone who doesn't value physical prowess. It will just show that you're after attention, flaunting yourself. Seducers must adapt their way of proving themselves to the doubts and weaknesses of the seduced. For some, fine words are better proofs than daredevil deeds, particularly if they are written down. With these people, show your sentiments in a letter, a different kind of physical proof, and one with more poetic appeal than some showy bit of action. Know your target well and aim your seductive evidence at the source of their doubts or resistance. Chapter 17 Effect a Regression People who have experienced a certain kind of pleasure in the past will try to repeat or relive it. The deepest rooted and most pleasurable memories are usually those from earliest childhood and are often unconsciously associated with the parental figure. Bring your targets back to that point by placing yourself in the Oedipal Triangle and positioning them as the needy child. Unaware of the cause of their emotional response, they will fall in love with you. Alternatively, you too can regress, letting them play the role of the protecting, nursing parent. In either case, you are offering the ultimate fantasy, the chance to have an intimate relationship with mommy or daddy, son or daughter. The Erotic Regression As adults, we tend to overvalue our childhood. In their dependency and powerlessness, children genuinely suffer— Yet, when we get older, we conveniently forget about that and sentimentalize the supposed paradise we have left behind. We forget the pain and remember only the pleasure. Why? Because the responsibilities of adult life are a burden so oppressive at times that we secretly yearn for the dependency of childhood, for that person who looked after our every need, assumed our cares and worries. This daydream of ours has a strong erotic component, for the child's feelings of being dependent on the parent is charged with sexual undertones.
Give people a sensation similar to that protected, dependent feeling of childhood, and they will project all kinds of fantasies onto you, including feelings of love or sexual attraction that they will attribute to something else. We won't admit it, but we long to regress, to shed our adult exterior and vent the childish emotions that linger beneath the surface. Early in his career, Sigmund Freud confronted a strange problem. Many of his female patients were falling in love with him. He thought he knew what was happening. Encouraged by Freud, the patient would delve into her childhood, which, of course, was the source of her illness or neuroses. She would talk about her relationship with her father, her earliest experiences of tenderness and love, and also of neglect and abandonment. The process would stir up powerful emotions and memories. In a way, she would be transported back into her childhood. Intensifying this effect was the fact that Freud himself said little and made himself a little cold and distant, although he seemed to be caring. In other words, quite like the traditional father figure. Meanwhile, the patient was lying on a couch in a helpless or passive position, so that the situation duplicated the roles of parent and child. Eventually, she would begin to direct some of the confused emotions she was dealing with toward Freud himself. Unaware of what was happening, she would relate to him as to her father. She would regress and fall in love. Freud called this phenomenon transference, and it would become an active part of his therapy. By getting patients to transfer some of their repressed feelings onto the therapist, he would bring their problems into the open, where they could be dealt with on a conscious level. The transference effect was so potent, though, that Freud was unable to move his patients past their infatuation. In fact, transference is a powerful way of creating an emotional attachment, the goal of any seduction. The method has infinite applications outside psychoanalysis. To practice it in real life, you need to play the therapist, encouraging people to talk about their childhood. Most of us are only too happy to oblige, and our memories are so vivid and emotional that a part of us regresses just in talking about our early years. Also, in the course of talking, Little secrets slip out. We reveal all kinds of valuable information about our weaknesses and our mental makeup, information you must attend to and remember. Do not take your target's words at face value. They will often sugarcoat or overdramatize events in childhood, but pay attention to their tone of voice, to any nervous tics as they talk, and particularly to anything they don't want to talk about, anything they deny. Or that makes them emotional. Many statements actually mean their opposite. Should they say they hated their father, for instance, you can be sure that they're hiding a lot of disappointment, that they actually loved their father only too much, and perhaps never quite got what they wanted from him. Listen closely for recurring themes and stories. Most important, learn to analyze emotional responses and see what lies behind them. While they talk, maintain the therapist's pose, attentive but quiet, making occasional non-judgmental comments. Be caring yet distant, somewhat blank, in fact, and they will begin to transfer emotions and project fantasies onto you. With the information you've gathered about their childhood and the trusting bond you have forged, you can now begin to effect the regression. Perhaps you have uncovered a powerful attachment to a parent, a sibling, a teacher, or any early infatuation, a person who casts a shadow over their present lives. Knowing what it was about this person that affected them so powerfully, you can now take over that role. Or perhaps you have learned of an immense gap in their childhood, a neglectful father, for instance. You act like that parent now, but you replace the original neglect with the attention and affection that the real parent never supplied. Everyone has unfinished business from childhood, disappointments, lacks, painful memories. Finish what is unfinished. Discover what your target never got, and you have the ingredients for a deep-rooted seduction. The key is not just to talk about memories, 
that is weak. What you want is to get people to act out in their present old issues from their past without their being aware of what is happening. The regressions you can affect fall into four main types. The infantile regression. The first bond, the bond between a mother and her infant, is the most powerful one. Unlike other animals, human babies have a long period of helplessness during which they are dependent on their mother, creating an attachment that influences the rest of their lives. The key to effecting this regression is to reproduce the sense of unconditional love a mother has for her child. Never judge your targets. Let them do whatever they want, including behaving badly. At the same time, surround them with a loving attention. Smother them with comfort. A part of them will regress to those earliest years when their mother took care of everything and rarely left them alone. This works on almost everyone, for unconditional love is the rarest and most treasured form. You don't even have to tailor your behavior to anything specific in their childhood. Most of us have experienced this kind of attention. Meanwhile, create atmospheres that reinforce the feeling you're generating. Warm environments, playful activities, bright, happy colors. The Oedipal Regression After the bond between mother and child comes the Oedipal Triangle of mother, father, and child. This triangle forms during the period of the child's earliest erotic fantasies. A boy wants his mother to himself. A girl does the same with her father. But they never quite have it that way, for a parent will always have competing connections to a spouse or to other adults. Unconditional love has gone. Now, inevitably, the parent must sometimes deny what the child desires. Transport your victims back to this period. Play a parental role. Be loving, but also sometimes scold and instill some discipline. Children actually love a little discipline. It makes them feel that the adult cares about them. And adult children, too, will be thrilled if you mix your tenderness with a little toughness and punishment. Unlike infantile regression, Oedipal regression must be tailored to your target. It depends on the information you have gathered. Without knowing enough, you might treat a person like a child, scolding them now and then, only to discover that you're stirring up ugly memories. They had too much discipline as a child. Or you might stir up memories of a parent they loathed, and they will transfer those feelings to you. Do not go ahead with the regression until you've learned everything you can about their childhood, what they had too much of, what they lacked, and so on. If the target was strongly attached to a parent, but that attachment was partially negative, the Oedipal regression strategy can still be quite effective. We always feel ambivalent toward a parent. Even as we love them, we resent having had to depend on them. Don't worry about stirring up these ambivalences, which don't keep us from being tied to our parents. Remember to include an erotic component in your parental behavior. Now your targets are not only getting their mother or father all to themselves, they're getting something more, something previously forbidden, but now allowed. The Ego Ideal Regression as children, we often form an ideal figure out of our dreams and ambitions. First, that ideal figure is the person we want to be. We imagine ourselves as brave adventurers, romantic figures. Then, in our adolescence, we turn our attention to others, often projecting our ideals onto them. The first boy or girl we fall in love with may seem to have the ideal qualities we wanted for ourselves, or else may make us feel that we can play that ideal role in relation to them. Most of us carry these ideals around with us, buried just below the surface. We are secretly disappointed in how much we have had to compromise, how far below the ideal we've fallen as we have gotten older. Make your targets feel they're living out this youthful ideal and coming closer to being the person they wanted to be. And you will affect a different kind of regression— creating a feeling reminiscent of adolescence. The relationship between you and the seduced is in this instance more equal than in the previous kinds of regressions, more like the affection between siblings. In fact, the ideal is often modeled on a brother or sister. 
To create this effect, strive to reproduce the intense, innocent mood of a youthful infatuation. The Reverse Parental Regression Here, you are the one to regress. You deliberately play the role of the cute, adorable, yet also sexually charged child. Older people always find younger people incredibly seductive. In the presence of youth, they feel a little of their own youth return, but they are in fact older, and mixed into the invigoration they feel in young people's company is the pleasure of playing the mother or father to them. If a child has erotic feelings toward a parent, feelings that are quickly repressed, the parent must deal with the same problem in reverse. Assume the role of the child in relation to your targets, however, and they get to act out some of those repressed erotic sentiments. The strategy may seem to call for a difference in age, but this is actually not critical. Marilyn Monroe's exaggerated little girl qualities work just fine on men her age. Emphasizing a weakness or vulnerability on your part will give the target a chance to play the protector. Some examples. Number one. The parents of Victor Hugo separated shortly after the novelist was born in 1802. Hugo's mother, Sophie, had been carrying on an affair with her husband's superior officer, a general. She took the three Hugo boys away from their father and went off to Paris to raise them on her own. Now the boys led a tumultuous life, featuring bouts of poverty, frequent moves, and their mother's continued affair with the general. Of all the boys, Victor was the most attached to his mother, adopting all her ideas and pet peeves, particularly her hatred of his father. But with all the turmoil in his childhood, he never felt he got enough love and attention from the mother he adored. When she died in 1821, poor and debt-ridden, he was devastated. The following year, Hugo married his childhood sweetheart, Adele, who physically resembled his mother. It was a happy marriage for a while, but soon Adele came to resemble his mother in more ways than one. In 1832, he discovered that she was having an affair with the French literary critic Saint-Beuve, who also happened to be Hugo's best friend at the time. Hugo was a celebrated writer by now, but he wasn't the calculating type. He generally wore his heart on his sleeve. Yet he couldn't confide in anyone about Adele's affair. It was too humiliating. His only solution was to have affairs on his own, with actresses, courtesans, married women. Hugo had a prodigious appetite, sometimes visiting three different women in the same day. Near the end of 1832, production began on one of Hugo's plays, and he was to supervise the casting. A 26-year-old actress named Juliette Drouet auditioned for one of the smaller roles. Normally quite adroit with the ladies, Hugo found himself stuttering in Juliette's presence. She was quite simply the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, and this and her composed manner intimidated him. Naturally, Juliette won the part. He found himself thinking about her all the time. She always seemed to be surrounded by a group of adoring men. Clearly, she wasn't interested in him, or so he thought. One evening, though, after a performance of the play, he followed her home to find that she was neither angry nor surprised. Indeed, she invited him up to her apartment. He spent the night, and soon he was spending almost every night there. Hugo was happy again. To his delight, Juliette quit her career in the theater, dropped her former friends, and learned to cook. She had loved fancy clothes and social affairs. Now she became Hugo's secretary, rarely leaving the apartment in which he had established her and seeming to live only for his visits. After a while, however, Hugo returned to his old ways and started to have little affairs on the side. She did not complain, as long as she remained the one woman he kept returning to. And Hugo had, in fact, grown quite dependent on her. In 1843, Hugo's beloved daughter died in an accident, and he sank into a depression. The only way he knew to get over his grief was to have an affair with someone new— 
And so, shortly thereafter, he fell in love with a young, married aristocrat named Leonie Donnet. He began to see Juliette less and less. A few years later, Leonie, feeling certain she was the preferred one, gave him an ultimatum. Stop seeing Juliette altogether or it was over. Hugo refused. Instead, he decided to stage a contest. He would continue to see both women, and in a few months, his heart would tell him which one he preferred. Leonie was furious, but she had no choice. Her affair with Hugo had already ruined her marriage and her standing in society. She was dependent on him. Anyway, how could she lose? She was in the prime of her life, whereas Juliette had gray hair by now. So she pretended to go along with this contest, but as time went on, she grew increasingly resentful about it and complained. Juliette, on the other hand, behaved as if nothing had changed. Whenever he visited, she treated him as she always had, dropping everything to comfort and mother him. The contest lasted several years. In 1851, Hugo was in trouble with Louis Napoleon, the cousin of Napoleon Bonaparte and now the president of France. Hugo had attacked his dictatorial tendencies in the press, bitterly and perhaps recklessly, for Louis Napoleon was a vengeful man. Fearing for the writer's life, Juliette managed to hide him in a friend's house and arranged for a false passport, a disguise, and safe passage to Brussels. Everything went according to plan. Juliette joined him a few days later, carrying his most valuable possessions. Clearly, her heroic actions had won the contest for her. And yet, after the novelty of Hugo's new life were off, his affairs resumed. Finally, fearing for his health and worried that she could no longer compete with yet another twenty-year-old coquette, Juliette made a calm but stern demand. No more women, or she was leaving him. Taken completely by surprise, yet certain that she meant every word, Hugo broke down and sobbed. An old man, by now, he got down on his knees and swore on the Bible and then on a copy of his most famous novel, Les Miserables, that he would stray no more. Until Juliette's death in 1883, her spell over him was complete. Interpretation Hugo's love life was determined by his relationship with his mother. He never felt she had loved him enough. Almost all the women he had affairs with bore a physical resemblance to her. Somehow, he would make up for her lack of love for him by sheer volume. When Juliette met him, she couldn't have known all this, but she must have sensed two things. He was extremely disappointed in his wife, and he had never really grown up. His emotional outbursts and his need for attention made him more a little boy than a man. She would gain ascendancy over him for the rest of his life by supplying the one thing he had never had, complete, unconditional mother love. Juliette never judged Hugo or criticized him for his naughty ways. She lavished him with attention. Visiting her was like returning to the womb. In her presence, in fact, he was more a little boy than ever. How could he refuse her a favor or ever leave her? And when she finally threatened to leave him, he was reduced to the state of a wailing infant crying for his mother. In the end, she had total power over him. Unconditional love is rare and hard to find, yet it is what we all crave since we either experienced it once or wish we had. You don't have to go as far as Juliette Drouet. The mere hint of devoted attention, of accepting your lovers for who they are, of meeting their needs, will place them in an infantile position. A sense of dependency may frighten them a little, and they may feel an undercurrent of ambivalence, a need to assert themselves periodically, as Hugo did through his affairs. But their ties to you will be strong, and they will keep coming back for more, bound by the illusion that they are recapturing the mother love they had seemingly lost forever, or never had. Number 2 Around the turn of the 20th century, Professor Muth, a schoolmaster at a college for young men in a small German town, 
began to develop a keen hatred of his students. Mut was in his late fifties and had worked at the same school for many years. He taught Greek and Latin and was a distinguished classical scholar. He had always felt a need to impose discipline, but now it was getting ugly. The students were simply not interested in Homer anymore. They listened to bad music and only liked modern literature. Although they were rebellious, Mut considered them soft and undisciplined. He wanted to teach them a lesson and make their lives miserable. His usual way of dealing with their bouts of rowdiness was sheer bullying, and most often it worked. One day, a student Moot loathed, a haughty, well-dressed young man named Loman, stood up in class and said, "I can't go on working in this room, Professor. There is such a smell of mud." Mud was the boy's nickname for Professor Moot. The professor seized Loman by the arm, twisted it hard, then banished him from the room. He later noticed that Loman had left his exercise book behind, and thumbing through it, he saw a paragraph about an actress named Rosa Fröhlich. A plot hatched in Mut's mind. He would catch Loman cavorting with this actress, no doubt a woman of ill repute, and would get the boy kicked out of school. First, he had to find out where she performed. He searched high and low, finally finding her name up outside a club called the Blue Angel. He went in. It was a smoke-filled place full of working-class types. He looked down on. Rosa was on stage. She was singing a song. The way she looked everyone in the audience in the eye was rather brazen, but for some reason, Moot found this disarming. He relaxed a little. Had some wine. After her performance, he made his way to her dressing room, determined to grill her about Loman. Once there, he felt strangely uncomfortable. But he gathered up his courage, accused her of leading schoolboys astray, and threatened to get the police to close the place down. Rosa, however, was not intimidated. She turned all of Moot's sentences around. Perhaps he was the one leading boys astray. Her tone was cajoling and teasing. Yes, Loman had brought her flowers and champagne. So what? No one had ever talked to Moot this way before. His authoritative tone usually made people give way. He should have felt offended. She was low class and a woman, and he was a schoolmaster. But she was talking to him as if they were equals. Instead, however, he neither got angry nor left. Something compelled him to stay. Now. She was silent. She picked up a stocking and started to darn it, ignoring him. His eyes followed her every move, particularly the way she rubbed her bare knee. Finally, he brought up Loman again and the police. "You've no idea what this life's like," she said. "Everyone who comes here thinks he's the only pebble on the beach. If you don't give them what they want, they threaten you with the police." I certainly regret having hurt a lady's feelings," he replied sheepishly. As she got up from her chair, their knees rubbed, and he felt a shiver up his spine. Now she was nice to him again and poured him some more wine. She invited him to come back, then left abruptly to perform another number. The next day, he kept thinking about her words, her looks. Thinking about her while he was teaching gave him a kind of naughty thrill. That night he went back to the club, still determined to catch Loman in the act, and once again found himself in Rosa's dressing room, drinking wine and becoming strangely passive. She asked him to help her get dressed. That seemed quite an honor, and he obliged her, helping her with her corset and her makeup. He forgot about Loman. He felt he was being initiated into some new world. She pinched his cheeks and stroked his chin, and occasionally let him glimpse her bare leg as she rolled up a stocking. Now Professor Moot showed up night after night, helping her dress, watching her perform, all with a strange kind of pride. He was there so often that Loman and his friends no longer showed up. He had taken their place. He was the one to bring her flowers, pay for her champagne, the one to serve her. Yes, an old man like himself had bested the youthful Loman.
who thought himself so suave. He liked it when she stroked his chin, complimented him for doing things right, but he felt even more excited when she rebuked him, throwing a powder puff in his face or pushing him off a chair. It meant she liked him. And so, gradually, he began to pay for all her caprices. It cost him a pretty penny, but kept her away from other men. Eventually, he proposed to her. They married, and scandal ensued. He lost his job and soon all his money. Finally, he landed in prison. To the very end, however, he could never get angry with Rosa. Instead, he felt guilty. He had never done enough for her. Interpretation Professor Moot and Rosa Fröhlich are characters in the novel The Blue Angel, written by Heinrich Mann in 1905, and later made into a film starring Marlena Dietrich. Rosa's seduction of Moot follows the classic Oedipal regression pattern. First, the woman treats the man the way a mother would treat a little boy. She scolds him, but the scolding is not threatening. It's tender and has a teasing edge. Like a mother, she knows she is dealing with someone weak who cannot help his naughty behavior. She mixes plenty of praise and approval in with her taunts. Once the man begins to regress, she adds physical excitement, some bodily contact to excite him, subtle sexual overtones. As a reward for his regression, the man may get the thrill of finally sleeping with his mother. But there is always an element of competition which the mother figure must heighten. The man gets to possess her all on his own, something he could not do with father in the way, but he first has to win her away from others. The key to this kind of regression is to see and treat your targets as children. Nothing about them intimidates you, no matter how much authority or social standing they have. Your manner makes it clear that you feel you are the stronger party. To accomplish this, it may be helpful to imagine or visualize them as the children they once were. Suddenly, powerful people don't seem so powerful and threatening when you regress them in your imagination. Keep in mind that certain types are more vulnerable to an Oedipal regression. Look for those who, like Professor Moot, seem outwardly the most adult, straight-laced, serious, a little full of themselves. They are struggling to repress their regressive tendencies, overcompensating for their weaknesses. Often those who seem the most in command of themselves are the ripest for a regression. In fact, they are secretly longing for it, because their power, position, and responsibilities are more a burden than a pleasure. Number three. Born in 1768, the French writer François-René de Chateaubriand grew up in a medieval castle in Brittany. The castle was cold and gloomy, as if inhabited by the ghosts of its past. The family lived there in semi-seclusion. Chateaubriand spent much of his time with his sister Lucille, and his attachment to her was strong enough that rumors of incest made the rounds. But when he was about fifteen... A new woman named Sylphide entered his life, a woman he created in his imagination. A composite of all the heroines, goddesses, and courtesans he had read about in books. He was constantly seeing her features in his mind and hearing her voice. Soon she was taking walks with him, carrying on conversations. He imagined her innocent and exalted, yet they would sometimes do things that were not so innocent. He carried on this relationship for two whole years until finally he left for Paris and replaced Sylphide with women of flesh and blood. The French public, weary after the terrors of the 1790s, greeted Chateaubriand's first books enthusiastically, sensing a new spirit in them. His novels were full of windswept castles, brooding heroes and passionate heroines. Romanticism was in the air. Chateaubriand himself resembled the characters in his novels, and despite his rather unattractive appearance, women went wild over him. With him, they could escape their boring marriages and live out the kind of turbulent romance he wrote about. Chateaubriand's nickname was The Enchanter, 
and although he was married and an ardent Catholic, the number of his affairs increased with the years. But he had a restless nature. He traveled to the Middle East, to the United States, all over Europe. He couldn't find what he was looking for anywhere, and not the right woman either. After the novelty of an affair wore off, he would leave. By 1807, he had had so many affairs, and still felt so unsatisfied, that he decided to retire to his country estate, called Valais Olu. He filled the place with trees from all over the world transforming the grounds into something out of one of his novels. There, he began to write the memoirs that he envisioned would be his masterpiece. By 1817, however, Chateaubriand's life had fallen apart. Money problems had forced him to sell Valéolou. Almost fifty, he suddenly felt old. His inspiration dried up. That year, he visited the writer Madame de Stal who had been ill and was now close to death. He spent several days at her bedside along with her closest friend, Juliette Recamier. Madame Recamier's affairs were infamous. She was married to a much older man, but they had not lived together for some time. She had broken the hearts of the most illustrious men in Europe, including Prince Metternich, the Duke of Wellington, and the writer Benjamin Constant. It had also been rumored that despite all her flirtations, she was still a virgin. She was now almost forty, but she was the type of woman who seems youthful at any age. Drawn together by their grief over de Stal's death, she and Chateaubriand became friends. She listened so attentively to him, adopting his moods and echoing his sentiments, that he felt that he had at last met a woman who understood him. There was also something rather ethereal about Madame Recamier. Her walk, her voice, her eyes, more than one man had compared her to some unearthly angel. Chateaubriand soon burned with the desire to possess her physically. The year after their friendship began, she had a surprise for him. She had convinced a friend to purchase Valet Olu. The friend was away for a few weeks, and she invited Chateaubriand to spend some time with her at his former estate. He happily accepted. He showed her around, explaining what each little patch of ground had meant to him, the memories the place conjured up. He felt youthful feelings welling up inside him, feelings he had forgotten about. He delved further into the past, describing events in his childhood. At moments, walking with Madame Recamier and looking into those kind eyes, he felt a shiver of recognition, but he could not quite identify it. All he knew was that he had to go back to the memoirs that he had laid aside. I intend to employ the little time that is left to me in describing my youth, he said, so long as its essence remains palpable to me. It seemed that Madame Recamier returned Chateaubriand's love, but, as usual, she struggled to keep it a spiritual affair. The enchanter, however, deserved his nickname. His poetry, his air of melancholy, and his persistence finally won the day, and she succumbed, perhaps for the first time in her life. Now, as lovers, they were inseparable. But as always with Chateaubriand, over time, one woman was not enough. The restless spirit returned. He began to have affairs again. Soon he and Recamier stopped seeing each other. In 1832... Chateaubriand was traveling through Switzerland. Once again, his life had taken a downward turn, only this time he truly was old in body and spirit. In the Alps, strange thoughts of his youth began to assail him, memories of the castle in Brittany. Word reached him that Madame Recamier was in the area. He hadn't seen her in years, and he hurried to the inn where she was staying. She was as kind to him as ever. During the day, they took walks together— and at night they stayed up late talking. One day Chateaubriand told Recamier he had finally decided to finish his memoirs, and he had a confession to make. He told her the story of Sylphide, his imaginary lover when he was growing up. He had once hoped to meet a Sylphide in real life, but the women he had known had paled in comparison. 
Over the years, he'd forgotten about his imaginary lover, but now he was an old man, and he not only thought of her again, he could see her face and hear her voice. And with those memories, he realized that he had, in fact, met Sylphide in real life. It was Madame Recamier. The face and voice were close. More important, there was the calm spirit, the innocent, virginal quality. Reading to her the prayer to Sylphide he had just written, he told her he wanted to be young again, and seeing her had brought his youth back to him. Reconciled with Madame Recamier, he began to work again on the memoirs, which were eventually published under the title Memoirs from Beyond the Grave. Most critics agreed that the book was his masterpiece. The memoirs were dedicated to Madame Recamier, to whom he remained devoted until his death in 1848. Interpretation All of us carry within us an image of an ideal type of person whom we yearn to meet and love. Most often, the type is a composite made up of bits and pieces of different people from our youth, and even of characters in books and movies. People who influenced us inordinately, a teacher, for instance, may also figure. The traits have nothing to do with superficial interests. Rather, they are unconscious, hard to verbalize. We searched hardest for this ideal type in our adolescence, when we were more idealistic. Often, our first loves have more of these traits than our subsequent affairs. For Chateaubriand, Living with his family in their secluded castle, his first love was his sister, Lucille, whom he adored and idealized. But since love with her was impossible, he created a figure out of his imagination who had all her positive attributes, nobility of spirit, innocence, courage. Madame Recamier could not have known about Chateaubriand's ideal type but she did know something about him well before she ever met him. She had read all of his books, and his characters were highly autobiographical. She knew of his obsession with his lost youth, and everyone knew of his endless and unsatisfying affairs with women, his hyper-restless spirit. Madame Recamier knew how to mirror people, entering their spirits, and one of her first acts was to take Chateaubriand to Valleolou, where he felt he had left part of his youth. Alive with memories, he regressed further into his childhood to the days in the castle. She actively encouraged this. Most important, she embodied a spirit that came naturally to her, but that matched his youthful ideal. Innocent, noble, kind. The fact that so many men fell in love with her suggests that many men had the same ideals. Madame Recamier was Lucille Sylphide. It took him years to realize it, but when he did, her spell over him was complete. It is nearly impossible to embody someone's ideal completely, but if you come close enough, if you evoke some of that ideal spirit, you can lead that person into a deep seduction. To effect this regression, you must play the role of the therapist— Get your targets to open up about their past, particularly their former loves, and most particularly, their first love. Pay attention to any expressions of disappointment, how this or that person did not give them what they wanted. Take them to places that evoke their youth. In this regression, you are creating not so much a relationship of dependency and immaturity, but rather the adolescent spirit of a first love. There is a touch of innocence to the relationship. So much of adult life involves compromise, conniving, and a certain toughness. Create the ideal atmosphere by keeping such things out, drawing the other person into a kind of mutual weakness, conjuring a second virginity. There should be a dreamlike quality to the affair, as if the target were reliving that first love, but couldn't quite believe it. Let all of this unfold slowly, each encounter revealing more ideal qualities. The sense of reliving a past pleasure is simply impossible to resist. Number 4 
Sometime in the summer of 1614, several members of England's upper nobility, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, met to decide what to do about the Earl of Somerset, the favorite of King James I, who was 48 at the time. After eight years as the favorite, the young Earl had accumulated such power and wealth and so many titles that nothing was left for anyone else. But how to get rid of this powerful man? For the time being, the conspirators had no answer. A few weeks later, the king was inspecting the royal stables when he caught sight of a young man who was new to the court, the 22-year-old George Villers, a member of the lower nobility. The courtiers who accompanied the king that day watched the king's eyes following Villers and saw with what interest he asked about this young man. Indeed, everyone had to agree that he was a most handsome youth, with the face of an angel and a charmingly childish manner. When news of the king's interest in Villers reached the conspirators, they instantly knew they had found what they had been looking for, a young man who could seduce the king and supplant the dreaded favorite. Left to nature, though, the seduction would never happen. They had to help it along. So without telling Villers of their plan— they befriended him. King James was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. His childhood had been a nightmare. His father, his mother's favorite, and his own regents had all been murdered. His mother had first been exiled, later executed. When James was young, to escape suspicion, he played the part of a fool. He hated the sight of a sword and could not stand the slightest sign of argument. When his cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, died in 1603, leaving no heir, he became King of England. James surrounded himself with bright, happy young men, and seemed to prefer the company of boys. In 1612 his son, Prince Henry, died. The king was inconsolable. He needed distraction and good cheer, and his favorite, the Earl of Somerset, was no longer so young and attractive. The timing for a seduction was perfect. And so the conspirators went to work on Villers, under the guise of trying to help him advance within the court. They supplied him with a magnificent wardrobe, jewels, a glittering carriage, the kind of things the king noticed. They worked on his riding, fencing, tennis, dancing, his skills with birds and dogs. He was instructed in the art of conversation, how to flatter, tell a joke, sigh at the right moment. Fortunately, Villers was easy to work with. He had a naturally buoyant manner, and nothing seemed to bother him. That same year, the conspirators managed to get him appointed the royal cup-bearer. Every night, he poured out the king's wine, so that the king could see him up close. After a few weeks, the king was in love. The boy seemed to crave attention and tenderness, exactly what he yearned to offer. How wonderful it would be to mold and educate him, and what a perfect figure he had. The conspirators convinced Villers to break off his engagement to a young lady. The king was single-minded in his affections and could not stand competition. Soon James wanted to be around Villers all the time, for he had the qualities the king admired, innocence and a light-hearted spirit. The king appointed Villers gentlemen of the bedchamber, making it possible for them to be alone together. What particularly charmed James was that Villers never asked for anything, which made it all the more delightful to spoil him. By 1616, Villers had completely supplanted the former favorite. He was now the Earl of Buckingham and a member of the king's privy council. To the conspirators' dismay, however, he quickly accumulated even more privileges than the Earl of Somerset had done. The king would call him sweetheart in public, fix his doublets, comb his hair. James zealously protected his favorite, anxious to preserve the young man's innocence. He tended to the youth's every whim, in effect, became his slave. In fact, the king seemed to regress. Whenever Steeny, his nickname for Villers, entered the room, he started to act like a child. The two were inseparable until the king's death in 1625. Interpretation 
We are most definitely stamped forever by our parents in ways we can never fully understand. But the parents are equally influenced and seduced by the child. They may play the role of the protector, but in the process, they absorb the child's spirit and energy, relive a part of their own childhood. And just as the child struggles against sexual feelings toward the parent, the parent must repress comparable erotic feelings that lie just beneath the tenderness they feel. The best and most insidious way to seduce people is often to position yourself as the child. Imagining themselves stronger, more in control, they will be lured into your web. They will feel they have nothing to fear. Emphasize your immaturity, your weakness, and you let them indulge in fantasies of protecting and parenting you, a strong desire as people get older. What they do not realize is that you are getting under their skin, insinuating yourself. It is the child who is controlling the adult. Your innocence makes them want to protect you, but it is also sexually charged. Innocence is highly seductive. Some people even long to play the corrupter of innocence. Stir up their latent sexual feelings, and you can lead them astray with the hope of fulfilling a strong yet repressed fantasy sleeping with the child figure. In your presence, too, they will begin to regress as well, infected by your childish, playful spirit. Most of this came naturally to Villers, but you will probably have to use some calculation. Fortunately, all of us have strong childish tendencies within us that are easy to access and exaggerate. Make your gestures seem spontaneous and unplanned. Any sexual element of your behavior should seem innocent, unconscious. Like Villers, don't push for favors. Parents prefer to spoil children who don't ask for things, but invite them in their manner. Seeming non-judgmental and uncritical of those around you will make everything you do seem more natural and naive. Have a happy, cheerful demeanor, but with a playful edge. Emphasize any weaknesses you might have, things you cannot control. Remember, most of us remember our early years fondly, but often, paradoxically, the people with the strongest attachment to those times are the ones who had the most difficult childhoods. Actually, circumstances kept them from getting to be children, so they never really grew up, and they long for the paradise they never got to experience. James I falls into this category. These types are ripe targets for a reverse regression. Reversal To reverse the strategies of regression, the parties to a seduction would have to remain adults during the process. This is not only rare, it is not very pleasurable. Seduction means realizing certain fantasies. Being a mature and responsible adult is not a fantasy. It is a duty. Furthermore, a person who remains an adult in relation to you is harder to seduce. In all kinds of seduction, political, media, personal, the target must regress. The only danger is that the child, wearying of dependence, turns against the parent and rebels. You must be prepared for this, and unlike a parent, never take it personally. Chapter 18. Stir Up the Transgressive and Taboo There are always social limits on what one can do. Some of these, the most elemental taboos, go back centuries. Others are more superficial, simply defining polite and acceptable behavior. Making your targets feel that you are leading them past either kind of limit is immensely seductive. People yearn to explore their dark side. Not everything in romantic love is supposed to be tender and soft. Hint that you have a cruel, even sadistic streak. You don't respect age differences, marriage vows, family ties. Once the desire to transgress draws your targets to you, it will be hard for them to stop. Take them further than they imagined. The shared feeling of guilt and complicity will create a powerful bond. The Lost Self 
In March of 1812, the 24-year-old George Gordon Byron published the first cantos of his poem, Child Harold. The poem was filled with familiar Gothic imagery, a dilapidated abbey, debauchery, travels to the mysterious East. But what made it different was that the hero of the poem was also its villain. Harold was a man who led a life of vice, disdaining society's conventions, yet somehow going unpunished. Also, the poem wasn't set in some faraway land, but in present-day England. Child Harold created an instant stir, becoming the talk of London. The first printing quickly sold out. Within days, a rumor made the rounds. The poem, about a debauched young nobleman, was in fact autobiographical. Now the cream of society clamored to meet Lord Byron, and many of them left their calling cards at his London residence. Soon he was showing up at their homes. Strangely enough, he exceeded their expectations. He was devilishly handsome, with curling hair and the face of an angel. His black attire set off his pale complexion. He didn't talk much, which made an impression of itself, and when he did his voice was low and hypnotic, and his tone a little disdainful. He had a limp, he was born with a club foot, so when an orchestra struck up a waltz, the dance craze of 1812, he would stand to the side, a faraway look in his eye. The ladies went wild over Byron. Upon meeting him, Lady Rosebery felt her heart beating so violently, a mix of fear and excitement, that she had to walk away. Women fought to be seated next to him, to win his attention, to be seduced by him. Was it true that he was guilty of a secret sin, like the hero of his poem? Lady Caroline Lamb, wife of William Lamb, son of Lord and Lady Melbourne, was a glittering young woman on the social scene, but deep inside she was unhappy. As a young girl she had dreamt of adventure, romance, travel. Now she was expected to play the role of the polite young wife, and it didn't suit her. Lady Caroline was one of the first to read Child Harold, and something more than its novelty stirred her. When she saw Lord Byron at a dinner party, surrounded by women, she looked at his face, then walked away. That night she wrote of him in her journal. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know, she added. That beautiful pale face is my fate. The next day, to Lady Caroline's surprise, Lord Byron called on her. Evidently he had seen her walking away from him, and her shyness had intrigued him. He disliked the aggressive women who were constantly at his heels, as it seemed he disdained everything, including his success. Soon he was visiting Lady Caroline daily. He lingered in her boudoir, played with her children, helped her choose her dress for the day. She pressed him to talk of his life. He described his brutal father— the untimely deaths that seemed to be a family curse, the crumbling abbey he had inherited, his adventures in Turkey and Greece. His life was indeed as gothic as that of Child Harold. Within days the two became lovers. Now, though, the tables turned. Lady Caroline pursued Byron with unladylike aggression. She dressed as a page and sneaked into his carriage, wrote him extravagantly emotional letters, flaunted the affair. At last, a chance to play the grand romantic role of her girlhood fantasies. Byron began to turn against her. He already loved to shock. Now he confessed to her the nature of the secret sin he had alluded to in Child Harold, his homosexual affairs during his travels. He made cruel remarks, grew indifferent, but this only seemed to push her further. She sent him the customary lock of hair, but from her pubis. She followed him in the street, made public scenes. Finally, her family sent her abroad to avoid further scandal. After Byron made it clear the affair was over, she descended into a madness that would last several years. In 1813, an old friend of Byron's, James Webster, invited the poet to stay at his country estate. Webster had a young and beautiful wife, Lady Frances, and he knew Byron's reputation as a seducer, but his wife was quiet and chaste. 
Surely she would resist the temptation of a man such as Byron? To Webster's relief, Byron barely spoke to Francis, who seemed equally uninterested in him. Yet several days into Byron's stay, she contrived to be alone with him in the billiards room, where she asked him a question. How could a woman who liked a man inform him of it when he did not perceive it? Byron scribbled a racy reply on a piece of paper, which made her blush as she read it. Soon thereafter, he invited the couple to stay with him at his infamous abbey. There, the prim and proper Lady Frances saw him drink wine from a human skull. They stayed up late in one of the abbey's secret chambers, reading poetry and kissing. With Byron, it seemed, Lady Frances was only too eager to explore adultery. That same year, Lord Byron's half-sister, Augusta, arrived in London to get away from her husband, who was having money troubles. Byron had not seen Augusta for some time. The two were physically similar. The same face, the same mannerisms. She was Lord Byron as a woman. And his behavior toward her was more than brotherly. He took her to the theater, to dances, received her at home, treating her with an intimate spirit that Augusta soon returned. Indeed, the kind and tender attention that Byron showered on her soon became physical. Augusta was a devoted wife with three children, yet she yielded to her half-brother's advances. How could she help herself? He stirred up a strange passion in her, a stronger passion than she felt for any other man, including her husband. For Byron, his relationship with Augusta was the ultimate and crowning sin of his career. And soon he was writing to his friends, openly confessing it. Indeed, he delighted in their shocked responses, and his long narrative poem, The Bride of Abydus, takes brother-sister incest as its theme. Rumors began to spread of Byron's relations with Augusta, who was now pregnant with his child. Polite society shunned him, but women were more drawn to him than before, and his books were more popular than ever. Annabella Milbank, Lady Caroline Lamb's cousin, had met Byron in those first months of 1812, when he was the toast of London. Annabella was sober and down-to-earth, and her interests were science and religion. But there was something about Byron that attracted her, and the feeling seemed to be returned. Not only did the two become friends, to her bewilderment he showed another kind of interest in her, even at one point proposing marriage. This was in the midst of the scandal over Byron and Caroline Lamb, and Annabella did not take the proposal seriously. Over the next few months she followed his career from a distance, and heard the troubling rumors of incest. Yet in 1813 she wrote her aunt, I consider his acquaintance as so desirable that I would incur the risk of being called a flirt for the sake of enjoying it. Reading his new poems, she wrote that his description of love almost makes me in love. She was developing an obsession with Byron, of which word soon reached him. They renewed their friendship, and in 1814 he proposed again. This time she accepted. Byron was a fallen angel, and she would be the one to reform him. It did not turn out that way. Byron had hoped that married life would calm him down, but after the ceremony he realized it was a mistake. He told Annabella, now you will find that you have married a devil. Within a few years, the marriage fell apart. In 1816, Byron left England, never to return. He traveled through Italy for a while. Everyone knew his story, the affairs, the incest, the cruelty to his lovers. But wherever he went, Italian women, particularly married noblewomen, pursued him making it clear in their own way how prepared they were to be the next Byronic victim. In truth, the women had become the aggressors. As Byron told the poet Shelley, No one has been more carried off than poor dear me. I've been ravished more often than anyone since the Trojan War. Interpretation Women of Byron's time were longing to play a different role than society allowed them. 
They were supposed to be the decent, moralizing force in culture. Only men had outlets for their darker impulses. Underlying the social restrictions on women, perhaps, was a fear of the more amoral and unbridled part of the female psyche. Feeling repressed and restless, women of the time devoured gothic novels and romances, stories in which women were adventurous and had the same capacity for good and evil as men. Books like these helped to trigger a revolt, with women like Lady Caroline playing out a little of the fantasy life they had had in their girlhood, where it had to some extent been permitted. Byron arrived on the scene at the right time. He became the lightning rod for women's unexpressed desires. With him, they could go beyond the limits society had imposed. For some, the lure was adultery. For others, it was romantic rebellion, or a chance to become irrational and uncivilized. The desire to reform him merely covered up the truth, the desire to be overwhelmed by him. In all cases, it was the lure of the forbidden, which in this case was more than merely a superficial temptation. Once you became involved with Lord Byron, he took you further than you had imagined or wanted, since he recognized no limits. Women did not just fall in love with him. They let him turn their lives upside down, even ruin them. They preferred that fate to the safe confines of marriage. In some ways, the situation of women in the early 19th century has become generalized in the early 21st. The outlets for male bad behavior, war, dirty politics, the institution of mistresses and courtesans, have faded away. Today, not just women, but men are supposed to be eminently civilized and reasonable. And many have a hard time living up to this. As children, we are able to vent the darker side of our characters, a side that all of us have, but under pressure from society, at first in the form of our parents, we slowly repress the naughty, rebellious, perverse streaks in our characters. To get along, we learn to repress our dark sides, which become a kind of lost self, a part of our psyche buried beneath our polite appearance. As adults, we secretly want to recapture that lost self, the more adventurous, less respectful, childhood part of us. We are drawn to those who live out their lost selves as adults, even if it involves some evil or destruction. Like Byron, you can become the lightning rod for such desires. You must learn, however, to keep this potential under control and to use it strategically. As the aura of the forbidden around you is drawing targets into your web, do not overplay your dangerousness, or they will be frightened away. Once you feel them falling under your spell, you have freer reign. If they begin to imitate you, as Lady Caroline imitated Byron, then take it further. Mix in some cruelty. Involve them in sin, crime, taboo activity, whatever it takes. Unleash the lost self within them. The more they act it out, the deeper your hold over them. Going halfway will break the spell and create self-consciousness. Take it as far as you can. Keys to Seduction Society and culture are based on limits. This kind of behavior is acceptable. That is not. The limits are fluid and change with time, but there are always limits. The alternative is anarchy, the lawlessness of nature, which we dread. But we are strange animals. The moment any kind of limit is imposed, physically or psychologically, we are instantly curious. A part of us wants to go beyond that limit, to explore what is forbidden. If, as children, we are told not to go past a certain point in the woods, that is precisely where we want to go. But we grow older and become polite and deferential. More and more boundaries encumber our lives. Do not confuse politeness with happiness, however. It covers up frustration, unwanted compromise. How can we explore the shadow side of our personality without incurring punishment or ostracism? It seeps out 
in our dreams. We sometimes wake up with a sense of guilt at the murder, incest, adultery, and mayhem that goes on in our dreams until we realize no one needs to know about it but ourselves. But give a person the sense that with you they will have a chance to explore the outer reaches of acceptable, polite behavior, that with you they can vent some of their closeted personality, and you create the ingredients for a deep and powerful seduction. You will have to go beyond the point of merely teasing them with an elusive fantasy. The shock and seductive power will come from the reality of what you're offering them. Like Byron, at a certain point, you can even press it further than they may want to go. If they have followed you merely out of curiosity, they may feel some fear and hesitation. But once they are hooked, they'll find you hard to resist, for it's hard to return to a limit once you've transgressed and gone past it. The human cries out for more and doesn't know when to stop. You will determine for them when it is time to stop. The moment people feel that something is prohibited, a part of them will want it. That is what makes a married man or woman such a delicious target. The more someone is prohibited, the greater the desire. George Villers, the Earl of Buckingham, was the favorite first of King James I, then of James's son, King Charles I. Nothing was ever denied him. In 1625, on a visit to France, he met the beautiful Queen Anne, and fell hopelessly in love. What could be more impossible, more out of reach, than the queen of a rival power? He could have had almost any other woman, but the prohibited nature of the queen completely inflamed him, until he embarrassed himself and his country by trying to kiss her in public. Since what is forbidden is desired, somehow you must make yourself seem forbidden. The most blatant way to do this is to engage in behavior that gives you a dark and forbidden aura. Theoretically, you are someone to avoid. In fact, you are too seductive to resist. That was the allure of the actor Errol Flynn, who, like Byron, often found himself the pursued rather than the pursuer. Flynn was devilishly handsome, but he also had something else, a definite criminal streak. In his wild youth, he engaged in all kinds of shady activities. In the 1950s, he was charged with rape, a permanent stain on his reputation even though he was acquitted, but his popularity among women only increased. Play up your dark side and you will have a similar effect. For your targets to be involved with you means going beyond their limits, doing something naughty and unacceptable to society, to their peers. For many, that is reason to bite the bait. In Junichiro Tanizaki's 1928 novel, Quicksand, Sonoko Kakiuchi, the wife of a respectable lawyer, is bored and decides to take art classes to while away the time. There, she finds herself fascinated with a fellow female student, the beautiful Mitsuko, who befriends her, then seduces her. Kakiuchi is forced to tell endless lies to her husband about her involvement with Mitsuko and their frequent trysts. Mitsuko slowly involves her in all kinds of nefarious activities, including a love triangle with a bizarre young man. Each time Kakiuchi is made to explore some forbidden pleasure, Mitsuko challenges her to go further and further. Kakiuchi hesitates, feels remorse. She knows she is in the clutches of a devilish young seductress who has played on her boredom to lead her astray. But in the end, she cannot help following Mitsuko's lead. Each transgressive act makes her want more. Once your targets are drawn by the lure of the forbidden, dare them to match you in transgressive behavior. Any kind of challenge is seductive. Take it slowly heightening the challenge only after they show signs of yielding to you. Once they are under your spell, they may not even notice how far out on a limb you have taken them. The great 18th century rake, Duc de Richelieu, had a predilection for young girls, and he would often heighten the seduction by enveloping them in transgressive behavior, to which the young are particularly susceptible. 
For instance, he would find a way into the young girl's house and lure her into her bed. The parents would be just down the hall, adding the proper spice. Sometimes he would act as if they were about to be discovered, the momentary fright sharpening the overall thrill. In all cases, he would try to turn the young girl against her parents, ridiculing their religious zeal or prudery or pious behavior. The Duke's strategy was to attack the values that his targets held dearest, precisely the values that represent a limit. In a young person, family ties, religious ties, and the like are useful to the seducer. Young people barely need a reason to rebel against them. The strategy, though, can be applied to a person of any age. For every deeply held value, there is a shadow side, a doubt, a desire to explore what those values forbid. In Renaissance Italy, a prostitute would dress as a lady and go to church. Nothing was more exciting to a man than to exchange glances with a woman whom he knew to be a whore as he was surrounded by his wife, family, peers, and church officials. Every religion or value system creates a dark side, the shadow realm of everything it prohibits. Tease your targets, get them to flirt with whatever transgresses their family values, which are often emotional yet superficial, since they are imposed from the outside. One of the most seductive men of the 20th century, Rudolf Valentino, was known as the sex menace. His appeal for women was twofold— he could be tender and attentive, but he also hinted of cruelty. At any moment he could become dangerously bold, perhaps even a little violent. The studios played up this double image as much as possible. When it was reported that he had been abusive to his wife, for example, they exploited the story. A mix of the masculine and the feminine, the violent and the tender, will always seem transgressive and appealing. Love is supposed to be tender and delicate but in fact it can release violent and destructive emotions, and the possible violence of love, the way it breaks down our normal reasonableness, is just what attracts us. Approach romance's violent side by mixing a cruel streak into your tender attentions, particularly in the latter stages of the seduction, when the target is in your clutches. The courtesan Lola Montez was known to turn to violence using a whip now and then, and Lou Andrea Salome could be exceptionally cruel to her men, playing coquettish games, turning alternately icy and demanding. Her cruelty only kept her targets coming back for more. A masochistic involvement can represent a great transgressive release. The more illicit your seduction feels, the more powerful its effect. Give your targets the feeling that they're committing a kind of crime, a deed whose guilt they share with you. Create public moments in which the two of you know something that those around you do not. It could be phrases and looks that only you recognize, a secret. Byron's seductive appeal to Lady Frances was connected to the nearness of her husband. In his company, for example, she had a love letter of Byron's hidden in her bosom. Johannes, the protagonist of Soren Kierkegaard's The Seducer's Diary, sent a message to his target, the young Cordelia, in the middle of a dinner party they were both attending. She could not reveal to the other guests that it was from him, for then she would have to do some explaining. He might also say something in public that would have a special meaning for her, since it referred to something in one of his letters. All of this added spice to the affair by giving it a feeling of a shared secret, even a guilty crime. It's critical to play on tensions like these in public, creating a sense of complicity and collusion against the world. In the Tristan and Isolde legend, the famous lovers reach the heights of bliss and exhilaration exactly because of the taboos they break. Isolde is engaged to King Mark. She will soon be a married woman. Tristan is a loyal subject and warrior in the service of King Mark, who is his father's age. The whole affair has a feeling of stealing away the bride from the father. Epitomizing the concept of love in the Western world, 
The legend has had immense influence over the ages, and a crucial part of it is the idea that without obstacles, without a feeling of transgression, love is weak and flavorless. People may be straining to remove restrictions on private behavior, to make everything freer in the world today, but that only makes seduction more difficult and less exciting. Do what you can to reintroduce a feeling of transgression and crime, even if it is only psychological or illusory. There must be obstacles to overcome, social norms to flout, laws to break before the seduction can be consummated. It might seem that a permissive society imposes few limits. Find some. There will always be limits, sacred cows, behavioral standards, endless ammunition for stirring up the transgressive and taboo. Reversal The reversal of stirring up taboos would be to stay within the limits of acceptable behavior. That would make for a very tepid seduction, which is not to say that only evil or wild behavior is seductive. Goodness, kindness, and an aura of spirituality can be tremendously attractive, since they are rare qualities. But notice that the game is the same. A person who is kind or good or spiritual within the limits that society prescribes has a weak appeal. It is those who go to the extreme, the Gandhis, the Krishnamurtis, who seduce us. They don't merely expound a spiritual lifestyle. They do away with all personal material comfort to live out their ascetic ideals. They, too, go beyond the limits, transgressing acceptable behavior because societies would find it hard to function if everyone went to such lengths. In seduction, there is absolutely no power in respecting boundaries and limits. Chapter 19 Use Spiritual Lures Everyone has doubts and insecurities about their body, their self-worth, their sexuality. If your seduction appears exclusively to the physical, you will stir up these doubts and make your targets self-conscious. Instead, Lure them out of their insecurities by making them focus on something sublime and spiritual, a religious experience, a lofty work of art, the occult. Play up your divine qualities. Affect an air of discontent with worldly things. Speak of the stars, destiny, the hidden threads that unite you and the object of the seduction. Lost in a spiritual mist, the target will feel light and uninhibited. Deepen the effect of your seduction by making its sexual culmination seem like the spiritual union of two souls. Object of Worship Léon de Pougy was the reigning courtesan of 1890s Paris. Slender and androgynous, she was a novelty, and the wealthiest men in Europe vied to possess her. By late in the decade, however, she had grown tired of it all. What a sterile life, she wrote a friend. Always the same routine. The bois, the races, fittings, and to end an insipid day, dinner. What wearied the courtesan most was the constant attention of her male admirers, who sought to monopolize her physical charms. One spring day in 1899, Leon was riding in an open carriage through the Bois de Boulogne. As usual, men tipped their hats at her as she passed by, but one of these admirers caught her by surprise, a young woman with long blonde hair who gave her an intense, worshipful stare. Leon smiled at the woman, who smiled and bowed in return. A few days later, Leon began to receive cards and flowers from a 23-year-old American named Natalie Barney, who identified herself as the blonde admirer in the Bois de Boulogne, and asked for a rendezvous. Leon invited Natalie to visit, but to amuse herself she decided to play a little joke. A friend would take her place, lounging on her bed in the dark boudoir, while Leon would hide behind a screen. 
Natalie arrived at the appointed hour. She wore the costume of a Florentine page and carried a bouquet of flowers. Kneeling before the bed, she began to praise the courtesan, comparing her to a Fra Angelico painting. All too soon, she heard someone laugh, and standing up, she realized the joke that had been played on her. She blushed and made for the door. When Leon hurried out from behind the screen, Natalie chastised her. The courtesan had the face of an angel, but apparently not the spirit. Contrite, Leon whispered, come back tomorrow morning. I'll be alone. The young American showed up the next day wearing the same outfit. She was witty and spirited. Leon relaxed in her presence and invited her to stay for the courtesan's morning ritual, the elaborate makeup, clothes, and jewelry she put on before heading out into the world. Watching reverently, Natalie remarked that she worshipped beauty and that Leon was the most beautiful woman she had ever seen. Playing the part of the page, she followed Leon to the carriage, opened the door for her with a bow, and accompanied her on her habitual ride through the Bois de Boulogne. Once inside the park, Natalie knelt on the floor, out of sight of the passing gentlemen who tipped their hats to Leon. She recited poems she had written in Leon's honor, and she told the courtesan she considered it a mission to rescue her from the seamy career into which she had fallen. That evening, Natalie took her to the theater to see Sarah Bernhardt play Hamlet. During the intermission, she told Leon that she identified with Hamlet, his hunger for the sublime, his hatred of tyranny, which, for her, was the tyranny of men over women. Over the next few days, Leon received a steady flow of flowers from Natalie and telegrams with little poems in her honor. Slowly, the worshipful words and looks became more physical with the occasional touch, then a caress, even a kiss, and a kiss that felt different from any in Leon's experience. One morning, with Natalie in attendance, Leon prepared to take a bath. As she slipped out of her nightgown, Natalie suddenly flung herself at her friend's feet, kissing her ankles. The courtesan freed herself and hurried into the bath, only for Natalie to throw off her clothes and join her. Within a few days, all Paris knew that Leon de Pougy had a new lover, Natalie Barney. Leon made no effort to disguise her new affair, publishing a novel, Idylle Safique, detailing every aspect of Natalie's seduction. She had never had an affair with a woman before, and she described her involvement with Natalie as something like a mystical experience. Even at the end of her long life, she remembered the affair as by far her most intense. Renée Vivian was a young Englishwoman who had come to Paris to write poetry and flee the marriage that her father was trying to arrange for her. Renée was obsessed with death. She also felt there was something wrong with her, experiencing moments of intense self-loathing. In 1900, Renée met Natalie at the theatre. Something about the American's kind eyes melted Renée's normal reserve, and she began sending poems to Natalie, who responded with poems of her own. They soon became friends. Renée confessed that she had had an intense friendship with another woman, but that it remained platonic. The thought of physical involvement repulsed her. Natalie told her about the ancient Greek poet Sappho, who celebrated love between women as the only love that is innocent and pure. One night, René, inspired by their discussions, invited Natalie to her apartment, which she had transformed into a kind of chapel. The room was filled with candles and with white lilies, the flowers she associated with Natalie. That night, the two women became lovers. They soon moved in together, but when René realized that Natalie could not be faithful to her, her love turned into hatred. She broke off the relationship, moved out, and vowed to never see her again. Over the next few months, Natalie sent her letters and poems and showed up at her new home, all to no avail. René would have nothing to do with her. One evening at the opera, though, Natalie sat down beside her and gave her a poem she had written in her honor. 
She expressed her regrets for the past and also a simple request. The two women should go on a pilgrimage to the Greek island of Lesbos, Sappho's home. Only there could they purify themselves and their relationship. Rene could not resist. On the island they retraced the poetess's steps, imagining they were transported back into the pagan, innocent days of ancient Greece. For Rene, Natalie had become Sappho herself. When they finally returned to Paris, Rene wrote her, My blonde siren, I don't want you to become like those who dwell on earth, I want you to stay yourself, for this is the way you cast your spell over me. Their affair lasted until Renée's death in 1909. Interpretation Leanne de Pougy and Renée Vivian both suffered a similar oppression. They were self-absorbed, hyper-aware of themselves. The source of this habit in Leanne was men's constant attention to her body. She could never escape their looks, which plagued her with a feeling of heaviness. Rene, meanwhile, thought too much about her own problems, her repression of her lesbianism, her mortality. She felt consumed with self-hatred. Natalie Barney, on the other hand, was buoyant, light-hearted, absorbed in the world around her. Her seductions, and by the end of her life they numbered well into the hundreds, all had a similar quality. She took the victim outside herself, directing her attention toward beauty, poetry, the innocence of sapphic love. She invited her women to participate in a kind of cult in which they would worship these sublimities. To heighten the cult-like feeling, she involved them in little rituals. They would call each other by new names, send each other poems in daily telegrams, wear costumes, make pilgrimages to holy sites. Two things would inevitably happen. The women would start to direct some of the worshipful feelings they were experiencing toward Natalie, who seemed as lofty and beautiful as the things she held up to be adored, and pleasantly diverted into this spiritualized realm, they would also lose any heaviness they had felt about their bodies, their selves, their identities. Their repression of their sexuality would melt away. By the time Natalie kissed or caressed them, it would feel like something innocent, pure, as if they had returned to the Garden of Eden before the fall. Religion is the great balm of existence because it takes us outside ourselves, connects us to something larger. As we contemplate the object of worship, God or nature, our burdens are lifted away. It's wonderful to feel raised up from the earth to experience that kind of lightness. No matter how progressive the times, many of us feel uncomfortable with our bodies, our animal drives. A seducer who focuses too much attention on the physical will stir up self-consciousness and a residue of disgust. So, focus attention on something else. Invite the other person to worship something beautiful in the world. It could be nature, a work of art, even God or God's paganism never goes out of fashion. People are dying to believe in something. Add some rituals. If you can make yourself seem to resemble the thing you are worshipping, you are natural, aesthetic, noble, and sublime, your targets will transfer their worship to you. Religion and spirituality are full of sexual undertones that can be brought to the surface once you have made your targets lose their self-awareness. From spiritual ecstasy to sexual ecstasy is but one small step. Keys to Seduction Religion is the most seductive system that mankind has created. Death is our greatest fear, and religion offers us the illusion that we're immortal, that something about us will live on. The idea that we are an infinitesimal part of a vast and indifferent universe is terrifying. Religion humanizes this universe, makes us feel important and loved. We are not animals governed by uncontrollable drives, animals that die for no apparent reason, but creatures made in the image of a supreme being. We, too, can be sublime, rational, and good. Anything that feeds a desire or a wished-for illusion is seductive, 
and nothing can match religion in this arena. Pleasure is the bait that you use to lure a person into your web, but no matter how clever a seducer you are, in the back of your target's mind, they are aware of the end game, the physical conclusion toward which you're heading. You may think your target is unrepressed and hungry for pleasure, but almost all of us are plagued by an underlying unease with our animal nature. Unless you deal with this unease, your seduction, even when successful in the short term, will be superficial and temporary. Instead, like Natalie Barney, try to capture your target's soul to build the foundation of a deep and lasting seduction. Lure the victim deep into your web with spirituality, making physical pleasure seem sublime and transcendent. Spirituality will disguise your manipulations, suggesting that your relationship is timeless and creating a space for ecstasy in the victim's mind. Remember that seduction is a mental process, and nothing is more mentally intoxicating than religion, spirituality, and the occult. In Gustave Flaubert's novel Madame Bovary, Rodolphe Boulanger visits the country doctor Bovary and finds himself interested in the doctor's beautiful wife, Emma. Boulanger, quote, was brutal and shrewd. He was something of a connoisseur. There had been many women in his life, unquote. He senses that Emma is bored. A few weeks later, he manages to run into her at a county fair where he gets her alone. He affects an air of sadness and gloom. Quote, Many's the time I've passed a cemetery in the moonlight and asked myself if I wouldn't be better off lying there with the rest. Unquote. He mentions his bad reputation. He deserves it, he says, but is it his fault? Quote, Do you really not know? that there exist souls that are ceaselessly in torment?" Unquote. Several times he takes Emma's hand, but she politely withdraws it. He talks of love, the magnetic force that draws two people together. Perhaps it has roots in some earlier existence, some previous incarnation of their souls. Quote, Take us, for example. Why should we have met? How did it happen? It can only be that something in our particular inclinations made us come closer and closer across the distance that separated us, the way two rivers flow together. Unquote. He takes her hand again, and this time she lets him hold it. After the fair, he avoids her for a few weeks, then suddenly shows up claiming that he tried to stay away, but that fate, destiny, has pulled him back. He takes Emma riding. When he finally makes his move in the woods, she seems frightened and rejects his advances. Quote, you must have some mistaken idea, he protests. I have you in my heart like a Madonna on a pedestal. I beseech you, be my friend, my sister, my angel. Unquote. Under the spell of his words, she lets him hold her and lead her deeper into the woods where she succumbs. Rodolphe's strategy is threefold. First, he talks of sadness, melancholy, discontent, talk that makes him seem nobler than other people, as if life's common material pursuits could not satisfy him. Next, he talks of destiny, the magnetic attraction of two souls. This makes his interest in Emma seem not so much a momentary impulse as something timeless, linked to the movement of the stars. Finally, he talks of angels, the elevated and the sublime. By placing everything on the spiritual plane, he distracts Emma from the physical, makes her feel giddy, and packs a seduction that could have taken months into a matter of a few encounters. The references Rodolphe uses might seem cliched by today's standards, but the strategy itself will never grow old. Simply adapt it to the occult fads of the day. Affect a spiritual air by displaying a discontent with the banalities of life. It's not money or sex or success that moves you. Your drives are never so base. No, something much deeper motivates you. Whatever this is, keep it vague. 
letting the target imagine your hidden depths. The stars, astrology, fate are always appealing. Create the sense that destiny has brought you and your target together. That will make your seduction feel more natural. In a world where too much is controlled and manufactured, the sense that fate, necessity, or some higher power is guiding your relationship is doubly seductive. If you want to weave religious motifs into your seduction, it's always best to choose some distant, exotic religion with a slightly pagan air. It's easy to move from pagan spirituality to pagan earthiness. Timing counts. Once you've stirred your target souls, move quickly to the physical, making sexuality seem merely an extension of the spiritual vibrations you're experiencing. In other words, employ the spiritual strategy as close to the time for your bold move as possible. The spiritual is not exclusively the religious or the occult. It is anything that will add a sublime, timeless quality to your seduction. In the modern world, culture and art have, in some ways, taken the place of religion. There are two ways to use art in your seduction. First, create it yourself, in the target's honor. Natalie Barney wrote poems and barraged her targets with them. Half of Picasso's appeal to many women was the hope that he would immortalize them in his paintings, for Ars longa vita brevis. Art is long, life is short as they used to say in Rome. Even if your love is a passing fancy, by capturing it in a work of art, you give it a seductive illusion of eternity. The second way to use art is to make it ennoble the affair, giving your seduction an elevated edge. Natalie Barney took her targets to the theater, to the opera, to museums, to places full of history and atmosphere. In such places, your souls can vibrate to the same spiritual wavelength. Of course, you should avoid works of art that are earthy or vulgar, calling attention to your intentions. The play, movie, or book can be contemporary, even a little raw, as long as it contains a noble message and is tied to some just cause. Even a political movement can be spiritually uplifting. Remember to tailor your spiritual lures to the target. If the target is earthy and cynical, paganism or art will be more productive than the occult or religious piety. The Russian mystic Rasputin was revered for his saintliness and his healing powers. Women in particular were fascinated with Rasputin and would visit him in his St. Petersburg apartment for spiritual guidance. He would talk to them of the simple goodness of the Russian peasantry, God's forgiveness, and other lofty matters. But after a few minutes of this, he would inject a comment or two that were of a much different nature. Something about the woman's beauty, her lips that were so inviting, the desires she could inspire in a man. He would talk of different kinds of love, love of God, love between friends, love between a man and a woman, but mix them all up as if they were one. Then, as he returned to discussing spiritual matters, he would suddenly take the woman's hand or whisper into her ear. All this would have an intoxicating effect. Women would find themselves dragged into a kind of maelstrom, both spiritually uplifted and sexually excited. Hundreds of women succumbed during these spiritual visits, for he would also tell them that they could not repent until they had sinned, and who better to sin with than Rasputin? Rasputin understood the intimate connection between the sexual and the spiritual. Spirituality, the love of God, is a sublimated version of sexual love. The language of the religious mystics of the Middle Ages is full of erotic images. The contemplation of God and of the sublime can offer a kind of mental orgasm. There is no more seductive brew than the combination of the spiritual and the sexual, the high and the low. When you talk of spiritual matters, then let your looks and physical presence hint of sexuality at the same time. Make the harmony of the universe and union with God seem to confuse with physical harmony and the union between two people. 
If you can make the end game of your seduction appear as a spiritual experience, you will heighten the physical pleasure and create a seduction with a deep and lasting effect. Reversal Letting your targets feel that your affection is neither temporary nor superficial will often make them fall deeper under your spell. In some, though, it can arouse an anxiety, the fear of commitment of a claustrophobic relationship with no exits. Never let your spiritual lures seem to be leading in that direction, then. To focus attention on the distant future may implicitly constrict their freedom. You should be seducing them, not offering to marry them. What you want is to make them lose themselves in the moment, experiencing the timeless depth of your feelings in the present tense. Religious ecstasy is about intensity, not temporal extensity. Giovanni Casanova used many spiritual lures in his seductions, the occult, anything that would inspire lofty sentiments. For the time that he was involved with a woman, she would feel that he would do anything for her, that he was not just using her only to abandon her. But she also knew that when it became convenient to end the affair, he would cry, give her a magnificent gift, then quietly leave. This was just what many young women wanted, a temporary diversion from marriage or an oppressive family. Sometimes pleasure is best when we know it's fleeting. Chapter 20 Mix Pleasure with Pain The greatest mistake in seduction is being too nice. At first, Perhaps your kindness is charming, but it soon grows monotonous. You're trying too hard to please and seem insecure. Instead of overwhelming your targets with niceness, try inflicting some pain. Lure them in with focused attention, then change direction, appearing suddenly uninterested. Make them feel guilty and insecure. Even instigate a breakup subjecting them to an emptiness and pain that will give you room to maneuver. Now a rapprochement, an apology, a return to your earlier kindness, will turn them weak at the knees. The lower the lows you create, the greater the highs. To heighten the erotic charge, create the excitement of fear. The Emotional Roller Coaster one hot summer afternoon in 1894, Don Mateo Diaz, a 38-year-old resident of Seville, decided to visit a local tobacco factory. Because of his connections, Don Mateo was allowed to tour the place, but his interest was not in the business side. Don Mateo liked young girls, and hundreds of them worked in the factory. Just as he had expected that day, many of them were in a state of near undress because of the heat. It was quite a spectacle. He enjoyed the sights for a while, but the noise and the temperature soon got to him. As he was heading for the door, though, a worker of no more than sixteen called out to him, Caballero, if you will give me a penny, I will sing you a little song. The girl's name was Conchita Perez, and she looked young and innocent, in fact, beautiful, with a sparkle in her eye that suggested a taste for adventure the perfect prey. He listened to her song, which seemed vaguely suggestive, tossed her a coin that was equal to a month's salary, tipped his hat, then left. It was never good to come on too strong too early. As he walked along the street, he plotted how he would lure her into an affair. Suddenly, he felt a hand on his arm, and he turned to see her walking alongside him. It was too hot to work, would he be a gentleman and escort her home? Of course. Do you have a lover? he asked her. No, she said. I am Mosita, which means pure, a virgin. Conchita lived with her mother in a run-down part of town. Don Mateo exchanged pleasantries, slipped the mother some money. He knew from experience how important it was to keep the mother happy, then left. 
He considered waiting a few days, but he was impatient and returned the following morning. The mother was out. He and Conchita resumed their playful banter from the day before, and to his surprise she suddenly sat in his lap, put her arms around him, and kissed him. His strategy flying out the window, he took hold of her and returned the kiss. She immediately jumped up, her eyes flashing with anger. You are trifling with me, she said, using me for a quick thrill. Don Mateo denied having any such intentions and apologized for going too far. When he left, he felt confused. She had started it all. Why should he feel guilty? And yet he did. Young girls can be so unpredictable. It's best to break them in slowly. Over the next few days, Don Mateo was the perfect gentleman. He visited every day, showered mother and daughter with gifts, made no advances, at least not at first. The damned girl had become so familiar with him that she would dress in front of him or greet him in her nightgown. These glimpses of her body drove him crazy, and he would sometimes try to steal a kiss or a caress, only to have her push him away and scold him. Weeks went by. Clearly he had shown that his was not a passing fancy. Tired of the endless courtship, he took Conchita's mother aside one day and proposed that he set the girl up in a house of her own. He would treat her like a queen. She would have everything she wanted. So, of course, would her mother. Surely his proposal would satisfy the two women. But the next day, a note came from Conchita, expressing not gratitude, but recrimination. He was trying to buy her love. You shall never see me again, she concluded. He hurried to the house, only to discover that the women had moved out that very morning without leaving word where they were going. Don Mateo felt terrible. Yes, he had acted like a boor. Next time he would wait months or years, if need be, before being so bold. Soon, however, another thought assailed him. He would never see Conchita again. Only then did he realize how much he loved her. The winter passed the worst of Mateo's life. One spring day he was walking down the street when he heard someone calling his name. He looked up. Conchita was standing in an open window, beaming with excitement. She bent down toward him and he kissed her hand, beside himself with joy. Why had she disappeared so suddenly? It was all going too quickly, she said. She had been afraid of his intentions and of her own feelings. But seeing him again, she was certain that she loved him. Yes, she was ready to be his mistress. She would prove it. She would come to him. Being apart had changed them both, he thought. A few nights later, as promised, she appeared at his house. They kissed and began to undress. He wanted to savor every minute, to take it slowly, but he felt like a caged bull finally set free. He followed her into bed, his hands all over her. He started to take off her underwear, but it was laced up in some complicated way. Eventually, he had to sit up and take a look. She was wearing some elaborate canvas contraption of a kind he had never seen. No matter how hard he tugged and pulled, it would not come off. He felt like hitting Conchita. He was so distraught, but instead he started to cry. She explained she wanted to do everything with him, yet to remain a mosita. This was her protection. Exasperated, he sent her home. Over the next few weeks, Don Mateo began to reassess his opinion of Conchita. He saw her flirting with other men and dancing a suggestive flamenco in a bar. She wasn't a mosita, he decided. She was playing him for money. And yet he could not leave her. Another man would take his place, an unbearable thought. She would invite him to spend the night in her bed as long as he promised not to force himself on her, and then, as if to torture him beyond reason, she would get into bed naked, supposedly because of the heat. All this he put up with on the grounds that no other man had such privileges. But one night, 
Pushed to the limits of frustration, he exploded with anger and issued an ultimatum, either give me what I want or you will never see me again. Suddenly, Conchita started to cry. He had never seen her cry, and it moved him. She, too, was tired of all this, she said, her voice trembling. If it wasn't too late, she was ready to accept the proposal she had once turned down. Set her up in a house, and he would see what a devoted mistress she would be. Don Mateo wasted no time. He bought her a villa, gave her plenty of money to decorate it. After eight days the house was ready. She would receive him there at midnight. What joys awaited him! Don Mateo showed up at the appointed hour. The barred door to the courtyard was closed. He rang the bell. She came to the other side of the door. Kiss my hands, she said through the bars. Now kiss the hem of my skirt and the tip of my foot in its slipper. He did as she requested. That is good, she said. Now you may go. His shocked expression just made her laugh. She ridiculed him, then made a confession. She was repulsed by him. Now that she had a villa in her name, she was free of him at last. She called out, and a young man appeared from the shadows of the courtyard. As Don Mateo watched, too stunned to move, they began to make love on the floor right before his eyes. The next morning, Conchita appeared at Don Mateo's house, supposedly to see if he had committed suicide. To her surprise, he hadn't. In fact, he slapped her so hard she fell to the ground. Conchita, he said, you have made me suffer beyond all human strength. You have invented moral tortures to try them on the only man who loved you passionately. I now declare that I am going to possess you by force. Conchita screamed that she would never be his, but he hit her again and again. Finally, moved by her tears, he stopped. Now she looked up at him lovingly. Forget the past, she said. Forget all that I have done. Now that he hit her, now that she could see his pain, she felt certain he truly loved her. She was still a mosita. The affair with the young man the night before had been only for show, ending as soon as he had left, and she still belonged to him. You're not going to take me by force. I await you in my arms. Finally, she was sincere. To his supreme delight, he discovered that she was, indeed, still a virgin. Interpretation Don Mateo and Conchita Perez are characters in the 1896 novella Woman and Puppet by Pierre Luis. Based on a true story, the Miss Charpillon episode in Casanova's memoirs, the novella has served as the basis for two films, Joseph von Sternberg's Devil is a Woman with Marlena Dietrich and Luis Buñuel's That Obscure Object of Desire. In Luis's story, Conchita takes a proud and aggressive older man and, in the space of a few months, turns him into an abject slave. Her method is simple. She stimulates as many emotions as possible, including heavy doses of pain. She excites his lust, then makes him feel base for taking advantage of her. She gets him to play the protector, then makes him feel guilty for trying to buy her. Her sudden disappearance anguishes him. He has lost her, so that when she reappears, never by accident, he feels intense joy, which, however, she quickly turns back into tears. Jealousy and humiliation then precede the final moment when she gives him her virginity. Even after this, according to the story, she finds ways to continue to torment him. Each low she inspires, guilt, despair, jealousy, emptiness, creates the space for a more intense high. He becomes an addict, hooked on the alternation of charge and withdrawal. Your seduction 
should never follow a simple course upward toward pleasure and harmony. The climax will come too soon and the pleasure will be weak. What makes us intensely appreciate something is previous suffering. A brush with death makes us fall in love with life. A long journey makes a return home that much more pleasurable. Your task is to create moments of sadness, despair, and anguish, to create the tension that allows for a great release. Don't worry about making people angry. Anger is a sure sign that you have your hooks in them. Nor should you be afraid that if you make yourself difficult, people will flee. We only abandon those who bore us. The ride on which you take your victims can be torturous, but never dull. At all costs, keep your targets emotional and on edge. Create enough highs and lows, and you will wear away the last vestiges of their willpower. Harshness and Kindness in 1972, Henry Kissinger, then President Richard Nixon's Assistant for National Security Affairs, received a request for an interview from the famous Italian journalist Oriana Fallaci. Kissinger rarely gave interviews. He had no control over the final product, and he was a man who needed to be in control. But he had read Fallaci's interview with a North Vietnamese general, and it had been instructive. She was extremely well informed on the Vietnam War, Perhaps he could gather some information of his own, pick her brain. He decided to ask for a pre-interview, a preliminary meeting. He would grill her on different subjects. If she passed the test, he would grant her an interview proper. They met, and he was impressed. She was extremely intelligent and tough. It would be an enjoyable challenge to outwit her and prove that he was tougher. He agreed to a short interview a few days later. To Kissinger's annoyance, Falacci began the interview by asking him whether he was disappointed by the slow pace of the peace negotiations with North Vietnam. He would not discuss the negotiations. He had made that clear in the pre-interview, yet she continued the same line of questioning. He grew a little angry. That's enough, he said. I don't want to talk any more about Vietnam. Although she didn't immediately abandon the subject, her questions became gentler. What were his personal feelings toward the leaders of South and North Vietnam? Still, he ducked. I'm not the kind of person to be swayed by emotion. Emotions serve no purpose, he said. She moved to grander philosophical issues, war, peace. She praised him for his role in the rapprochement with China. Without realizing it, Kissinger began to open up. He talked of the pain he felt in dealing with Vietnam, the pleasures of wielding power. Then suddenly the harsher questions returned. Was he simply Nixon's lackey, as many suspected? Up and down she went, alternately baiting and flattering him. His goal had been to pump her for information while revealing nothing about himself. By the end, though, she had given him nothing, while he had revealed a range of embarrassing opinions. His view of women as playthings, for instance, and his belief that he was popular with the public because people saw him as a kind of lonesome cowboy, the hero who cleans things up by himself. When the interview was published, Nixon, Kissinger's boss, was livid about it. In 1973, the Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, granted Falachi an interview. He knew how to handle the press, be noncommittal, speak in generalities, seem firm yet polite. This approach had worked a thousand times before. Falachi began the interview on a personal level, asking how it felt to be a king, to be the target of assassination attempts, and why the Shah always seemed so sad. He talked of the burdens of his position, the pain and loneliness he felt. It seemed a release of sorts to talk about his professional problems. As he talked, Falachi said little, her silence goading him on. Then suddenly she changed the subject. He was having difficulties with his second wife. Surely that must hurt him. This was a sore spot, and Pallavi got angry. 
He tried to change the subject, but she kept returning to it. Why waste time talking about wives and women, he said. He then went so far as to criticize women in general, their lack of creativity, their cruelty. Falacci kept at him. He had dictatorial tendencies, and his country lacked basic freedoms. Falacci's own books were on his government's blacklist. Hearing this, the Shah seemed somewhat taken aback. Perhaps he was dealing with a subversive writer. But then she softened her tone again, asked him about his many achievements. The pattern repeated. The moment he relaxed, she blindsided him with a sharp question. When he grew bitter, she lightened the mood. Like Kissinger, he found himself opening up despite himself and mentioning things he would later regret, such as his intention to raise the price of oil. Slowly, he fell under her spell, even began to flirt with her. Even if you're on the blacklist of my authorities, he said at the end of the interview, I'll put you on the white list of my heart. Interpretation Most of Falacci's interviews were with powerful leaders, men and women with an overwhelming need to control the situation, to avoid revealing anything embarrassing. This put her and her subjects in conflict, since getting them to open up, grow emotional, give up control, was exactly what she wanted. The classic, seductive approach of charm and flattery would get her nowhere with these people. They would see right through it. Instead, Falacci preyed on their emotions, alternating harshness and kindness. She would ask a cruel question that touched on the deepest insecurities of the subject, who would get emotional and defensive. Deep down, though, something else would stir inside them, the desire to prove to Falacci that they did not deserve her implicit criticisms. Unconsciously, they wanted to please her, to make her like them. When she then shifted tone, indirectly praising them, they felt they were winning her over and were encouraged to open up. Without realizing it, they would give freer rein to their emotions. In social situations, we all wear masks and keep our defenses up. It's embarrassing, after all, to reveal one's true feelings. As a seducer, you must find a way to lower these resistances. The charmer's approach of flattery and attention can be effective here, particularly with the insecure, but it can take months of work and can also backfire. To get a quicker result and to break down more inaccessible people, it's often better to alternate harshness and kindness. By being harsh, you create inner tensions. Your targets may be upset with you, but they are also asking themselves questions. What have they done to earn your dislike? When you then are kind, they feel relieved, but also concerned that at any moment they might somehow displease you again. Make use of this pattern to keep them in suspense, dreading your harshness and keen to keep you kind. Your kindness and harshness should be subtle. Indirect digs and compliments are best. Play the psychoanalyst. Make cutting comments concerning their unconscious motives. You're only being truthful. Then sit back and listen. Your silence will goad them into embarrassing admissions. Leaven your judgments with occasional praise, and they will strive to please you like dogs. Keys to Seduction Almost everyone is more or less polite. We learn early on not to tell people what we really think of them. We smile at their jokes, act interested in their stories and problems. It's the only way to live with them. Eventually, this becomes a habit. We are nice, even when it isn't really necessary. We try to please other people, to not step on their toes, to avoid disagreements and conflict. Niceness in seduction, however, though it may at first draw someone to you, it is soothing, comforting, soon loses all effect. Being too nice can literally push the target away from you. Erotic feeling depends on the creation of tension. Without tension, 
Without anxiety and suspense, there can be no feeling of release, of true pleasure and joy. It is your task to create that tension in the target, to stimulate feelings of anxiety, to lead them to and fro so that the culmination of the seduction has real weight and intensity. So rid yourself of your nasty habit of avoiding conflict, which is, in any case, unnatural. You are most often nice, not out of your own inner goodness, but out of fear of displeasing, out of insecurity. Go beyond that fear, and you suddenly have options. The freedom to create pain, then magically dissolve it. Your seductive powers will increase tenfold. People will be less upset by your hurtful actions than you might imagine. In the world today, we often feel starved for experience. We crave emotion, even if it's negative. The pain you cause your targets, then, is bracing. It makes them feel more alive. They have something to complain about. They get to play the victim. As a result, once you've turned the pain into pleasure, they will readily forgive you. Stir up their jealousy. Make them feel insecure and the validation you later give their ego by preferring them over their rivals is doubly delightful. Remember, you have more to fear by boring your targets than by shaking them up. Wounding people binds them to you more deeply than kindness. Create tension so you can release it. If you need inspiration, find the part of the target that most irritates you and use it as a springboard for some therapeutic conflict. The more real your cruelty, the more effective it is. In 1818, the French writer Stendhal, then living in Milan, met the Countess Matilde Viscontini. For him, it was love at first sight. She was a proud, somewhat difficult woman, and she intimidated Stendhal, who was terribly afraid of displeasing her with a stupid comment or undignified act. Finally, unable to take it any longer, he one day took her hand and confessed his love. Horrified, the countess told him to leave and never come back. Stendhal flooded Viscontini with letters, begging her to forgive him. At last she relented. She would see him again, but under one condition. He could visit only once every two weeks for no more than an hour and only in the presence of company. Stendhal agreed. He had no choice. He now lived for those short fortnightly visits, which became occasions of intense anxiety and fear, since he was never quite sure whether she would change her mind and banish him forever. This went on for over two years, during which the Countess never showed him the slightest sign of favor. Stendhal never found out why she had insisted on this arrangement. Perhaps she wanted to toy with him or keep him at a distance. All he knew was that his love for her only grew stronger, became unbearably intense, until finally he had to leave Milan. To get over this sad affair, Stendhal wrote his famous book On Love, in which he described the effect of fear on desire. First, if you fear the loved one, you can never get too close or familiar with him or her. The beloved then retains an element of mystery, which only intensifies your love. Second, there is something bracing about fear. It makes you vibrate with sensation, heightens your awareness, is intensely erotic. According to Stendhal, the closer the loved one brings you to the edge of the precipice, to the feeling that they could abandon you, the dizzier and more lost you will become. Falling in love means literally falling, losing control, a mix of fear and excitement. Apply this wisdom in reverse. Never let your targets get too comfortable with you. They need to feel fear and anxiety. Show them some coldness, a flash of anger they didn't expect. Be irrational if necessary. There is always the trump card, a breakup. Let them feel they have lost you forever. Make them fear that they have lost the power to charm you. Let these feelings sit with them for a while, then pull them back from the precipice. The reconciliation will be intense.
In 33 BC, Mark Antony heard a rumor that Cleopatra, his lover of several years, had decided to seduce his rival, Octavius, and that she was planning to poison Antony. Cleopatra had poisoned people before. In fact, she was an expert in the art. Antony grew paranoid and finally one day confronted her. Cleopatra did not protest her innocence. Yes, that was true. It was quite within her power to poison Antony at any moment. There were no precautions he could take. Only the love she felt for him could protect him. To demonstrate, she took some flowers and dropped them into his wine. Antony hesitated, then raised the cup to his lips. Cleopatra grabbed his arm and stopped him. She had a prisoner brought in to drink the wine, and the prisoner promptly dropped dead. Falling at Cleopatra's feet, Antony professed that he loved her now more than ever. He did not speak out of cowardice. There was no man braver than he. And if Cleopatra could have poisoned him, he, for his part, could have left her and gone back to Rome. No, what pushed him over the edge was the feeling that she had control over his emotions, over life and death. He was her slave. Her demonstration of her power over him was not only effective, but erotic. Like Antony, many of us have masochistic yearnings without realizing it. It takes someone to inflict some pain on us for these deeply repressed desires to come to the surface. You must learn to recognize the types of hidden masochists out there, for each one enjoys a particular kind of pain. For instance, there are people who feel that they deserve nothing good in life and who, unable to deal with success, sabotage themselves constantly. Be nice to them, admit that you admire them, and they are uncomfortable since they feel that they cannot possibly match up to the ideal figure you have clearly imagined them to be. Such self-saboteurs do better with a little punishment. Scold them, make them aware of their inadequacies. They feel they deserve such criticism, and when it comes, it is with a sense of relief. It is also easy to make them feel guilty, a feeling that deep down they enjoy. Other people experience the responsibilities and duties of modern life as such a heavy burden they long to give it all up. These people are often looking for someone or something to worship, a cause, a religion, a guru. Make them worship you. And then there are those who want to play the martyr, recognize them by the joy they take in complaining, in feeling righteous and wronged, then give them a reason to complain. Remember, appearances deceive. Often the strongest-looking people, the Kissingers and Don Mateos, may secretly want to be punished. In any event, follow up pain with pleasure, and you will create a state of dependency that will last for a long time. Reversal People who have recently experienced a lot of pain or a loss will flee if you try to inflict more on them. They have enough in their lives already. Far better to surround these types with pleasure. That will put them under your spell. The technique of inflicting pain works best on those who have it easy, who have power and few problems. People with comfortable lives may also feel a gnawing sense of guilt, as if they had gotten away with something. They may not consciously know it, but secretly they long for some punishment, a good mental thrashing, something that will bring them back down to earth. Also, remember to not use the pleasure-through-pain tactic too early on. Some of the greatest seducers in history, Byron, Jiang Qing, Madame Mao, Picasso, had a sadistic streak, an ability to inflict mental torture. If their victims had known in advance what they were getting themselves into, they would have run for the hills. In truth, most of these seducers lured their targets into their webs by appearing to be paragons of sweetness and affection. Even Byron seemed like an angel when he first met a woman, so that she tended to doubt his devilish reputation, a seductive doubt for it allowed her to think of herself as the only one who really understood him. 
His cruelty would come out later on, but by then it would be too late. The victim's emotions were engaged, and his harshness would only intensify her feelings. In the beginning, then, wear the mask of a lamb, making pleasure and attentiveness your bait. First get under their skin, then lead them on a wild ride. Phase 4. Moving in for the kill. First, you worked on their mind, the mental seduction. Then you confused and stirred them up, the emotional seduction. Now the time has come for hand-to-hand -hand combat, the physical seduction. At this point, your victims are weak and ripe with desire. By showing a little coldness or uninterest, you will spark panic. They will come after you with impatience and erotic energy. Chapter 21. Give them space to fall. The pursuer is pursued. To bring them to a boil, you need to put their minds to sleep and heat up their senses. It's best to lure them into lust by sending certain loaded signals that will get under their skin and spread sexual desire like a poison. Chapter 22. Use physical lures. The moment to strike and move in for the kill is when your victim is brimming with desire, but not consciously expecting the climax to come. Chapter 23. Master the Art of the Bold Move. Once the seduction is over, there is the danger that disenchantment will set in and ruin all your hard work. Chapter 24. Beware the After Effects. If you are after a relationship, then you must constantly re-seduce the victim, creating tension and releasing it. If your victim is to be sacrificed, then it must be done swiftly and cleanly, leaving you free, physically and psychologically, to move on to the next victim. Then the game begins all over. Chapter 21 Give them space to fall. The pursuer is pursued. If your targets become too used to you as the aggressor, they will give less of their own energy and the tension will slacken. You need to wake them up. Turn the tables. Once they are under your spell, take a step back and they will start to come after you. Begin with a touch of aloofness, an unexpected non-appearance a hint that you're growing bored. Stir the pot by seeming interested in someone else. Make none of this explicit. Let them only sense it and their imagination will do the rest, creating the doubt you desire. Soon they will want to possess you physically and restraint will go out the window. The goal is to have them fall into your arms of their own will. Create the illusion that the seducer is being seduced. Seductive Gravity In the early 1840s, the center of attention in the French art world was a young woman named Apollonie Sabatier. She was so much the natural beauty that sculptors and painters vied to immortalize her in their works, and she was also charming, easy to talk to, and seductively self-sufficient. Men were drawn to her. Her Paris apartment became a gathering spot for writers and artists, and soon Madame Sabatier, as she came to be known, although she was not married, was hosting one of the most important literary salons in France. Writers such as Gustave Flaubert, the elder Alexandre Dumas, and Théophile Gautier were among her regular guests. Near the end of 1852, when she was thirty, Madame Sabatier received an anonymous letter. The writer confessed that he loved her deeply. Worried that she would find his sentiments ridiculous, he would not reveal his name, yet he had to let her know that he adored her. Sabatier was used to such attentions. One man after another had fallen in love with her, but this letter was different. In this man she seemed to have inspired a quasi-religious ardor. 
The letter, written in a disguised handwriting, contained a poem dedicated to her, titled, To One Who Is Too Gay. It began by praising her beauty, yet ended with the lines, And so, one night I'd like to sneak, when darkness tolls the hour of pleasure, a craven thief toward the treasure which is your person, plump and sleek. And, most vertiginous delight, into those lips so freshly striking, and daily lovelier to my liking, infuse the venom of my spite. Mixed in with her admirer's adoration, clearly, was a strange kind of lust, with a touch of cruelty to it. The poem both intrigued and disturbed her, and she had no idea who had written it. A few weeks later, another letter arrived, as before the writer enveloped Sabatier in cult-like worship, mixing the physical and the spiritual, and as before there was a poem, all in one, in which he wrote, No single beauty is the best, since she is all one flower divine. O oh, mystic metamorphosis, my senses into one sense flow. Her voice makes perfume when she speaks. Her breath is music faint and low. Clearly, the author was haunted by Sabatier's presence and thought of her constantly. But now she began to be haunted by him, thinking of him night and day, and wondering who he was. His subsequent letters only deepened the spell. It was flattering to hear that he was enchanted by more than her beauty, yet also flattering to know that he was not immune to her physical charms. One day an idea occurred to Madame Sabatier as to who the writer might be. A young poet who had frequented her salon for several years, Charles Baudelaire. He seemed shy, in fact had hardly spoken to her, but she had read some of his poetry, and although the poems in the letters were more polished, the style was similar. At her apartment, Baudelaire would always sit politely in a corner, but now that she thought of it, he would smile at her strangely, nervously. It was the look of a young man in love. Now when he visited, she watched him carefully, and the more she watched, the surer she was— that he was the writer, but she never confirmed her intuition, because she did not want to confront him. He might be shy, and he was a man, and at some point he would have to come to her, and she felt certain that he would. Then, suddenly, the letters stopped coming, and Madame Sabatier could not understand why, since the last one had been even more adoring than all of the others before. Several years went by in which she often thought of her anonymous admirer's letters, but they were never renewed. In 1857, however, Baudelaire published a book of poetry, The Flowers of Evil, and Madame Sabatier recognized several of the verses. They were the ones he had written for her. Now they were out in the open for everyone to see. A little while later the poet sent her a gift— a specially bound copy of the book and a letter, this time signed with his name. Yes, he wrote, he was the anonymous writer. Would she forgive him for being so mysterious in the past? Furthermore, his feelings for her were as strong as ever. Quote, you didn't think for a moment that I could have forgotten you. You, to me, are more than a cherished image conjured up in a dream. You're my superstition, my constant companion, my secret. Farewell, dear madame. I kiss your hands with profound devotion. Unquote. This letter had a stronger effect on Madame Sabatier than the others had. Perhaps it was his childlike sincerity and the fact that he had finally written to her directly. Perhaps it was that he loved her, but asked nothing of her, unlike all the other men she knew, who at some point had always turned out to want something. Whatever it was, she had an uncontrollable desire to see him. The next day she invited him to her apartment alone. Baudelaire appeared at the appointed hour. He sat nervously in his seat, gazing at her with his large eyes, saying little, and what he did say was formal and polite. He seemed aloof. 
After he left, a kind of panic seized Madame Sabatier, and the next day she wrote him a first letter of her own. Quote, Today I'm more calm, and I can feel more clearly the impression of our Tuesday evening together. I can tell you, without the danger of your thinking I'm exaggerating, that I'm the happiest woman on the face of the earth, that I've never felt more truly that I love you, and that I've never seen you look more beautiful, more adorable, my divine friend. Unquote. Madame Sabatier had never before written such a letter. She had always been the one who was pursued. Now she had lost her usual self-possession, and it only got worse. Baudelaire did not answer right away. When she saw him next, he was colder than before. She had the feeling there was someone else, that his old mistress, Jeanne Duval, had suddenly reappeared in his life and was pulling him away from her. One night she turned aggressive, embracing him, trying to kiss him, but he did not respond and quickly found an excuse to leave. Why was he suddenly inaccessible? She began to flood him with letters, begging him to come to her. Unable to sleep, she would wait all night for him to show up. She had never experienced such desperation. Somehow she had to seduce him, possess him, have him all to herself. She tried everything, letters, coquetry, all kinds of promises, until he finally wrote that he was no longer in love with her, and that was that. Interpretation Baudelaire was an intellectual seducer. He wanted to overwhelm Madame Sabatier with words, dominate her thoughts, make her fall in love with him. Physically, he knew he could not compete with her many other admirers. He was shy, awkward, not particularly handsome. So he resorted to his one strength, poetry. Haunting her with anonymous letters gave him a perverse thrill. He had to know she would realize, eventually, that he was her correspondent. No one else wrote like him. But he wanted her to figure this out on her own. He stopped writing to her because he had become interested in someone else, but he knew she would be thinking of him, wondering, perhaps waiting for him. And when he published his book, he decided to write to her again, this time directly, stirring up the old venom he had injected in her. When they were alone, he could see she was waiting for him to do something, to take hold of her, but he was not that kind of seducer. Besides, it gave him pleasure to hold himself back, to sense his power over a woman whom so many desired. By the time she turned physical and aggressive, the seduction was over for him. He had made her fall in love. That was enough. The devastating effect of Baudelaire's push and pull on Madame Sabatier teaches us a great lesson in seduction. First, it is always best to keep at some distance from your targets. You do not have to go as far as remaining anonymous, but you don't want to be seen too often or to be seen as intrusive. If you're always in their face, always the aggressor, they will become used to being passive, and the tension in your seduction will flag. Use letters to make them think about you all the time, to feed their imagination. Cultivate mystery. Stop them from figuring you out. Baudelaire's letters were delightfully ambiguous, mixing the physical and the spiritual, teasing Sabatier with their multiplicity of possible interpretations. Then, at the point when they are ripe with desire and interest, when perhaps they are expecting you to make a move, as Madame Sabatier expected that day in her apartment, take a step back. You are unexpectedly distant, friendly, but no more than that, certainly not sexual. Let this sink in for a day or two. Your withdrawal will trigger anxiety. The only way to relieve this anxiety is to pursue and possess you. Step back now, and you make your targets fall into your arms like ripe fruit, blind to the force of gravity that is drawing them to you. The more they participate, the more their willpower is engaged, the deeper the erotic effect. You have challenged them to use their own seductive powers on you, and when they respond, 
the tables will turn and they will pursue you with desperate energy. Keys to Seduction Since humans are naturally obstinate and willful creatures and prone to suspicions of people's motives, it is only natural in the course of any seduction that in some ways your target will resist you. Seductions, then, are rarely easy or without setbacks. But once your victims overcome some of their doubts and begin to fall under your spell, they will reach a point where they start to let go. They may sense that you are leading them along, but they are enjoying it. No one likes things to be complicated and difficult, and your target will expect the conclusion to come quickly. That is the point, however, where you must train yourself to hold back. Deliver the pleasurable climax they're so greedily awaiting, succumb to the natural tendency to bring the seduction to a rapid end, and you will have missed an opportunity to ratchet up the tension, to make the affair more heated. After all, you don't want a passive little victim to toy with. You want the seduced to engage their will in all its force, to become active participants in the seduction. You want them to pursue you, hopelessly ensnaring themselves in your web in the process. The only way to accomplish this is to take a step back and make them anxious. You have strategically retreated before, see chapter 12, but this is different. The target is falling for you now, and your retreat will lead to panicky thoughts. You're losing interest. It's somehow my fault. Perhaps it's something I've done. Rather than think you're rejecting them on your own, your targets will want to make this interpretation, since if the cause of the problem is something they've done, they have the power to win you back by changing their behavior. If you are simply rejecting them, on the other hand, they have no control. People always want to preserve hope. Now they will come to you, turn aggressive, thinking that will do the trick. They will raise the erotic temperature. Understand, a person's willpower is directly linked to their libido, their erotic desire. When your victims are passively waiting for you, their erotic level is low. When they turn pursuer, getting involved in the process, brimming with tension and anxiety, the temperature is raised. So raise it as high as you can. When you withdraw, make it subtle. You are instilling unease. Your coldness or distance should dawn on your targets when they're alone, in the form of a poisonous doubt creeping into their mind. Their paranoia will become self-generating. Your subtle step back will make them want to possess you, so they will willingly advance into your arms without being pushed. This is different from the strategy in Chapter 20, in which you are inflicting deep wounds, creating a pattern of pain and pleasure. There, the goal is to make your victims weak and dependent. Here, it is to make them active and aggressive. Which strategy you prefer to use, the two cannot be combined, depends on what you want and the proclivities of your victim. In Soren Kierkegaard's The Seducer's Diary, Johannes aims to seduce the young and beautiful Cordelia. He begins by being rather intellectual with her and slowly intriguing her. Then he sends her letters that are romantic and seductive. Now her fascination blossoms into love. Although in person he remains a little distant, she senses in him great depths and is certain that he loves her. Then one day, while they're talking, Cordelia has a strange sensation. Something about him is different. He seems more interested in ideas than in her. Over the next few days, this doubt gets stronger. The letters are a little less romantic. Something is missing. Feeling anxious, she slowly turns aggressive, becomes the pursuer instead of the pursued. The seduction is now much more exciting, at least for Johannes. Johannes's step back is subtle. He merely gives Cordelia the impression that his interest is a little less romantic than the day before. He returns to being the intellectual. 
This stirs the worrisome thought that her natural charms and beauty no longer have as much effect on him. She must try harder, provoke him sexually, prove to herself that she has some power over him. She is now brimming with erotic desire, brought to that point by Johannes's subtle withdrawal of affection. Each gender has its own seductive lures, which come naturally to them. When you seem interested in someone but don't respond sexually, it is disturbing and presents a challenge. They will find a way to seduce you. To produce this effect, first reveal an interest in your targets through letters or subtle insinuation. But when you're in their presence, assume a kind of sexless neutrality. Be friendly, even warm, but no more. You are pushing them into arming themselves with the seductive charms that are natural to their sex. Exactly what you want. In the latter stages of the seduction, let your targets feel that you are becoming interested in another person. This is another form of taking a step back. When Napoleon Bonaparte first met the young widow, Josephine de Beauharnais, in 1795, he was excited by her exotic beauty and the looks she gave him. He began to attend her weekly soirees, and to his delight, she would ignore the other men and remain at his side, listening to him so attentively. He found himself falling in love with Josephine, and had every reason to believe she felt the same. Then, at one soiree, she was friendly and attentive as usual, except that she was equally friendly to another man there, a former aristocrat, like Josephine, the kind of man that Napoleon could never compete with when it came to manners and wit. Doubts and jealousies began to stir within. As a military man, he knew the value of going on the offensive, and after a few weeks of a swift and aggressive campaign, he had her all to himself, eventually marrying her. Of course, Josephine, a clever seductress, had set it all up. She didn't say she was interested in another man, but his mere presence at her house, a look here and there, subtle gestures, made it seem that way. There is no more powerful way to hint that you are losing your desire. Make your interest in another too obvious, though, and it could backfire. This is not the situation in which you want to seem cruel. Doubt and anxiety are the effects you're after. Make your possible interest in another barely perceptible to the naked eye. Once someone has fallen for you, any physical absence will create unease. You are literally creating space. The Russian seductress Lou Andrea Salome had an intense presence. When a man was with her, he felt her eyes boring into him, and often became entranced with her coquettish ways and spirit, but then, almost invariably, something would come up. She would have to leave town for a while, or would be too busy to see him. It was during her absences that men fell hopelessly in love with her, and vowed to be more aggressive next time they were with her. Your absences at this latter point of the seduction should seem at least somewhat justified. You are insinuating not a blatant brush-off, but a slight doubt. Perhaps you could have found some reason to stay. Perhaps you're losing interest. Perhaps there is someone else. In your absence, their appreciation of you will grow. They will forget your faults, forgive your sins. The moment you return, they will chase after you as you desire. It will be as if you had come back from the dead. According to the psychologist Theodor Reich, we learn to love only through rejection. As infants, we are showered with love by our mother. We know nothing else. But when we get a little older, we begin to sense that her love is not unconditional. If we don't behave, if we do not please her, she can withdraw it. The idea that she'll withdraw her affection fills us with anxiety and, at first, with anger. We will show her. We will throw a tantrum. But that never works, and we slowly realize that the only way to keep her from rejecting us again is to imitate her, to be as loving, kind, and affectionate as she is. This will bond her to us in the deepest way. 
The pattern is ingrained in us for the rest of our lives. By experiencing a rejection or a coldness, we learn to court and pursue, to love. Recreate this primal pattern in your seduction. First, shower your targets with affection. They will not be sure where this is coming from, but it is a delightful feeling and they will never want to lose it. When it does go away, in your strategic step back, they'll have moments of anxiety and anger, perhaps throwing a tantrum, and then the same childlike reaction. The only way to win you back, to have you for sure, will be to reverse the pattern, to imitate you, to be the affectionate giving one. It's the terror of rejection that turns the table. This pattern will often repeat itself naturally in an affair or relationship. One person goes cold, the other pursues, then goes cold in turn, making the first person the pursuer, and on and on. As a seducer, don't leave this to chance. Make it happen. You are teaching the other person to become a seducer, just as the mother in her own way taught the child to return her love by turning her back. For your own sake, learn to relish this reversal of roles. Don't merely play at being the pursued, but enjoy it, give in to it. The pleasure of being pursued by your victim can often surpass the thrill of the hunt. Reversal There are moments when creating space and absence will blow up in your face. An absence at a critical moment in the seduction can make the target lose interest in you. It also leaves too much to chance. While you're away, they could find another person who will distract their thoughts from you. Cleopatra easily seduced Mark Antony, but after their first encounters, he returned to Rome. Cleopatra was mysterious and alluring, but if she let too much time pass, he would forget her charms. So she let go of her usual coquetry and came after him when he was on one of his military campaigns. She knew that once he saw her, he would fall under his spell again and pursue her. Use absence only when you are sure of the target's affection, and never let it go on too long. It's most effective later in the seduction. Also, never create too much space. Don't write too rarely. Don't act too cold. Don't show too much interest in someone else. That is the strategy of mixing pleasure with pain, detailed in chapter 20, and will create a dependent victim, or will even make him or her give up completely. Some people, too, are inveterately passive. They're waiting for you to make the bold move, and if you don't, they'll think you're weak. The pleasure to be had from such a victim is less than the pleasure you'll get from someone more active. But if you're involved with such a type, do what you need to if you are to have your way. Then end the affair and move on. Chapter 22 Use Physical Lures Targets with active minds are dangerous. If they see through your manipulations, they may suddenly develop doubts. Put their minds gently to rest and waken their dormant senses by combining a non-defensive attitude with a charged sexual presence. While your cool, nonchalant air is calming their minds and lowering their inhibitions, your glances, voice, and bearing, oozing sex and desire, are getting under their skin, agitating their senses, and raising their temperature. Never force the physical. Instead, infect your targets with heat. Lure them in to lust. Lead them into the moment, an intensified present in which morality, judgment, and concern for the future all melt away, and the body succumbs to pleasure. Raising the Temperature in 1889, the top New York theatrical manager, Ernest Jurgens, visited France on one of his many scouting trips. Jurgens was known for his honesty, a rare commodity in the shady entertainment world, and for his ability to find unusual acts. He had to spend the night in Marseille, 
and while wandering along the quay of the old harbor, he heard excited catcalls issuing from a working-class cabaret, and decided to go in. A twenty-one-year-old Spanish dancer named Carolina Otero was performing, and the minute Jurgens laid eyes on her, he was a changed man. Her appearance was startling, five foot ten, fiery dark eyes, black waist-length hair, her body corseted into a perfect hourglass figure. But it was the way she danced that made his heart pound, her whole body alive, writhing like an animal in heat as she performed a fandango. Her dancing was hardly professional, but she enjoyed herself so much and was so unrestrained that none of that mattered. Jurgens also couldn't help but notice the men in the cabaret watching her, their mouths agape. After the show, Jurgens went backstage to introduce himself. Otero's eyes came alive as he spoke of his job and of New York. He felt a heat, a twitching in his body as she looked him up and down. Her voice was deep and raspy, the tongue constantly in play as she rolled her R's. Closing the door, Otero ignored the knocks and pleas of the admirers dying to speak to her. She said that her way of dancing was natural. Her mother was a gypsy. Soon she asked Jurgens to be her escort that evening. And as he helped her with her coat, she leaned back toward him slightly, as if she had lost her balance. As they walked around the city, her arm in his, she would occasionally whisper in his ear. Jurgens felt his usual reserve melt away. He held her tighter. He was a family man, had never considered cheating on his wife. But without thinking, he brought Otero back to his hotel room. She began to take off some of her clothes, coat, gloves, hat, a perfectly normal thing to do. But the way she did it made him lose all restraint. The normally timid Jurgens went on the attack. The next morning, Jurgens signed Otero to a lucrative contract, a great risk considering that she was an amateur at best. He brought her to Paris and assigned a top theatrical coach to her. Hurrying back to New York, he fed the newspapers with reports of this mysterious Spanish beauty poised to conquer the city. Soon, rival papers were claiming she was an Andalusian countess, an escaped harem girl, the widow of a sheik, on and on. He made frequent trips to Paris to be with her, forgetting about his family, lavishing money and gifts on her. Otero's New York debut in October of 1890 was an astounding success. Otero dances with abandon, read an article in the New York Times. Her lithe and supple body looks like that of a serpent writhing in quick, graceful curves. In a few short weeks, she became the toast of New York society, performing at private parties late into the night. The tycoon William Vanderbilt courted her with expensive jewels and evenings on his yacht, other millionaires vied for her attention. Meanwhile, Jurgens was dipping into the company till to pay for presents for her. He would do anything to keep her, a task in which he was facing heavy competition. A few months later, after his embezzling became public, he was a ruined man. He eventually committed suicide. Otero went back to France, to Paris, and over the next few years rose to become the most infamous courtesan of the Belle Epoque. Word spread quickly. A night with La Belle Otero, as she was now known, was more effective than all the aphrodisiacs in the world. She had a temper, and was demanding, but that was to be expected. Prince Albert of Monaco, a man who had been plagued by doubts of his virility, felt like an insatiable tiger after a night with Otero. She became his mistress. Other royalty followed. Prince Albert of Wales, later King Edward the Seventh, the Shah of Persia, Grand Duke Nicholas of Russia. Less wealthy men emptied their bank accounts, and Jurgens was only the first of many whom Otero drove to suicide. During World War I, a 29-year-old American soldier named Frederick, stationed in France, won $37,000 in a four-day crap game. On his next leave, he went to Nice and checked himself into the finest hotel. 
On his first night in the hotel restaurant, he recognized Otero sitting alone at a table. He had seen her perform in Paris ten years before and had become obsessed with her. She was now close to fifty, but was more alluring than ever. He greased some palms and was able to sit at her table. He could hardly talk. The way her eyes bored into him, a simple readjustment in her chair, her body brushing up against him as she got up, the way she managed to walk in front of him and display herself. Later, strolling along a boulevard, they passed a jewelry store. He went inside, and moments later found himself plopping down $31,000 for a diamond necklace. For three nights, La Belotero was his. Never in his life had he felt so masculine and impetuous. Years later, he still believed it was well worth the price he had paid. Interpretation Although La Belle Otero was beautiful, hundreds of women were more so, or were more charming and talented. But Otero was constantly on fire. Men could read it in her eyes, the way her body moved, a dozen other signs. The heat that radiated out from her came from her own inner desires. She was insatiably sexual. But she was also a practiced and calculating courtesan, and knew how to put her sexuality to effect. On stage, she made every man in the audience come alive, abandoning herself in dance. In person, she was cooler, or slightly so. A man likes to feel that a woman is inflamed not because she has an insatiable appetite, but because of him. So Otero personalized her sexuality, using glances, a brushing of skin, a more languorous tone of voice, a saucy comment, to suggest that the man was heating her up. In her memoirs, she revealed that Prince Albert was a most inept lover. Yet he believed, along with many other men, that with her... He was Hercules himself. Her sexuality actually originated from her, but she created the illusion that the man was the aggressor. The key to luring the target into the final act of your seduction is not to make it obvious, not to announce that you are ready to pounce or be pounced upon. Everything should be geared not to the conscious mind, but to the senses. You want your target to read cues not from your words or actions, but from your body. You must make your body glow with desire for the target. Your desire should be read in your eyes, in a trembling in your voice, in your reaction when your bodies draw near. You cannot train your body to act this way, but by choosing a victim, see chapter 1, who has this effect on you, it will all flow naturally. During the seduction, you will have had to hold yourself back, to intrigue and frustrate the victim. You will have frustrated yourself in the process and will already be champing at the bit. Once you sense that the target has fallen for you and cannot turn back, let those frustrated desires course through your blood and warm you up. You don't need to touch your targets or become physical, as La Belotero understood. Sexual desire is contagious. They will catch your heat and glow in return. Let them make the first move. It will cover your tracks. The second and third moves are yours. Lowering Inhibitions One day in 1931, in a village in New Guinea, a young girl named Tupersalai heard some happy news. Her father, Alaman, who had left some months before to work on a tobacco plantation, had returned for a visit. Tuper Selai ran to greet him. Accompanying her father was a white man, an unusual sight in these parts. He was a 22-year-old Australian from Tasmania, and he was the owner of the plantation. His name was Errol Flynn. Flynn smiled warmly at Tuper Selai, seeming particularly interested in her bare breasts. As was the custom in New Guinea then, she wore only a grass skirt. He said in pidgin English how beautiful she was, and kept repeating her name, which he pronounced remarkably well. He did not say much else, mind you. 
He didn't speak her language, so she said goodbye and walked away with her father. But later that day she discovered, to her dismay, that Mr. Flynn had taken a liking to her and had purchased her from her father for two pigs, some English coins, and some seashell money. The family was poor, and the father liked the price. To Priscilla had a boyfriend in the village whom she did not want to leave, but she didn't dare disobey her father, and she left with Mr. Flynn for the tobacco plantation. On the other hand, she had no intention of being friendly with this man, from whom she expected the worst kind of treatment. In the first few days, Tupercelli missed her village terribly, and felt nervous and out of sorts. But Mr. Flynn was polite and talked in a soothing voice. She began to relax, and since he kept his distance, she decided it was safe to approach him. His white skin was tasty to the mosquitoes, so she began to wash him every night with scented bush herbs to keep them away. Soon she had a thought. Mr. Flynn was lonely and wanted a companion. That was why he had bought her. At night he usually read. Instead, she began to entertain him by singing and dancing. Sometimes he tried to communicate in words and gestures, struggling in pigeon. She had no idea what he was trying to say, but he made her laugh, and one day she did understand something, the word swim. He was inviting her to go swimming with him in the Laloki River. She was happy to go along, but the river was full of crocodiles, so she brought along her spear, just in case. At the sight of the river, Mr. Flynn seemed to come alive. He tore off his clothes and dove in. She followed and swam after him. He put his arms around her and kissed her. They drifted downstream, and she clung to him. She had forgotten about the crocodiles. She had also forgotten about her father, her boyfriend, her village, and everything else there was to forget. Around a bend of the river he picked her up and carried her to a secluded grove near the river's edge. It all happened rather suddenly, which was fine with Tupercelli. From then on this was a daily ritual, the river, the grove, until the time came when the tobacco plantation was no longer doing so well, and Mr. Flynn left New Guinea. One day, some ten years later, a young girl named Blanca Rosa Veltair went to a party at the Ritz Hotel in Mexico City. As she wandered through the bar looking for her friends, a tall, older man blocked her path and said in a charming accent, You must be Blanca Rosa. He did not have to introduce himself. He was the famous Hollywood actor Errol Flynn. His face was plastered on posters everywhere, and he was friends of the party's hosts, the Davises, and had heard them praise the beauty of Blanca Rosa, who was turning eighteen the following day. He led her to a table in the corner. His manner was graceful and confident, and listening to him talk, she forgot about her friends. He spoke of her beauty, repeated her name, said he could make her a star. Before she knew what was happening, he had invited her to join him in Acapulco, where he was vacationing. The Davises, their mutual friends, could come along as chaperones. That would be wonderful, she said, but her mother would never agree. Don't worry about that, Flynn replied, and the following day he showed up at their house with a beautiful gift for Blanca, a ring with her birthstone. Melting under his charming smile, Blanca's mother agreed to his plan. Later that day, Blanca found herself on a plane to Acapulco. It was all like a dream. The Davises, under orders from Blanca's mother, tried not to let her out of their sight, so Flynn put her on a raft, and they drifted out into the ocean, far from the shore. His flattering words filled her ears, and she let him hold her hand and kiss her cheek. That night they danced together, and when the evening was over he escorted her to her room and serenaded her with a song as they finally parted. It was the end of a perfect day. In the middle of the night she woke up to hear him calling her name from her hotel room balcony. How had he gotten there? His room was a floor above. He must have somehow jumped or swung down, a dangerous maneuver. 
She approached, not at all afraid, but curious. He pulled her gently into his arms and kissed her. Her body convulsed, overwhelmed with new sensations. Totally at sea, she began to cry. Out of happiness, she said. Flynn comforted her with a kiss and returned to his room above in the same inexplicable way he had arrived. Now Blanca was hopelessly in love with him and would do anything he asked of her. A few weeks later, in fact, she followed him to Hollywood, where she went on to become a successful actress known as Linda Christian. In 1942, an 18-year-old girl named Nora Eddington had a temporary job selling cigarettes at the Los Angeles County Courthouse. The place was a madhouse at the time, teeming with tabloid journalists. Two young girls had charged Errol Flynn with rape. Nora, of course, noticed Flynn, a tall, dashing man who occasionally bought cigarettes from her, but her thoughts were with her boyfriend, a young Marine. A few weeks later, Flynn was acquitted, the trial ended, and the place settled down. A man she had met during the trial called her up one day. He was Flynn's right-hand man, and on Flynn's behalf, he wanted to invite her up to the actor's house on Mulholland Drive. Nora had no interest in Flynn, and in fact she was a little afraid of him, but a girlfriend who was dying to meet him talked her into going and bringing her along. What did she have to lose? Nora agreed to go. On the day, Flynn's friend showed up and drove them to a splendid house on top of a hill. When they arrived, Flynn was standing shirtless by his swimming pool. He came to greet her and her girlfriend, moving so gracefully, like a lithe cat, and his manner so relaxed she felt her jitters melt away. He gave them a tour of the house, which was full of artifacts of his various sea voyages. He talked so delightfully of his love of adventure that she wished she had had adventures of her own. He was the perfect gentleman, and even let her talk about her boyfriend without the slightest sign of jealousy. Nora had a visit from her boyfriend the next day. Somehow, he didn't seem so interesting anymore. They had a fight and broke up on the spot. That night, Flynn took her out on the town to the famous Mocambo nightclub. He was drinking and joking, and she fell into the spirit and happily let him touch her hand. Then suddenly she panicked. I'm a Catholic and a virgin, she blurted out, and some day I'm going to walk down the church aisle wearing a veil, and if you think you're going to sleep with me, you're mistaken. Totally calm and unruffled, Flynn said she had nothing to fear. He simply liked being with her. She relaxed and politely asked him to put his hand back. Over the next few weeks, she saw him almost every day. She became his secretary. Soon she was spending weekend nights as his house guest. He took her on skiing and boating trips. He remained the perfect gentleman, but when he looked at her or touched her hand, she felt overwhelmed by an exhilarating sensation, a tingling on her skin that she compared to stepping into a cold needle shower on a red-hot day. Soon she was going to church less often, drifting away from the life she had known. Although outwardly nothing had changed between them, inwardly all semblance of resistance to him had melted away. One night, after a party, she succumbed. She and Flynn eventually engaged in a stormy marriage that lasted seven years. Interpretation the women who became involved with Errol Flynn, and by the end of his life they numbered in the thousands, had every reason in the world to feel suspicious of him. He was real life's closest thing to a Don Juan. In fact, he had played the legendary seducer in a film. He was constantly surrounded by women who knew that no involvement with him could last. And then there were the rumors of his temper and his love of danger and adventure. No woman had greater reason to resist him than Nora Eddington. When she met him, he stood accused of rape. She was involved with another man. She was a God-fearing Catholic. Yet she fell under his spell, just like all the rest. Some seducers, D. H. Lawrence, for instance, operate mostly on the mind, creating fascination, stirring up the need to possess them. Flynn operated on the body. His cool, nonchalant manner infected women. 
lowering their resistance. This happened almost the minute they met him, like a drug. He was at ease around women, graceful and confident. They fell into this spirit, drifting along on a current he created, leaving the world and its heaviness behind. It was only you and him. Then, perhaps that same day, perhaps a few weeks later, there would come a touch of his hand, a certain look that would make them feel a tingling, a vibration, a dangerously physical excitement. They would betray that moment in their eyes, a blush, a nervous laugh, and he would swoop in for the kill. No one moved faster than Errol Flynn. The greatest obstacle to the physical part of the seduction is the target's education, the degree to which he or she has been civilized and socialized. Such education conspires to constrain the body, dull the senses, fill the mind with doubts and worries. Flynn had the ability to return a woman to a more natural state, in which desire, pleasure, and sex had nothing negative attached to them. He lured women into adventure not with arguments, but with an open, unrestrained attitude that infected their minds. Understand, it all starts from you. When the time comes to make the seduction physical, train yourself to let go of your own inhibitions, your doubts, your lingering feelings of guilt and anxiety. Your confidence and ease will have more power to intoxicate the victim than all the alcohol you could apply. Exhibit a lightness of spirit. Nothing bothers you. Nothing daunts you. You take nothing personally. You are inviting your targets to shed the burdens of civilization, to follow your lead and drift. Don't talk of work, duty, marriage, the past or future. Plenty of other people will do that. Instead, offer the rare thrill of losing oneself in the moment where the senses come alive and the mind is left behind. Keys to Seduction Now, more than ever, our minds are in a state of constant distraction, barraged with endless information, pulled in every direction. Many of us recognize the problem. Articles are written, studies are completed, but they simply become more information to digest. It's almost impossible to turn off an overactive mind. The attempt simply triggers more thoughts, an inescapable hall of mirrors. Perhaps we turn to alcohol, to drugs, to physical activity, anything to help us slow the mind, be more present in the moment. Our discontent presents the crafty seducer with infinite opportunity. The waters around you are teeming with people seeking some kind of release from mental overstimulation. The lure of unencumbered physical pleasure will make them take your bait, but as you prowl the waters, understand the only way to relax a distracted mind is to make it focus on one thing. A hypnotist asks the patient to focus on a watch swinging back and forth. Once the patient focuses, the mind relaxes. The senses awaken. The body becomes prone to all kinds of novel sensations and suggestions. As a seducer, you are a hypnotist, and what you're making the target focus on is you. Throughout the seductive process, you've been filling the target's mind. Letters, mementos, shared experiences keep you constantly present, even when you're not there. Now, as you shift to the physical part of the seduction, you must see your targets more often. Your attention must become more intense. Errol Flynn was a master at this game. When he homed in on a victim, he dropped everything else. The woman was made to feel that everything came second to her, his career, his friends, everything. Then he would take her on a little trip, preferably with water around. Slowly the rest of the world would fade into the background, and Flynn would take center stage. The more your targets think of you, the less they are distracted by thoughts of work and duty. When the mind focuses on one thing, it relaxes, and when the mind relaxes, all the little paranoid thoughts that we're prone to, do you really like me, am I intelligent or beautiful enough, what does the future hold, vanish from the surface. Remember, it all starts with you. Be undistracted, present in the moment, and the target will follow suit. 
the intense gaze of the hypnotist creates a similar reaction in the patient. Once the target's overactive mind starts to slow down, their senses will come to life, and your physical lures will have double their power. Now a heated glance will give them flush. You will have a tendency to employ physical lures that work primarily on the eyes, the sense we most rely on in our culture. Physical appearances are critical, but you're after a general agitation of the senses. La Belle Otero made sure men noticed her breasts, her figure, her perfume, her walk. No part was allowed to predominate. The senses are interconnected. An appeal to smell will trigger touch. An appeal to touch will trigger vision. Casual or accidental contact, better a brushing of the skin than something more forceful right now, will create a jolt and activate the eyes. Subtly modulate the voice, make it slower and deeper. Living senses will crowd out rational thought. In the 18th century libertine novel, The Wayward Head and Heart, by Crébillon Fils, Madame de Lursay is trying to seduce a younger man, Maycourt. Her weapons are several. One night at a party she's hosting, she wears a revealing gown. Her hair is slightly tousled. She throws him heated glances. Her voice trembles a bit. When they're alone, she innocently gets him to sit close to her and talks more slowly. At one point, she starts to cry. Mekur has many reasons to resist her. He's fallen in love with a girl his own age, and he's heard rumors about Madame de Lursay that should make him distrust her. But the clothes, the looks, the perfume, the voice, the closeness of her body, the tears, it all begins to overwhelm him. An indescribable agitation stirred my senses, says Mekur. Mekur succumbs. The French libertines of the 18th century called this the moment. The seducer leads the victim to a point where he or she reveals involuntary signs of physical excitation that can be read in various symptoms. Once those signs are detected, the seducer must work quickly, applying pressure on the target to get lost in the moment, the past, the future, all moral scruples vanishing in air. Once your victims lose themselves in the moment, it's all over. Their mind, their conscience, no longer holds them back. The body gives in to pleasure. Madame de Lursay lures Maycourt into the moment by creating a generalized disorder of the senses, rendering him incapable of thinking straight. In leading your victims into the moment, remember a few things. First, a disordered look... Madame de Lursay's tousled hair, her ruffled dress, has more effect on the senses than a neat appearance. It suggests the bedroom. Second, be alert to the signs of physical excitation. Blushing, trembling of the voice, tears, unusually forceful laughter, relaxing movements of the body, any kind of involuntary mirroring, their gestures imitating yours, a revealing slip of the tongue— these are signs that the victim is slipping into the moment and pressure is to be applied. In 1934, a Chinese football player named Li met a young actress named Lang Ping in Shanghai. He began to see her often at his matches, cheering him on. They would meet at public affairs and he would notice her glancing at him with her strange yearning eyes, then looking away. One evening, he found her seated next to him at a reception. Her leg brushed up against his. They chatted, and she asked him to see a movie with her at a nearby cinema. Once they were there, her head found its way onto his shoulder. She whispered into his ear something about the film. Later, they strolled the streets, and she put her arm around his waist. She brought him to a restaurant where they drank some wine. Lee took her to his hotel room, and there he found himself overwhelmed by caresses and sweet words. She gave him no room to retreat, no time to cool down. Three years later, Lan Ping, soon to be renamed Jiang Qing, played a similar game on Mao Zedong. She was to become Mao's wife, the infamous Madame Mao, leader of the Gang of Four. Seduction, like warfare, 
is often a game of distance and closeness. At first, you track your enemy from a distance. Your main weapons are your eyes and a mysterious manner. Byron had his famous underlook, Madame Mao, her yearning eyes. The key is to make the look short and to the point, then look away like a rapier glancing the flesh. Make your eyes reveal desire and keep the rest of the face still. A smile will spoil the effect. Once the victim is heated up, you quickly bridge the distance, turning to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, in which you give the enemy no room to withdraw, no time to think or to consider the position in which you've placed him or her. To take the element of fear out of this, use flattery. Make the target feel more masculine or feminine. Praise their charms. It's their fault that you've become so physical and aggressive. There's no greater physical lure than to make the target feel alluring. Remember, the girdle of Aphrodite, which gave her untold seductive powers, included that of sweet flattery. Shared physical activity is always an excellent lure. The Russian mystic Rasputin would begin his seductions with a spiritual lure, the promise of a shared religious experience. But then his eyes would bore into his target at a party, and inevitably he would lead her in a dance, which would become more and more suggestive as he moved closer to her. Hundreds of women succumbed to this technique. For Flynn, it was swimming or sailing. In such physical activity, the mind turns off and the body operates according to its own laws. The target's body will follow your lead will mirror your moves as far as you want it to go. In the moment, all moral considerations fade away, and the body returns to a state of innocence. You can partly create that feeling through a devil-may-care attitude. You don't worry about the world or what people think of you. You don't judge your target in any way. Part of Flynn's appeal was his total acceptance of a woman. He wasn't interested in a particular body type, a woman's race, her level of education, her political beliefs. He was in love with her feminine presence. He was luring her into an adventure, free of society's strictures and moral judgments. With him, she could act out a fantasy, which for many was the chance to be aggressive or transgressive, to experience danger. So, empty yourself of your tendency to moralize and judge. You have lured your targets into a momentary world of pleasure, soft and accommodating, all rules and taboos thrown out the window. Reversal Some people panic when they sense they're falling into the moment. Often, using spiritual lures will help disguise the increasingly physical nature of the seduction. That is how the lesbian seductress Natalie Barney operated. In her heyday, at the turn of the 20th century, lesbian sex was immensely transgressive, and women new to it often felt a sense of shame or dirtiness. Barney led them into the physical, but so enveloped it in poetry and mysticism that they relaxed and felt purified by the experience. Today, few people feel repulsed by their sexual nature, but many are uncomfortable with their bodies. A purely physical approach will frighten and disturb them. Instead, make it seem a spiritual, mystical union, and they will take less notice of your physical manipulations. Chapter 23 Master the Art of the Bold Move A moment has arrived. Your victim clearly desires you, but is not ready to admit it openly, let alone act on it. This is the time to throw aside chivalry, kindness, and coquetry, and to overwhelm with a bold move. Don't give the victim time to consider the consequences. Create conflict. Stir up tension so that the bold move comes as a great release. Showing hesitation or awkwardness means you're thinking of yourself as opposed to being overwhelmed by the victim's charms. Never hold back or meet the target halfway under the belief that you're being correct and considerate. You must be seductive now, not political. One person must go on the offensive, and it is you. The Perfect Climax
Through a campaign of deception, the misleading appearance of a transformation into goodness, the Reich Valmont laid siege to the virtuous young President de Tourvel, until the day came when, disturbed by his confession of love for her, she insisted he leave the chateau where both of them were staying as guests. He complied. From Paris, however, he flooded her with letters, describing his love for her in the most intense terms. She begged him to stop, and once again he complied. Then, several weeks later, he paid a surprise visit to the chateau. In his company, Tourvel was flushed and jumpy, and kept her eyes averted, all signs of his effect on her. Again she asked him to leave. "'What have you to fear?' he replied. "'I have always done what you asked. I have never forced myself on you.' He kept his distance, and she slowly relaxed. She no longer left the room when he entered, and she could look at him directly. When he offered to accompany her on a walk, she didn't refuse. They were friends, she said. She even put her arm in his as they strolled, a friendly gesture. One rainy day, they could not take their usual walk. He met her in the hallway as she was entering her room. For the first time, she invited him in. She seemed relaxed, and Valmont sat near her on a sofa. He talked of his love for her. She gave the faintest protest. He took her hand. She left it there and leaned against his arm. Her voice trembled. She looked at him, and he felt his heart flutter. It was a tender, loving look. She started to speak. Well, yes, I... Then suddenly collapsed into his arms, crying. It was a moment of weakness, yet Valmont held himself back. Her crying became convulsive. She begged him to help her to leave the room before something terrible happened. He did so. The following morning he awoke to some surprising news. In the middle of the night, claiming she was feeling ill, Tourvel had suddenly left the chateau and returned home. Valmont didn't follow her to Paris. Instead, he began staying up late and using no powder to hide the peaked looks that soon ensued. He went to the chapel every day and dragged himself despondently around the chateau. He knew that his hostess would be writing to the president who would hear of his sad state. Next, he wrote to a church father in Paris and asked him to pass along a message to Tourvel. He was ready to change his life for good. He wanted one last meeting to say goodbye and to return the letters she had written him over the last few months. The father arranged a meeting, and so one late afternoon in Paris, Valmont found himself once again alone with Tourvel in a room in her house. The president was clearly on edge, but she couldn't look him in the eye. They exchanged pleasantries, but then Valmont turned harsh. She had treated him cruelly, had apparently been determined to make him unhappy. Well, this was the end. They were separating for good, since that was how she wanted it. Tourvel argued back. She was a married woman. She had no choice. Valmont softened his tone and apologized. He was unused to having such strong feelings, he said, and could not control himself. Still, he would never trouble her again. Then he laid on a table the letters he had come to return. Tourvel came closer. The sight of her letters and the memory of all the turmoil they represented affected her powerfully. She had thought his decision to renounce his libertine way of life was voluntary, she said, with a touch of bitterness in her voice, as if she resented being abandoned. No, it wasn't voluntary, he replied. It was because she had spurned him. Then he suddenly stepped closer and took her in his arms. She did not resist. Adorable woman, he cried. You have no idea of the love you inspire. You will never know how I have worshipped you, how much dearer my feelings have been to me than life. May your days be blessed with all of the happiness of which you have deprived me. Then he let her go and turned to leave. Tourvel suddenly snapped. You shall listen to me. I insist, she said, and grabbed his arm. He turned around and they embraced. This time he waited no longer, 
picking her up, carrying her to an ottoman, overwhelming her with kisses and sweet words of the happiness he now felt. Before this sudden flood of caresses, all her resistance gave way. From this moment on I am yours, she said, and you will hear neither refusals nor regrets from my lips. Tourvel was true to her word, and Valmont's suspicions were to prove correct. The pleasures he won from her were far greater than with any other woman he had seduced. Interpretation Valmont, a character in Chauderlot de Laclos' eighteenth-century novel Dangerous Liaisons, can sense several things about the Présidente at first glance. She is timid and nervous. Her husband almost certainly treats her with respect, probably too much of it. Beneath her interest in God, religion, and virtue is a passionate woman, vulnerable to the lure of romance and to the flattering attention of an ardent suitor. No one, not even her husband, has given her this feeling because they have all been so daunted by her prudish exterior. Valmont begins his seduction, then, by being indirect. He knows Tourvel is secretly fascinated with his bad reputation. By acting as if he is contemplating a change in his life, he can make her want to reform him, a desire that is unconsciously a desire to love him. Once she has opened up ever so slightly to his influence, he strikes at her vanity. She has never felt desired as a woman, and on some level cannot help but enjoy his love for her. Of course she struggles and resists, but that is only a sign that her emotions are engaged. Indifference is the single most effective deterrent to seduction. By taking his time, by making no bold moves even when he has the opportunity for them, he instills in her a false sense of security and proves himself by being patient. On what he pretends is his last visit to her, however, he consents she's ready. Weak, confused, more afraid of losing the addictive feeling of being desired than of suffering the consequences of adultery. He deliberately makes her emotional, dramatically displays her letters, creates some tension by playing a game of push and pull, and when she takes his arm, he knows it is the time to strike. Now he moves quickly, allowing her no time for doubts or second thoughts, but his move seems to arise out of love, not lust. After so much resistance and tension, what a pleasure to finally surrender. The climax now comes as a great release. Never underestimate the role of vanity in love and seduction. If you seem impatient, champing at the bit for sex, you signal that it's all about libido and that it has little to do with the target's own charms. That is why you must defer the climax. A lengthier courtship will feed the target's vanity and will make the effect of your bold move all the more powerful and enduring. Wait too long, though, showing desire but then proving too timid to make your move, and you will stir up a different kind of insecurity. You found me desirable, but you're not acting on your desires. Maybe you're not so interested. Doubts like these affront your target's vanity. If you're not interested, maybe I'm not so interesting, and are fatal in the latter stages of seduction. Awkwardness and misunderstandings will spring up everywhere. Once you read in your target's gestures that they are ready and open, a look in the eye, mirroring behavior, a strange nervousness in your presence, you must go on the offensive, make them feel that their charms have unhinged you and pushed you into the bold move. They will then have the ultimate pleasure, physical surrender and a psychological boost to their vanity. Keys to Seduction Think of seduction as a world you enter, a world that is separate and distinct from the real world. The rules are different here. What works in daily life can have the opposite effect in seduction. The real world features a democratizing, leveling impulse in which everything has to seem at least something like equal. 
An overt imbalance of power, an overt desire for power, will stir envy and resentment. We learn to be kind and polite, at least, on the surface. Even those who have power generally try to act humble and modest. They don't want to offend. In seduction, on the other hand, you can throw all of that out. Revel in your dark side. Inflict a little pain. In some ways, be more yourself. Your naturalness in this respect will prove seductive in itself. The problem is that after years of living in the real world, we lose the ability to be ourselves. We become timid, humble, over-polite. Your task is to regain some of your childhood qualities, to root out all this false humility. And the most important quality to recapture is boldness. No one is born timid. Timidity is a protection we develop. If we never stick our necks out, if we never try, we will never have to suffer the consequences of failure or success. If we're kind and unobtrusive, no one will be offended. In fact, we will seem saintly and likable. In truth, timid people are often self-absorbed, obsessed with the way people see them, and not at all saintly. And humility may have its social uses, but it is deadly in seduction. You need to be able to play the humble saint at times. It is a mask you wear. But in seduction, take it off. Boldness is bracing, erotic, and absolutely necessary to bring the seduction to its conclusion. Done right, it tells your targets that they have made you lose your normal restraint and gives them license to do so as well. People are yearning to have a chance to play out the repressed sides of their personality. At the final stage of a seduction, boldness eliminates any awkwardness or doubts. In a dance, two people cannot lead. One takes over, sweeping the other along. Seduction is not egalitarian. It's not a harmonic convergence. Holding back at the end out of fear of offending or thinking it correct to share the power is a recipe for disaster. This is an arena not for politics, but for pleasure. It can be by the man or woman, but a bold move is required. If you are so concerned about the other person, console yourself with the thought that the pleasure of the one who surrenders is often greater than that of the aggressor. As a young man, the actor Errol Flynn was uncontrollably bold. This often got him into trouble. He became too aggressive around desirable women. Then, while traveling through the Far East, he became interested in the Asian practice of tantric sex, in which the male must train himself not to ejaculate, preserving his potency and heightening both partners' pleasure in the process. Flynn later applied this principle to his seductions as well, teaching himself to restrain his natural boldness and delay the end of the seduction as long as possible. So, while boldness can work wonders, uncontrollable boldness is not seductive, but frightening. You need to be able to turn it on and off at will, know when to use it. As in Tantrism, you can create more pleasure by delaying the inevitable. In the 1720s, the Duc de Richelieu developed an infatuation with a certain duchess. The woman was exceptionally beautiful and was desired by one and all, but she was far too virtuous to take a lover, although she could be quite coquettish. Richelieu bided his time. He befriended her, charming her with the wit that had made him the favorite of the ladies. One night, a group of such women, including the duchess, decided to play a practical joke on him, in which... He was to be forced naked out of his room at the palace of Versailles. The joke worked to perfection. The ladies all got to see him in his native glory and had a good chuckle watching him run away. There were many places Richelieu could have hidden. The place he chose was the Duchess's bedroom. Minutes later, he watched her enter and undress, and once the candles were extinguished, he crept into bed with her. She protested, tried to scream. He covered her mouth with kisses, and she eventually and happily relented. Richelieu had decided to make his bold move then for several reasons. 
First, the Duchess had come to like him and even to harbor a secret desire for him. She would never act upon it or admit it, but he was certain it existed. Second, she had seen him naked and could not help but be impressed. Third, she would feel a touch of pity for his predicament and for the joke played on him. Richelieu, a consummate seducer, would find no more perfect moment. The bold move should come as a pleasant surprise, but not too much of a surprise. Learn to read the signs that the target is falling for you. His or her manner toward you will have changed. It will be more pliant, with more words and gestures mirroring yours, yet there will still be a touch of nervousness and uncertainty. Inwardly, they have given in to you, but they don't expect a bold move. This is the time to strike. If you wait too long, to the point where they consciously desire and expect you to make a move, it loses the piquancy of coming as a surprise. You want a degree of tension and ambivalence so that the move represents a great release. Their surrender will relieve tension like a long-awaited summer storm. Don't plan your bold move in advance. It cannot seem calculated. Wait for the opportune moment, as Richelieu did. Be attentive to favorable circumstances. This will give you room to improvise and go with the moment, which will heighten the impression you want to create of being suddenly overwhelmed by desire. If you ever sense that the victim is expecting the bold move, take a step back. Lull them into a false sense of security, then strike. Sometime in the 15th century, the writer Bandello relates, a young Venetian widow had a sudden lust for a handsome nobleman. She had her father invite him to their palace to discuss business, but during the meeting the father had to leave, and she offered to give the young man a tour of the place. His curiosity was piqued by her bedroom, which she described as the most splendid room in the palace, but which she also passed by without letting him enter. He begged to be shown the room, and she granted his wish. He was spellbound. The velvets, the rare objets, the suggestive paintings, the delicate white candles. A beguiling scent filled the room. The widow put out all of the candles but one, then led the man to the bed which had been heated with a warming pan. He quickly succumbed to her caresses. Follow the widow's example. Your bold move should have a theatrical quality to it. That will make it memorable, and make your aggressiveness seem pleasant, part of the drama. The theatricality can come from the setting, an exotic or sensual location. It can also come from your actions. The widow piqued her victim's curiosity by creating the suspense about her bedroom. An element of fear, someone might find you, say, will heighten the tension. Remember, you're creating a moment that must stand out from the sameness of daily life. Keeping your targets emotional will both weaken them and heighten the drama of the moment, and the best way to keep them at an emotional pitch is by infecting them with emotions of your own. When Valmont wanted the President to become calm, angry, or tender, he showed that emotion first, and she mirrored it. People are very susceptible to the moods of those around them. This is particularly acute at the latter stages of a seduction, when resistance is low and the target has fallen under your spell. At the point of the bold move, learn to infect your target with whatever emotional mood you require, as opposed to suggesting the mood with words. You want access to the target's unconscious, which is best obtained by infecting them with emotions bypassing their conscious ability to resist. It may seem expected for the male to make the bold move, but history is full of successfully bold females. There are two main forms of feminine boldness. In the first, more traditional form, the coquettish woman stirs male desire, is completely in control, then at the last minute, after bringing her victim to a boil, steps back, and lets him make the bold move. She sets it up, then signals with her eyes, her gestures, that she is ready for him. 
Courtesans have used this method throughout history. It's how Cleopatra worked on Antony, how Josephine seduced Napoleon, how La Belle Otero amassed a fortune during the Belle Epoque. It lets the man maintain his masculine illusions, although the woman is really the aggressor. The second form of feminine boldness doesn't bother with such illusions. The woman simply takes charge, initiates the first kiss, pounces on her victim. This is how Marguerite de Valois, Lou Andrea Salome, and Madame Mao operated, and many men find it not emasculating at all, but very exciting. It all depends on the insecurities and proclivities of the victim. This kind of feminine boldness has its allure because it is more rare than the first kind, but then all boldness is somewhat rare. A bold move will always stand out compared to the usual treatment afforded by the tepid husband, the timid lover, the hesitant suitor. That is how you want it. If everyone were bold, boldness would quickly lose its allure. Reversal If two people come together by mutual consent, that is not a seduction. There is no reversal. Chapter 24 Beware the After Effects Danger follows in the aftermath of a successful seduction. After emotions have reached a pitch, they often swing in the opposite direction, toward lassitude, distrust, disappointment. Beware of the long, drawn-out goodbye. Insecure, the victim will cling and claw, and both sides will suffer. If you are to part, make the sacrifice swift and sudden. If necessary, deliberately break the spell you have created. If you are to stay in a relationship... Beware a flagging of energy, a creeping familiarity that will spoil the fantasy. If the game is to go on, a second seduction is required. Never let the other person take you for granted. Use absence, create pain and conflict to keep the seduced on tenterhooks. Disenchantment Seduction is a kind of spell, an enchantment. When you seduce, you're not quite your normal self. Your presence is heightened. You are playing more than one role. You are strategically concealing your tics and insecurities. You have deliberately created mystery and suspense to make the victim experience a real-life drama. Under your spell, the seduced gets to feel transported away from the world of work and responsibility. You will keep this going for as long as you want or can, heightening the tension, stirring the emotions until the time finally comes to complete the seduction. After that, disenchantment almost inevitably sets in. The release of tension is followed by a letdown of excitement, of energy, that can even materialize as a kind of disgust directed at you by your victim, even though what is happening is really a natural emotional course. It is as if a drug were wearing off, allowing the target to see you as you are, and being disappointed by the flaws that are inevitably there. On your side, you too have probably tended to idealize your targets somewhat, and once your desire is satisfied, you may see them as weak. After all, they have given in to you. You too may feel disappointed. Even in the best of circumstances, you're dealing now with the reality rather than the fantasy, and the flames will slowly die down, unless you start up a second seduction. You may think that if the victim is to be sacrificed, none of this matters, but sometimes your effort to break off the relationship will inadvertently revive the spell for the other person, causing him or her to cling to you tenaciously. No, in either direction... Sacrifice or the integration of the two of you into a couple, you must take disenchantment into account. There is an art to the post-seduction as well. Master the following tactics to avoid undesired after-effects. Fight against inertia. The sense that you're trying less hard 
is often enough to disenchant your victims. Reflecting back on what you did during the seduction, they will see you as manipulative. You wanted something then, and so you worked at it, but now you are taking them for granted. After the first seduction is over, then show that it isn't really over, that you want to keep proving yourself, focusing your attention on them, luring them. That is often enough to keep them enchanted. Fight the tendency to let things settle into comfort and routine. Stir the pot, even if that means a return to inflicting pain and pulling back. Never rely on your physical charms. Even beauty loses its appeal with repeated exposure. Only strategy and effort will fight off inertia. Maintain Mystery Familiarity is the death of seduction. If the target knows everything about you, the relationship gains a level of comfort but loses the elements of fantasy and anxiety. Without anxiety and a touch of fear, the erotic tension is dissolved. Remember, reality is not seductive. Keep some dark corners in your character. Flout expectations. Use absences to fragment the clinging, possessive pull that allows familiarity to creep in. Maintain some mystery or be taken for granted. You will have only yourself to blame for what follows. Maintain lightness. Seduction is a game, not a matter of life and death. There will be a tendency in the post phase to take things more seriously and personally and to whine about behavior that doesn't please you. Fight this as much as possible, for it will create exactly the effect you don't want. You cannot control the other person by nagging and complaining. It will make them defensive, exacerbating the problem. You will have more control if you maintain the proper spirit. Your playfulness, the little ruses you employ to please and delight them, your indulgence of their faults, will make your victims compliant and easy to handle. Never try to change your victims. Instead, induce them to follow your lead. Avoid the slow burnout. Often, one person becomes disenchanted but lacks the courage to make the break. Instead, he or she withdraws inside. As an absence, this psychological step back may inadvertently reignite the other person's desire, and a frustrating cycle begins of pursuit and retreat. Everything unravels slowly. Once you feel disenchanted and know it is over, end it quickly, without apology. That would only insult the other person. A quick separation is often easier to get over. It's as if you had a problem being faithful as opposed to your feeling that the seduced was no longer being desirable. Once you're truly disenchanted, there is no going back, so don't hang on out of false pity. It is more compassionate to make a clean break. If that seems inappropriate or too ugly, then deliberately disenchant the victim with anti-seductive behavior. Examples of Sacrifice and Integration Number 1. In the 1770s, the handsome Chevalier de Belroche began an affair with an older woman, the Marquise de Merteuil. He saw a lot of her, but soon she began to pick quarrels with him. Entranced by her unpredictable moods, he worked hard to please her, showering her with attention and tenderness. Eventually, the quarreling stopped, and as the days went by, de Belroche felt confident that Merteuil loved him, until one day, when he came to visit, and found that she wasn't at home. Her footman greeted him at the door and said he would take the chevalier to a secret house of Merteuil's outside Paris. There, the Marquise was waiting for him in a renewed mood of coquettishness. She acted as if this were their first tryst. The Chevalier had never seen her so ardent. He left at daybreak more in love than ever, but a few days later they quarreled again. The Marquise seemed cold after that, and he saw her flirt with another man at a party. He felt horribly jealous, but as before, his solution was to become more attentive and loving. This, he thought, was the way to appease a difficult woman. Now, Mertoy 
had to spend a few weeks at her country home to handle some business there. She invited de Belroche to join her for an extended stay, and he happily agreed, remembering the new life an earlier stay there had brought to their affair. Once again she surprised him. Her affection and desire to please him were rejuvenated. This time, though, he didn't have to leave the next morning. Days went by, and she refused to entertain any guests. The world would not intrude on them, and this time there was no coldness or quarreling, only good cheer and love. Yet now de Belroche began to grow a little tired of the Marquise. He thought of Paris and the balls he was missing. A week later he cut short his stay on some business pretext and hurried back to the city. Somehow the Marquise did not seem so charming any more. Interpretation The Marquise de Merteuil, a character in Chaudorlot de Laclos's novel Dangerous Liaisons, is a practiced seductress who never lets her affairs drag on too long. De Belroche is young and handsome, but that is all. As her interest in him wanes, she decides to bring him to the secret house to try to inject some novelty into the affair. This works for a while, but it isn't enough. The Chevalier must be gotten rid of. She tries coldness, anger, hoping to start a fight, even a show of interest in another man. All this only intensifies his attachment. She can't just leave him. He might become vengeful or try even harder to win her back. The solution? She deliberately breaks the spell by overwhelming him with attention. Abandoning the pattern of alternating warmth with coldness, she acts hopelessly in love. Alone with her day after day with no space to fantasize, he no longer sees her as enchanting and breaks off the affair. This was her goal all along. If a break with the victim is too messy or difficult, or you lack the nerve, then do the next best thing. Deliberately break the spell that ties him or her to you. Aloofness or anger will only stir the other person's insecurity, producing a clinging horror. Instead, try suffocating them with love and attention. Be clinging and possessive yourself. Moon over the lover's every action and character trait. Create the sense that this monotonous affection will go on forever. No more mystery, no more coquetry, no more retreats, just endless love. Few can endure such a threat. A few weeks of it, and they will be gone. Number 2 King Charles the Second of England was a devoted libertine. He kept a stable of lovers. There was always a favorite mistress from the aristocracy and countless other less important women. He craved variety. One evening in 1668 the king spent an evening at the theater where he conceived a sudden desire for a young actress named Nell Gwynne. She was pretty and innocent-looking, only eighteen at the time, with a girlish glow in her cheeks, but the lines she recited on stage were so impudent and saucy. Deeply excited, the king decided he had to have her. After the performance, he took her out for a night of drinking and merriment, then led her to his royal bed. Nell was the daughter of a fishmonger, and had begun by selling oranges in the theatre. She rose to the status of actress by sleeping with writers and other theatre men. She had no shame about this. When a footman of hers got into a fight with someone who said he worked for a whore, she broke it up by saying, I am a whore. Find something better to fight about. Nell's humor and sass amused the king greatly, but she was low-born and an actress, and he could hardly make her a favorite. After several nights with pretty, witty Nell, he returned to his principal mistress, Louise de Kerouaille, a well-born Frenchwoman. Kerouaille was a clever seductress. She played hard to get, and made it clear she wouldn't give the king her virginity until he had promised her a title. It was the kind of chase Charles enjoyed, and he made her the Duchess of Portsmouth. But soon her greed and difficultness began to wear on his nerves. To divert himself, he turned back to Nell. Whenever he visited her, he was royally entertained with food, drink, and her great good humor. 
The king was bored or melancholy, she took him drinking or gambling or out to the country, where she taught him to fish. She always had a pleasant surprise up her sleeve. What he loved most of all was her wit, the way she mocked the pretentious Keruai. The duchess had the habit of going into mourning whenever a nobleman of another country died, as if he were a relation. Nell, too, would show up at the palace on these occasions, dressed in black, and would sorrowfully say that she was mourning for the Sham of Tartary or the Boog of Oronuku, grand relatives of her own. To her face she called the Duchess Squintabella and the Weeping Willow because of her simpering manners and melancholic airs. Soon the king was spending more time with Nell than with the Duchess. By the time Keruai fell out of favor, Nell had, in essence, become the king's favorite, which she remained until his death in 1685. Interpretation Nell Gwynne was ambitious. She wanted power and fame, but in the 17th century the only way a woman could get those things was through a man, and who better than the king? But to get involved with Charles was a dangerous game. A man like him, easily bored and in need of variety, would use her for a fling, then find someone else. Nell's strategy for the problem was simple. She let the king have his other girls, and never complained. Every time he saw her, though, she made sure he was entertained and diverted. She filled his senses with pleasure, acting as if his position had nothing to do with her love for him. Variety in women could wear on the nerves, tiring a busy king. They all made so many demands. If one woman could provide the same variety, and Nell, as an actress, knew how to play different roles, she had a big advantage. Nell never asked for money, so Charles plied her with wealth. She never asked to be the favorite. How could she? She was a commoner. But he elevated her to the position. Many of your targets will be like kings and queens, particularly those who are easily bored. Once the seduction is over, they will not only have trouble idealizing you, they may also turn to another man or woman whose unfamiliarity seems exciting and poetic. Needing other people to divert them, they often satisfy this need through variety. Don't play into the hands of these bored royals by complaining, becoming self-pitying, or demanding privileges. That would only further their natural disenchantment once the seduction is over. Instead, make them see that you are not the person they thought you were. Make it a delightful game to play new roles, to surprise them, to be an endless source of entertainment. It's almost impossible to resist a person who provides pleasure with no strings attached. When they're with you, keep the spirit light and playful. Play up the parts of your character they find delightful, but never let them feel they know you too well. In the end, you will control the dynamic, and a haughty king or queen will become your abject slave. Number 3 when the great jazz composer Duke Ellington came to town, he and his band were always a big attraction, but especially so for the ladies of the area. They came to hear his music, of course, but once there, they were mesmerized by the Duke himself. On stage, Ellington was relaxed and elegant and seemed to be having such a good time. His face was very handsome and his bedroom eyes were infamous, he slept very little, and his eyes had permanent pouches under them. After the performance, some woman would inevitably invite him to her table, another would sneak into his dressing room, yet another would approach him on his way out. Duke made a point of being accessible, and when he kissed a woman's hand, his eyes and hers would meet for a moment. Sometimes she would signal an interest in him, and his glance in return would say he was more than ready. Sometimes... His eyes were the first to speak. Few women could resist that look, even the most happily married. With the night's music still ringing in her ears, the woman would show up at Ellington's hotel room. He would be dressed in a stylish suit, he loved good clothes, and the room would be full of flowers. There would be a piano in the corner. He would play some music. 
His playing and his elegant, nonchalant manner would come across to the woman as pure theater, a pleasant continuation of the performance she had just witnessed. And when it was over, and Ellington had to leave town, he would give her a thoughtful gift. He would make it seem that the only thing taking him away from her was his touring. A few weeks later, the woman might hear a new Ellington song on the radio, with lyrics suggesting that she had inspired it. If ever he passed through the area again, she would find a way to be there, and Ellington would often renew the affair, if only for a night. Sometime in the 1940s, two young women from Alabama came to Chicago to attend a debutante ball. Ellington and his band were the entertainment. He was the women's favorite musician, and after the show they asked him for an autograph. He was so charming and engaging that one of the girls found herself asking what hotel he was staying at. He told them with a big grin. The girls switched hotels, and later that day they called up Ellington and invited him to their room for a drink. He accepted. They wore beautiful negligees that they had just bought. When Ellington arrived, he acted completely naturally, as if the warm greeting they gave him were completely usual. The three of them ended up in the bedroom, where one of the young women had an idea. Her mother adored Ellington. She had to call her now and put Ellington on the phone. Not at all put out by the suggestion, Ellington played along. For several minutes he talked to the mother on the telephone, lavishing her with compliments on the charming daughter she had raised, and telling her not to worry. He was taking good care of the girl. The daughter got back on the phone and said, We're fine because we're with Mr. Ellington and he's such a perfect gentleman. As soon as she hung up, the three of them resumed the naughtiness they had started. To the two girls, it later seemed an innocent but unforgettable night of pleasure. Sometimes several of these far-flung mistresses would show up at the same concert. Ellington would go up and kiss each of them four times, a habit of his designed for just this dilemma, and each of the ladies would assume she was the one with whom the kisses really mattered. Interpretation Duke Ellington had two passions, music and women. The two were interrelated. His endless affairs were a constant inspiration for his music. He also treated them as if they were theater, a work of art in themselves. When it came time to separate, he always managed it with a theatrical touch. A clever remark and a gift would make it seem that for him the affair was hardly over. Song lyrics referring to their night together would keep up the aesthetic atmosphere long after he had left town. No wonder women kept coming back for more. This wasn't a sexual affair, a tawdry one-nighter, but a heightened moment in the woman's life. And his carefree attitude made it impossible to feel guilty. Thoughts of one's mother or husband would not spoil the illusion. Ellington was never defensive or apologetic about his appetite for women. It was his nature, and never the fault of the woman, that he was unfaithful. And if he couldn't help his desires, how could she hold him responsible? It was impossible to hold a grudge against such a man or complain about his behavior. Ellington was an aesthetic rake, a type whose obsession with women can only be satisfied by endless variety. A normal man's tomcatting will eventually land him in hot water, but the aesthetic rake rarely stirs up ugly emotions. After he seduces a woman, there is neither an integration nor a sacrifice. He keeps them hanging and hoping. The spell is not broken the next day, because the aesthetic rake makes the separation a pleasant, even elegant experience. The spell Ellington cast on a woman never went away. The lesson is simple. Keep the moments after the seduction and the separation in the same key as before, heightened, aesthetic, and pleasant. If you don't act guilty for your feckless behavior, it's hard for the other person to feel angry or resentful. Seduction is a light-hearted game in which you invest all of your energy in the moment. The separation should be light-hearted and stylish as well. It's work, travel, some dreaded responsibility that calls you away. Create a memorable experience and then move on, and your victim will most likely remember the delightful seduction 
not the separation. You will have made no enemies and will have a lifelong harem of lovers to whom you can always return when you feel so inclined. Number 4 In 1899, 20-year-old Baroness Frieda von Richthofen married an Englishman named Ernest Weekly, a professor at the University of Nottingham, and soon settled into the role of the professor's wife. Weekly treated her well, but she grew bored with their quiet life and his tepid lovemaking. On trips home to Germany, she had a few love affairs, but this wasn't what she wanted either, and so she returned to being faithful and caring for their three children. One day in 1912, a former student of Weekly's, David Herbert Lawrence, paid a visit to the couple's house. A struggling writer, Lawrence wanted the professor's professional advice. He was not home yet, so Frida entertained him. She had never met such an intense young man. He talked of his impoverished youth, his inability to understand women, and he listened attentively to her own complaints. He even scolded her for the bad tea she had made him. Somehow, even though she was a baroness, this excited her. Lawrence returned for later visits, but now to see Frida, not weakly. One day he confessed to her that he had fallen deeply in love with her. She admitted to similar feelings and proposed they find a trysting spot. Instead, Lawrence had a proposal of his own. Leave your husband tomorrow. Leave him for me. What about the children? Frida asked. If the children are more important than our love, Lawrence replied, then stay with them. But if you don't run away with me within a few days, you will never see me again. To Frida, the choice was horrific. She did not care at all about her husband, but the children were what she lived for. Even so, a few days later, she succumbed to Lawrence's proposal. How could she resist a man who was willing to ask for so much to take such a gamble? If she refused, she would always wonder, for such a man only passes once through your life. The couple left England and headed for Germany. Frida would mention sometimes how much she missed her children, but Lawrence had no patience with her. You're free to go back to them at any moment, he would say, but if you stay, don't look back. He took her on an arduous mountaineering trip in the Alps. A baroness, she had never experienced such hardship, but Lawrence was firm. If two people are in love, why should comfort matter? In 1914, Frida and Lawrence were married, but over the following years the same pattern repeated. He would scold her for her laziness, the nostalgia for her children, her abysmal housekeeping. He would take her on trips around the world on very little money, never letting her settle down, although it was her fondest wish. They fought and fought. Once, in New Mexico, in front of friends, he yelled at her, "'Take that dirty cigarette out of your mouth and stop sticking out that fat belly of yours.' "'You'd better stop that talk or I'll tell about your things,' she yelled back. She had learned to give him a taste of his own medicine. They both went outside. Their friends watched, worried it might turn violent. They disappeared from sight, only to reappear moments later, arm in arm, laughing and mooning over one another. That was the most disconcerting thing about the Lawrences. Married for years, they often behaved like infatuated newlyweds. Interpretation When Lawrence first met Frida, he could sense right away what her weakness was. She felt trapped in a stultifying relationship and a pampered life. Her husband, like so many husbands, was kind but never paid enough attention to her. She craved drama and adventure but was too lazy to get it on her own. Drama and adventure were just what Lawrence would provide. Instead of feeling trapped, she had the freedom to leave him at any moment. Instead of ignoring her, he criticized her constantly. At least he was paying attention, never taking her for granted. Instead of comfort and boredom, he gave her adventure and romance. The fights he picked with ritualistic frequency also ensured non-stop drama and the space for a powerful reconciliation. He inspired a touch of fear in her, which kept her off balance. 
never quite sure of him. As a result, the relationship never grew stale. It kept renewing itself. If it's integration you're after, seduction must never stop. Otherwise, boredom will creep in. And the best way to keep the process going is often to inject intermittent drama. This can be painful, opening old wounds, stirring up jealousy, withdrawing a little. Don't confuse this behavior with nagging or carping criticism. This pain is strategic, designed to break up rigid patterns. On the other hand, it can also be pleasant. Think about proving yourself all over again, paying attention to nice little details, creating new temptations. In fact, you should mix the two aspects, for too much pain or pleasure will not prove seductive. You're not repeating the first seduction, for the target has already surrendered. You're simply supplying tiny jolts, little wake-up calls that show two things. You have not stopped trying, and they cannot take you for granted. The little jolt will stir up the old poison, stoke the embers, bring you temporarily back to the beginning when your involvement had a most pleasant freshness and tension. Remember, Comfort and security are the death of seduction. A shared journey with a little bit of hardship will do more to create a deep bond than will expensive gifts and luxuries. The young are right to not care about comfort in matters of love, and when you return to that sentiment, a youthful spark will reignite. Number 5 in 1652, the famous French courtesan Ninon de L'Enclos met and fell in love with the Marquis de Villarceau. Ninon was a libertine. Philosophy and pleasure were more important to her than love. But the Marquis inspired new sensations. He was so bold, so impetuous, that for once in her life she let herself lose a little control. The Marquis was possessive, a trait she normally abhorred but in him it seemed natural, almost charming. He simply couldn't help himself. And so Ninon accepted his conditions. There were to be no other men in her life. For her part, she told him that she would accept no money or gifts from him. This was to be about love, nothing else. She rented a house opposite his in Paris, and they saw each other daily. One afternoon the Marquis suddenly burst in and accused her of having another lover. His suspicions were unfounded, his accusations absurd, and she told him so. This did not satisfy him, and he stormed out. The next day Ninon received news that he'd fallen quite ill. She was deeply concerned. As a desperate recourse, a sign of her love and submission, she decided to cut off her beautiful long hair, for which she was famous and send it to him. The gesture worked, the Marquis recovered, and they resumed their affair still more passionately. Friends and former lovers complained of her sudden transformation into the devoted woman, but she didn't care. She was happy. Now Ninon suggested that they go away together. The Marquis, a married man, could not take her to his chateau, but a friend offered his own in the country as a refuge for the lovers. Weeks became months, and their little stay turned into a prolonged honeymoon. Slowly, though, Ninon had the feeling that something was wrong. The Marquis was acting more like a husband. Although he was as passionate as before, he seemed so confident, as if he had certain rights and privileges that no other man could expect. The possessiveness that once had charmed her began to seem oppressive. Nor did he stimulate her mind. She could get other men, and equally handsome ones, to satisfy her physically, without all that jealousy. Once this realization set in, Ninon wasted no time. She told the Marquis that she was returning to Paris, and that it was over for good. He begged and pleaded his case with much emotion. How could she be so heartless? Although moved, Ninon was firm. Explanations would only make it worse. She returned to Paris and resumed the life of a courtesan. Her abrupt departure apparently shook up the Marquis, but apparently not too badly, for a few months later word reached her that he had fallen in love 
with another woman. Interpretation A woman often spends months pondering the subtle changes in her lover's behavior. She might complain or grow angry. She might even blame herself. Under the weight of her complaints, the man may change for a while, but an ugly dynamic and endless misunderstandings will ensue. What is the point of all of this? Once you're disenchanted, it's really too late. Ninon could have tried to figure out what had disenchanted her, the good looks that now bored her, the lack of mental stimulation, the feeling of being taken for granted, but why waste time figuring it out? The spell was broken, so she moved on. She didn't bother to explain, to worry about de Villasso's feelings, to make it all soft and easy for him. She simply left. The person who seems so considerate of the other, who tries to mend things or make excuses, is really just timid. Being kind in such matters can be rather cruel. The Marquis was able to blame everything on his mistress's heartless, fickle nature. His vanity and pride intact, he could easily move on to another affair and put her behind him. Not only does the long, lingering death of a relationship cause your partner needless pain, it will have long-term consequences for you as well, making you more skittish in the future and weighing you down with guilt. Never feel guilty, even if you were both the seducer and the one who now feels disenchanted. It's not your fault. Nothing can last forever. You have created pleasure for your victims, stirring them out of their rut. If you make a clean, quick break, in the long run, they will appreciate it. The more you apologize, the more you insult their pride, stirring up negative feelings that will reverberate for years. Spare them the disingenuous explanations that only complicate matters. The victim should be sacrificed, not tortured. Number 6 After fifteen years under the rule of Napoleon Bonaparte, the French were exhausted. Too many wars, too much drama. When Napoleon was defeated in 1814 and was imprisoned on the island of Elba, the French were more than ready for peace and quiet. The Bourbons, the royal family deposed by the Revolution of 1789, returned to power. The king was Louis the Eighteenth. He was fat, boring, and pompous, but at least there would be peace. Then, in February of 1815, news reached France of Napoleon's dramatic escape from Elba with seven small ships and a thousand men. He could head for America, start all over, but instead he was just crazy enough to land at Cannes. What was he thinking? A thousand men against all the armies of France? He set off toward Grenoble with his ragtag army. One, at least, had to admire his courage, his insatiable love of glory and of France. Then, too, the French peasantry were spellbound at the sight of their former emperor. This man, after all, had redistributed a great deal of land to them, which the new king was trying to take back. They swooned at the sight of his famous eagle standards, revivals of symbols from the revolution. They left their fields and joined his march. Outside Grenoble, the first of the troops that the kings sent to stop Napoleon caught up with him. Napoleon dismounted and walked on foot toward them. Soldiers of the Fifth Army Corps, he cried out, don't you know me? If there is one among you who wishes to kill his emperor, let him come forward and do so. Here I am. He threw open his gray cloak, inviting them to take aim. There was a moment of silence, and then, from all sides, cries rang out, A vive l'empereur! Long live the emperor! In one stroke, Napoleon's army had doubled in size. The march continued. More soldiers, remembering the glory he had given them, changed sides. The city of Lyon fell without a battle. Generals with larger armies were dispatched to stop him, but the sight of Napoleon at the head of his troops was an overwhelmingly emotional experience for them, and they switched allegiance. King Louis fled France, abdicating in the process. On March 20th, 
Napoleon re-entered Paris and returned to the palace he had left only thirteen months before, all without having had to fire a single shot. The peasantry and the soldiers had embraced Napoleon, but Parisians were less enthusiastic, particularly those who had served in his government. They feared the storms he would bring. Napoleon ruled the country for one hundred days until the Allies and his enemies from within defeated him. This time he was shipped off to the remote island of San Elena, where he was to die. Interpretation Napoleon always thought of France and his army as a target to be wooed and seduced. As General de Ségur wrote of Napoleon, In moments of sublime power he no longer commands like a man, but seduces like a woman. In the case of his escape from Elba, he planned a bold, surprising gesture that would titillate a bored nation. He began his return to France among the people who would be most receptive to him, the peasantry who had revered him. He revived the symbols, the revolutionary colors, the eagle standards that would stir up the old sentiments. He placed himself at the head of his army, daring his former soldiers to fire on him. The march on Paris that brought him back to power was pure theater, calculated for emotional effect every step of the way. What a contrast this former amour presented to the dolt of a king who now ruled them. Napoleon's second seduction of France was not a classical seduction, following the usual steps, but a re-seduction. It was built on old emotions and revived an old love. Once you have seduced a person, or a nation, there is almost always a lull, a slight letdown, which sometimes leads to a separation. It is surprisingly easy, though, to re-seduce the same target. The old feelings never go away. They lie dormant, and in a flash you can take your target by surprise. It is a rare pleasure to be able to relive the past, and one's youth to feel the old emotions. Like Napoleon, add a dramatic flair to your re-seduction. Revive the old images, the symbols, the expressions that will stir memory. Like the French, your targets will tend to forget the ugliness of the separation and will remember only the good things. You should make this second seduction bold and quick, giving your targets no time to reflect or wonder. Like Napoleon, play on the contrast to their current lover making his or her behavior seem timid and stodgy by comparison. Not everyone will be receptive to a re-seduction, and some moments will be inappropriate. When Napoleon came back from Elba, the Parisians were too sophisticated for him and could see right through him. Unlike the peasants of the South, they already knew him well, and his re-entry came too soon. They were too worn out by him. If you want to reseduce someone, choose one who doesn't know you so well, whose memories of you are cleaner, who is less suspicious by nature, and who is dissatisfied with present circumstances. Also, you might want to let some time pass. Time will restore your luster and make your faults fade away. Never see a separation or sacrifice as final. With a little drama and planning, a victim can be retaken in no time. Reversal. To keep a person enchanted, you will have to reseduce them constantly. But you can allow a little familiarity to creep in. The target wants to feel that he or she is getting to know you. Too much mystery will create doubt. It will also be tiring for you who will have to sustain it. The point is not to remain completely unfamiliar, but rather, on occasion, to jolt victims out of their complacency, surprising them as you surprised them in the past. Do this right, and they will have the delightful feeling that they're constantly getting to know more about you, but never too much. Appendix A. Seductive Environment, Seductive Time in seduction, your victims must slowly come to feel an inner change. 
Under your influence, they lowered their defenses, feeling free to act differently, to be a different person. Certain places, environments, and experiences will greatly aid you in your quest to change and transform the seduced. Spaces with a theatrical, heightened quality, opulence, glittering surfaces, a playful spirit, create a buoyant, childlike feeling that make it hard for the victim to think straight. The creation of an altered sense of time has a similar effect. Memorable, dizzying moments that stand out, a mood of festival and play. You must make your victims feel that being with you gives them a different experience from being in the real world. Festival Time and Place Centuries ago, life in most cultures was filled with work and routine, but at certain moments in the year, this life was interrupted by festival. During these festivals, Saturnalias of ancient Rome, the Maypole festivals of Europe, the great potlatches of the Chinook Indians, work in the fields or marketplace stopped. The entire tribe or town gathered in a sacred space set apart for the festival. Temporarily relieved of duty and responsibility, people were granted license to run amok. They would wear masks or costumes which gave them other identities, sometimes those of powerful figures reenacting the great myths of their culture. The festival was a tremendous release from the burdens of daily life. It altered people's sense of time, bringing moments in which they stepped outside of themselves. Time seemed to stand still. Something like this experience can still be found in the world's great surviving carnivals. The festival represented a break in a person's daily life, a radically different experience from routine. On a more intimate level, that is how you must envision your seductions. As the process advances, your targets experience a radical difference from daily life, a freedom from work or responsibility. Plunged into pleasure and play, they can act differently, can become someone else, as if they were wearing a mask. The time you spend with them is devoted to them and nothing else. Instead of the usual rotation of work and rest, you are giving them grand, dramatic moments that stand out. You bring them to places unlike the places they see in daily life, heightened, theatrical places. Physical environment strongly affects people's moods. A place dedicated to pleasure and play insinuates thoughts of pleasure and play. When your victims return to their duties and to the real world, they feel the contrast strongly, and they'll start to crave that other place into which you've drawn them. What you're essentially creating is festival time and place. Moments when the real world stops and fantasy takes over. Our culture no longer supplies such experiences, and people yearn for them. That is why almost everyone is waiting to be seduced and why they will fall into your arms if you play this right. The following are key components to reproducing festival time and place. Create Theatrical Effects Theater creates a sense of a separate magical world. The actor's makeup, the fake but alluring sets, the slightly unreal costumes, these heightened visuals, along with the story of the play, create illusion. To produce this effect in real life, you must fashion your clothes, makeup, and attitude to have a playful, artificial edge, a feeling that you have dressed for the pleasure of your audience. This is the goddess-like effect of a Marlena Dietrich, or the fascinating effect of a dandy like Beau Brummel. Your encounters with your targets should also have a sense of drama, achieved through the settings you choose and through your actions. The target shouldn't know what will happen next. Create suspense through twists and turns that lead to the happy ending. You are performing. Whenever your targets meet you, they're returned to this vague feeling of being in a play. You both have the thrill of wearing masks, of playing a different role from the one your life has allotted you. Use the visual language of pleasure. Certain kinds of visual stimuli signal that you're not in the real world. 
You want to avoid images that have depth, which might provoke thought or guilt. Instead, you should work in environments that are all surface, full of glittering objects, mirrors, pools of water, a constant play of light. The sensory overload of these spaces creates an intoxicating, buoyant feeling. The more artificial, the better. Show your targets a playful world, full of the sights and sounds that excite the baby or child within them. Luxury, the sense that money has been spent or even wasted, adds to the feeling that the real world of duty and morality has been banished. Call it the brothel effect. Keep it crowded or close. People crowding together raise the psychological temperature to hothouse levels. Festivals and carnivals depend on the contagious feeling a crowd creates. Bring your target to such environments sometimes to lower their normal defensiveness. Similarly, any kind of situation that brings people together in a small space for a long period of time is extremely conducive to seduction. For years, Sigmund Freud had a small, tight-knit stable of disciples who attended his private lectures and who engaged in an astonishing number of love affairs. Either lead the seduced into a crowded, festival-like environment, or go trolling for targets in a closed world. Manufacture Mystical Effects Spiritual or mystical effects distract people's minds from reality, making them feel elevated and euphoric. From here, it's but a small step to physical pleasure. Use whatever props are at hand, astrology books, angelic imagery, mystical-sounding music from some far-off culture. The great 18th-century Austrian charlatan Franz Mesmer filled his salons with harp music, the perfume of exotic incense, and a female voice singing in a distant room. On the walls, he put stained glass and mirrors. His dupes would feel relaxed, uplifted, and as they sat in the room where he used magnets for their healing powers, they would feel a kind of spiritual tingling pass from body to body. Anything vaguely mystical helps block out the real world, and it's easy to move from the spiritual to the sexual. Distort their sense of time, speed, and youth. Festival time has a kind of speed and frenzy that make people feel more alive. Seduction should make the heart beat faster so that the seduced loses track of time passing. Take them to places of constant activity and movement. Embark with them on some kind of journey together, distracting their minds with new sights. Youth may fade and disappear, but seduction brings the feeling of being young no matter the age of those involved, and youth is mostly energy. The pace of the seduction must pick up at a certain moment, creating a whirling effect in the mind. It's no wonder that Casanova did much of his seducing at balls, or that the waltz was the preferred tool of many a nineteenth-century rake. Create Moments Everyday life is a drudgery in which the same actions endlessly repeat. The festival, on the other hand, we remember as a moment when everything was transformed, when a little bit of eternity and myth entered our lives. Your seduction must have such peaks, moments when something dramatic happens and time is experienced differently. You must give your targets such moments, whether by staging the seduction in a place, a carnival, a theater, where they naturally occur, or by creating them yourself with dramatic actions that stir up strong emotions. Those moments should be pure leisure and pleasure. No thoughts of work or morality can intrude. Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of King Louis XV, had to re-seduce her easily bored lover every few months. Intensely creative, she devised parties, balls, games, a little theater at Versailles. The seduced revels in affairs like this, sensing the effort you've expended to divert and enchant them. Scenes from Seductive Time and Place Number 1 Around the year 1710, a young man whose father was a prosperous wine dealer in Osaka, Japan, 
found himself daydreaming more and more. He worked night and day for his father, and the burden of family life and all of its duties was oppressive. Like every young man, he had heard of the pleasure districts of the city, the quarters where the normally strict laws of the shogunate could be violated. It was here that you would find the ukiyo, the floating world of transient pleasures, a place where actors and courtesans ruled. This was what the young man was daydreaming about. Biding his time, he managed to find an evening when he could slip out unnoticed. He headed straight for the pleasure quarters. This was a cluster of buildings, restaurants, exclusive clubs, tea houses, that stood out from the rest of the city by their magnificence and color. The moment the young man stepped into it, he knew he was in a different world. Actors wandered the streets in elaborately dyed kimonos. They had such manners and attitudes as if they were still on stage. The streets bustled with energy. The pace was fast. Bright lanterns stood out against the night, as did the colorful posters for the nearby kabuki theater. The women had a completely different air about them. They stared at him brazenly, acting with the freedom of a man. He caught sight of an onagata, one of the men who played female roles in the theater, a man more beautiful than most women he had seen, and whom the passers-by treated like royalty. The young man saw other young men like himself entering a tea house, so he followed them in. Here the highest class of courtesans, the great Tayus, plied their trade. A few minutes after the young man sat down, he heard a noise and bustle, and down the stairs came a few of the Tayus, followed by musicians and jesters. The women's eyebrows were shaved, replaced by a thick black painted line. Their hair was swept up in a perfect fold, and he had never seen such beautiful kimonos. The Tayus seemed to float across the floor, using different kinds of steps, suggestive, creeping, cautious, etc., depending on whom they were approaching and what they wanted to communicate to him. They ignored the young man. He had no idea how to invite them over, but he noticed that some of the older men had a way of bantering with them that was a language all its own. The wine began to flow, music was played, and finally some lower-level courtesans came in. By then the young man's tongue was loosened. These courtesans were much friendlier, and the young man began to lose all track of time. Later he managed to stagger home, and only the next morning did he realize how much money he'd spent. If father ever found out... Yet a few weeks later, he was back. Like hundreds of such sons in Japan, whose stories filled the literature of the period, he was on the path toward squandering his father's wealth on the floating world. Seduction is another world into which you initiate your victims. Like the ukiyo, it depends on a strict separation from the day-to-day -day world. When your victims are in your presence, the outside world, with its morality, its codes, its responsibilities, is banished. Anything is allowed, particularly anything normally repressed. The conversation is lighter and more suggestive. Clothes and places have a touch of theatricality. The license exists to act differently, to be someone else without any heaviness or judging. It is a kind of concentrated psychological floating world that you create for the others, and it becomes addictive. When they leave you and return to their routines, they are doubly aware of what they're missing. The moment they crave the atmosphere you have created, the seduction is complete. As in the floating world, Money is to be wasted. Generosity and luxury go hand in hand with a seductive environment. Number 2. It began in the early 1960s. People would come to Andy Warhol's New York studio, soak up the atmosphere, and stay a while. Then, in 1963, the artist moved into a new Manhattan space, and a member of his entourage covered some of the walls and pillars in tinfoil, and spray-painted a brick wall and other things silver. A red quilted couch in the center, some five-foot-high plastic candy bars, 
a turntable that glittered with tiny mirrors, and helium-filled silver pillows that floated in the air completed the set. Now the L-shaped space became known as the factory, and a scene began to develop. More and more people started showing up. Why not just leave the door open, Andy reasoned, and come what may. During the day, while Andy would work on his paintings and films, people would gather, actors, hustlers, drug dealers, other artists. And the elevator would keep groaning all night as the beautiful people began to make the place their home. Here might be Montgomery Clift nursing a drink by himself. Over there, a beautiful young socialite chatting with a drag queen and a museum curator. They kept pouring in, all of them young and glamorously dressed. It was like one of those children's shows on TV, Andy once said to a friend, where guests keep dropping in on the endless party and there's always some new bit of entertainment. And that was indeed what it seemed like, with nothing serious happening, just lots of talk and flirting and flashbulbs popping and endless posing, as if everyone were in a film. The museum curator would begin to giggle like a teenager, and the socialite would flounce about like a hooker. By midnight, everyone would be packed together. You could hardly move. The band would arrive, the light show would begin, and it would all careen in a new direction, wilder and wilder. Somehow the crowd would disperse at some point. Then, in the afternoon, it would all start up again as the entourage trickled back. Hardly anyone went to the factory just once. It's oppressive always to have to act the same way, playing the same boring role that work or duty imposes on you. People yearn for a place or a moment when they can wear a mask, act differently, be someone else. That's why we glorify actors. They have the freedom and playfulness in relation to their own ego that we would love to have. Any environment that offers a chance to play a different role, to be an actor, is immensely seductive. It can be an environment that you create, like the factory, or a place where you take your target. In such environments, you simply cannot be defensive. The playful atmosphere, the sense that anything is allowed, except seriousness, dispels any kind of reactiveness. Being in such a place becomes a drug. To recreate the effect, remember Warhol's metaphor of the children's TV show. Keep everything light and playful, full of distractions, noise, color, and a bit of chaos. No weight, responsibilities, or judgments. A place to lose yourself in. Number 3. In 1746, a 17-year-old girl named Christina had come to the city of Venice, Italy with her uncle, a priest, in search of a husband. Christina was from a small village but had a substantial dowry to offer. The Venetian men who were willing to marry her, however, didn't please her, so after two weeks of futile searching, she and her uncle prepared to return to their village. They were seated in their gondola about to leave the city when Christina saw an elegantly dressed young man walking toward them. "'There's a handsome fellow,' she said to her uncle. "'I wish he was in the boat with us.' The gentleman could not have heard this, yet he approached, handed the gondolier some money, and sat down beside Christina, much to her delight. He introduced himself as Jacques Casanova. When the priest complimented him on his friendly manners, Casanova replied, Perhaps I should not have been so friendly, my reverend father, if I had not been attracted by the beauty of your niece. Christina told him why they had come to Venice and why they were leaving. Casanova laughed and chided her. A man cannot decide to marry a girl after seeing her for a few days. He must know more about her character. It would take at least six months. He himself was looking for a wife and he explained to her why he had been as disappointed by the girls he had met as she had been disappointed by the men. Casanova seemed to have no destination. He simply accompanied them, entertaining Christina the whole way with witty conversation. When the gondola arrived at the edge of Venice, Casanova hired a carriage to the nearby city of Treviso and invited them to join him. From there they could catch a chaise to their village. The uncle accepted, and on the way to their carriage, Casanova offered his arm to Christina. What would his mistress say if she saw them, she asked. I have no mistress, 
he answered, and I shall never have one again, for I shall never find such a pretty girl as you. No, not in Venice. His words went to her head, filling it with all kinds of strange thoughts, and she began to talk and act in a manner that was new to her, becoming almost brazen. What a pity she couldn't stay in Venice for the six months he needed to get to know a girl, she told Casanova. Without hesitation, he offered to pay her expenses in Venice for that period while he courted her. On the carriage ride, she turned this offer over in her mind, and once in Treviso, she got her uncle alone and begged him to return to the village by himself, then come back for her in a few days. She was in love with Casanova. She wanted to know him better. He was a perfect gentleman who could be trusted. The uncle agreed to do as she wished. The following day, Casanova never left her side. There was not the slightest hint of disagreement in his nature. They spent the day wandering around the city, shopping and talking. He took her to a play in the evening and to the casino after that, supplying her with a domino and a mask. He gave her money to gamble, and she won. By the time the uncle returned to Treviso, she had all but forgotten about her marriage plans. All she could think about was the six months she would spend with Casanova. But she returned to her village with her uncle and waited for Casanova to visit her. He showed up a few weeks later, bringing with him a handsome young man named Charles. Alone with Christina, Casanova explained the situation. Charles was the most eligible bachelor in Venice, a man who would make a much better husband than he would. Christina admitted to Casanova that she too had had her doubts. He was too exciting, had made her think of other things besides marriage, things she was ashamed of. Perhaps it was for the better. She thanked him for taking such pains to find her a husband. Over the next few days, Charles courted her, and they were married several weeks later. The fantasy and allure of Casanova, however, remained in her mind forever. Casanova could not marry. It was against everything in his nature. But it was also against his nature to force himself on a young girl. Better to leave her with the perfect fantasy image than to ruin her life. Besides, he enjoyed the courting and flirting more than anything else. Casanova supplied a young woman with the ultimate fantasy. While he was in her orbit, he devoted every moment to her. He never mentioned work, allowing no boring, mundane details to interrupt the fantasy, and he added great theater. He wore the most spectacular outfits, full of sparkling jewels. He led her to the most wonderful entertainments, carnivals, masked balls, the casinos, journeys with no destination. He was the great master at creating seductive time and environment. Casanova is the model to aspire to. While in your presence your targets must sense a change. Time has a different rhythm. They barely notice its passing. They have the feeling that everything is stopping for them, just as all normal activity comes to halt at a festival. The idle pleasures you provide them are contagious. One leads to another and to another, until it is too late to turn back. Appendix B. Soft Seduction. How to Sell Anything to the Masses. The less you seem to be selling something, including yourself, the better. By being too obvious in your pitch, you'll raise suspicion. You will also bore your audience, an unforgivable sin. Instead, make your approach soft, seductive, and insidious. Soft, be indirect. Create news and events for the media to pick up, spreading your name in a way that seems spontaneous, not hard or calculated. Seductive. Keep it entertaining. Your name and image are bathed in positive associations. You're selling pleasure and promise. Insidious. Aim at the unconscious, using images that linger in the mind, placing your message in the visuals. Frame what you're selling as part of a new trend, and it will become one. It's almost impossible to resist the soft seduction. 
The Soft Cell Seduction is the ultimate form of power. Those who give in to it do so willingly and happily. There is rarely any resentment on their part. They forgive you any kind of manipulation because you've brought them pleasure, a rare commodity in the world. With such power at your fingertips, though, why stop at the conquest of a man or woman? A crowd, an electorate, a nation can be brought under your sway simply by applying on a mass level the tactics that work so well on an individual. The only difference is the goal, not sex, but influence, a vote, people's attention, and the degree of tension. When you're after sex, you deliberately create anxiety, a touch of pain, twists and turns. Seduction on the mass level is more diffuse and soft. Creating a constant titillation, you fascinate the masses with what you're offering. They pay attention to you because it is pleasant to do so. Let's say your goal is to sell yourself as a personality, a trendsetter, a candidate for office. There are two ways to go, the hard sell, the direct approach, and the soft sell, the indirect approach. In the hard sell, you state your case strongly and directly, explaining why your talents, your ideas, your political message are superior to anyone else's. You tout your achievements, quote statistics, bring in expert opinions, even go so far as to induce a bit of fear if the audience ignores your message. The approach is a tad aggressive and might have unwanted consequences. Some people will be offended, resisting your message, even if what you say is true. Others will feel you're manipulating them. Who can trust experts in statistics, and why are you trying so hard? You'll also grate on people's nerves, becoming unpleasant to listen to. In a world in which you cannot succeed without selling to large numbers, the direct approach won't take you far. The soft sell, on the other hand, has the potential to draw in millions because it's entertaining, gentle on the ears, and can be repeated without irritating people. The technique was invented by the great charlatans of 17th century Europe. To peddle their elixirs and alchemic concoctions, they would first put on a show. Clowns, music, vaudeville-type routines that had nothing to do with what they were selling. A crowd would form, and as the audience laughed and relaxed, the charlatan would come on stage and briefly and dramatically discuss the miraculous effects of the elixir. By honing this technique, the charlatans discovered that instead of selling a few dozen bottles of the dubious medicine— they were suddenly selling scores, or even hundreds. In the centuries since, publicists, advertisers, political strategists, and others have taken this method to new heights. But the rudiments of the soft sell remain the same. First, bring pleasure by creating a positive atmosphere around your name or message. Induce a warm, relaxed feeling. Never seem to be selling something. That will look manipulative and suspicious. Instead, let entertainment value and good feelings take center stage, sneaking the sale through the side door. And in that sale, you don't seem to be selling yourself or a particular idea or candidate. You are selling a lifestyle, a good mood, a sense of adventure, a feeling of hipness, or a neatly packaged rebellion. Here are some of the key components of the soft sell. Appear as news, never as publicity. First impressions are critical. If your audience first sees you in the context of an advertisement or publicity item, you instantly join the mass of other advertisements screaming for attention, and everyone knows that advertisements are artful manipulations, a kind of deception. So, for your first appearance in the public eye, Manufacture an event, some kind of attention-getting situation that the media will inadvertently pick up, as if it were news. People pay more attention to what is broadcast as news. It seems more real. You suddenly stand out from everything else, if only for a moment, but that moment has more credibility than hours of advertising time. The key is to orchestrate the details thoroughly, creating a story with dramatic impact and movement, tension, and resolution. The media will cover it for days. Conceal your real purpose to sell yourself at any cost.
Stir basic emotions. Never promote your message through a rational, direct argument. That will take effort on your audience's part and will not gain its attention. Aim for the heart, not the head. Design your words and images to stir basic emotions, lust, patriotism, family values. It's easier to gain and hold people's attention once you've made them think of their family, their children, their future. They feel stirred, uplifted. Now you have their attention and the space to insinuate your true message. Days later, the audience will remember your name, and remembering your name is half the game. Similarly, find ways to surround yourself with emotional magnets, war heroes, children, saints, small animals, whatever it takes. Make your appearance bring these emotionally positive associations to mind, giving you extra presence. Never let these associations be defined or created for you, and never leave them to chance. Make the medium the message. Pay more attention to the form of your message than to the content. Images are more seductive than words, and visuals, soothing colors, appropriate backdrop, the suggestion of speed or movement, should actually be your real message. The audience may focus superficially on the content or moral you're preaching, but they're really absorbing the visuals, which get under their skin and stay there longer than any words or preachy pronouncements. Your visuals should have a hypnotic effect. They should make people feel happy or sad, depending on what you want to accomplish. And the more they're distracted by visual cues, the harder it will be for them to think straight or to see through your manipulations. Speak the target's language. Be chummy. At all costs, avoid appearing superior to your audience. Any hint of smugness, the use of complicated words or ideas, quoting too many statistics, all that is fatal. Instead, make yourself seem equal to your targets and on intimate terms with them. You understand them. You share their spirit, their language. If people are cynical about the manipulations of advertisers and politicians, exploit their cynicism for your own purposes. Portray yourself as one of the folk, warts and all. Show that you share your audience's skepticism by revealing the tricks of the trade. Make your publicity as down-home and minimal as possible, so that your competitors look sophisticated and snobby in comparison. Your selective honesty and strategic weakness will get people to trust you. You are the audience's friend and intimate. Enter their spirit and they will relax and listen to you. Start a chain reaction. Everyone is doing it. People who seem to be desired by others are immediately more seductive to their targets. Apply this to the soft seduction. You need to act as if you've already excited crowds of people. Your behavior will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Seem to be in the vanguard of a trend or lifestyle, and the public will lap you up for fear of being left behind. Spread your image with a logo, slogans, posters, so that it appears everywhere. Announce your message as a trend, and it will become one. The goal is to create a kind of viral effect in which more and more people become infected with the desire to have whatever you're offering. This is the easiest and most seductive way to sell. Tell people who they are. It's always unwise to engage an individual or the public in any kind of argument. They will resist you. Instead of trying to change people's ideas, try to change their identity, their perception of reality, and you'll have far more control of them in the long run. Tell them who they are, create an image, an identity that they will want to assume. Make them dissatisfied with their current status. Making them unhappy with themselves gives you room to suggest a new lifestyle, a new identity. Only by listening to you can they find out who they are. At the same time, you want to change their perception of the world outside them by controlling what they look at. Use as many media as possible to create a kind of total environment for their perceptions. Your image should be seen not as an advertisement, but as part of the atmosphere. Some Soft Seductions 
Number 1. Andrew Jackson was a true American hero. In 1814, in the Battle of New Orleans, he led a ragtag band of American soldiers against a superior English army and won. He also conquered Indians in Florida. Jackson's army loved him for his rough-hewn ways. He fed on acorns when there was nothing else to eat. He slept on a hard bed. He drank hard cider, just like his men. Then, after he lost or was cheated out of the presidential election of 1824, in fact, he won the popular vote, but so narrowly that the election was thrown into the House of Representatives, which chose John Quincy Adams after much deal-making. He retired to his farm in Tennessee, where he lived the simple life, tilling the soil, reading the Bible, staying far from the corruptions of Washington. Where Adams had gone to Harvard, played billiards, drunk soda water, and relished European finery, Jackson, like many Americans of the time, had been raised in a log cabin. He was an uneducated man, a man of the earth. This, at any rate, was what Americans read in their newspapers in the months after the controversial 1824 election. Spurred on by these articles, people in taverns and halls across the country began talking of how the war hero Andrew Jackson had been wronged, how an insidious aristocratic elite was conspiring to take over the country. So when Jackson declared that he would run again against Adams in the presidential election of 1828, but this time as the leader of a new organization, the Democratic Party, the public was thrilled. Jackson was the first major political figure to have a nickname, Old Hickory, and soon Hickory Clubs were sprouting up in America's towns and cities. Their meetings resembled spiritual revivals. The hot-button issues of the day were discussed, tariffs, the abolition of slavery, and club members felt certain that Jackson was on their side. It was hard to know for sure, he was a little vague on the issues, but this election was about something larger than issues. It was about restoring democracy and restoring basic American values to the White House. Soon, the hickory clubs were sponsoring events like town barbecues, the planting of hickory trees, dances around a hickory pole. They organized lavish public feasts, always including large quantities of liquor. In the cities, there were parades, and these were stirring events. They often took place at night so that urbanites would witness a procession of Jackson supporters holding torches. Others would carry colorful banners with portraits of Jackson or caricatures of Adams and slogans ridiculing his decadent ways. And everywhere there was hickory. Hickory sticks, hickory brooms, hickory canes, hickory leaves in people's hats. Men on horseback would ride through the crowd, spurring at people into huzzas for Jackson. Others would lead the crowd in songs about old hickory. The Democrats, for the first time in an election, conducted opinion polls, finding out what the common man thought about the candidates. These polls were published in the papers, and the overwhelming conclusion was that Jackson was ahead. Yes, a new movement was sweeping the country— it all came to a head when Jackson made a personal appearance in New Orleans as part of a celebration commemorating the battle he had fought so bravely there fourteen years earlier. This was unprecedented. No presidential candidate had ever campaigned in person before. And, in fact, such an appearance would have been considered improper. But Jackson was a new kind of politician, a true man of the people. Besides, he insisted that his purpose for the visit was patriotism, not politics. The spectacle was unforgettable. Jackson entering New Orleans on a steamboat as the fog lifted, cannon fire ringing out from all sides, grand speeches, endless feasts, a kind of mass delirium taking over the city. One man said it was like a dream. The world has never witnessed so glorious, so wonderful a celebration. Never have gratitude and patriotism so happily united. This time, the will of the people prevailed. Jackson was elected president, and it wasn't one region that brought him victory. New Englanders, Southerners, Westerners, merchants, farmers, and workers were all infected with the Jackson fever. Interpretation 
After the debacle of 1824, Jackson and his supporters were determined to do things differently in 1828. America was becoming more diverse, developing populations of immigrants, Westerners, urban laborers, and so on. To win a mandate, Jackson would have to overcome new regional and class differences. One of the first and most important steps his supporters took was to found newspapers all around the country. While he himself seemed to have retired from public life, these papers promulgated an image of him as the wronged war hero, the victimized man of the people. In truth, Jackson was wealthy, as were all of his major backers. He owned one of the largest plantations in Tennessee, and he owned many slaves. He drank more fine liquor than hard cider, and slept on a soft bed with European linens. And while he might have been uneducated, he was extremely shrewd, with a shrewdness built on years of army combat. The image of the man of the earth disguised all this, and once it was established, it could be contrasted with the aristocratic image of Adams. In this way, Jackson's strategist covered up his political inexperience and made the election turn on questions of character and values. Instead of political issues, they raised trivial matters like drinking habits and church attendance. To keep up the enthusiasm, they staged spectacles that seemed to be spontaneous celebrations, but in fact were carefully choreographed. The support for Jackson seemed to be a movement, as evidenced and advanced by the opinion polls. The event in New Orleans, hardly non-political, and Louisiana was a swing state, bathed Jackson in an aura of patriotic, quasi-religious grandeur. Society has fractured into smaller and smaller units. Communities are less cohesive, even individuals feel more inner conflict. To win an election or to sell anything in large numbers, you have to paper over these differences somehow. You have to unify the masses. The only way to accomplish this is to create an inclusive image, one that attracts and excites people on a basic, almost unconscious level. You're not talking about the truth or about reality. You are forging a myth. Myths create identification. Build a myth about yourself, and the common people will identify with your character, your plight, your aspirations, just as you identify with theirs. This image should include your flaws, highlight the fact that you're not the best orator, the most educated man, the smoothest politician. Seeming human and down-to-earth disguises the manufactured quality of your image. To sell this image, you need to have the proper vagueness. It's not that you avoid talk of issues and details, that will make you seem insubstantial, but that all your talk of issues is framed within the softer context of character, values, and vision. You want to lower taxes, say, because it will help families, and you are a family person. You must not only be inspiring, but also entertaining. That is a popular, friendly touch. This strategy will infuriate your opponents who will try to unmask you, reveal the truth behind the myth, but that will only make them seem smug, over-serious, defensive, and snobbish. That now becomes part of their image, and it will help sink them. Number 2. On Easter Sunday, March 31, 1929, New York churchgoers began to pour onto Fifth Avenue after the morning service for the annual Easter parade. The streets were blocked off, and as had been the custom for years, People were wearing their finest outfits, women in particular showing off the latest in spring fashions. But this year, the promenaders on Fifth Avenue noticed something else. Two young women were coming down the steps of St. Thomas's Church. At the bottom, they reached into their purses, took out cigarettes, lucky strikes, and lit up. Then they walked down the avenue with their escorts, laughing and puffing away. A buzz went through the crowd. Women had only recently begun smoking cigarettes, and it was considered improper for a lady to be seen smoking in the street. Only a certain kind of woman would do that. These two, however, were elegant and fashionable. People watched them intently and were further astounded several minutes later when they reached the next church along the avenue. Here, 
two more young ladies, equally elegant and well-bred, left the church, approached the two holding cigarettes, and, as if suddenly inspired to join them, pulled out lucky strikes of their own and asked for a light. Now the four women were marching together down the avenue. They were steadily joined by more, and soon ten young women were holding cigarettes in public, as if nothing were more natural. Photographers appeared and took pictures of this novel sight. Usually at the Easter parade people would have been whispering about a new hat style or the new spring color. This year everyone was talking about the daring young women and their cigarettes. The next day photographs and articles appeared in the papers about them. A United Press dispatch read, Just as Miss Federica Freilinghusen, conspicuous in a tailored outfit of dark gray, pushed her way through the jam in front of St. Patrick's, Miss Bertha Hunt and six colleagues struck another blow in behalf of the liberty of women. Down Fifth Avenue they strolled, puffing at cigarettes. Miss Hunt issued the following communique from the smoke-clouded battlefield. I hope that we have started something, and that these torches of freedom, with no particular brand favored, will smash the discriminatory taboo on cigarettes for women, and that our sex will go on breaking down all discriminations. The story was picked up by newspapers around the country, and soon women in other cities began to light up in the streets. The controversy raged for weeks, some papers decrying this new habit, others coming to the women's defense. A few months later, though, public smoking by women had become a socially acceptable practice. Few people bothered to protest it any more. Interpretation in January 1929, several New York debutantes received the same telegram from a Miss Bertha Hunt. It said, In the interests of equality of the sexes, I and other young women will light another torch of freedom by smoking cigarettes while strolling on Fifth Avenue Easter Sunday. The debutantes who ended up participating met beforehand in the office where Hunt worked as a secretary. They planned what churches to appear at, how to link up with each other, all the details. Hunt handed out packs of lucky strikes. Everything worked to perfection on the appointed day. Little did the debutantes know, though, that the whole affair had been masterminded by a man, Miss Hunt's boss, Edward Bernays, a public relations advisor to the American Tobacco Company, makers of Lucky Strike. American tobacco had been luring women into smoking with all kinds of clever ads, but the consumption was limited by the fact that smoking in the street was considered unladylike. The head of American tobacco had asked Bernays for his help, and Mr. Bernays had obliged him by applying a technique that was to become his trademark, gain public attention by creating an event that the media would cover as news. Orchestrate every detail, but make them seem spontaneous. As more people heard of this event, it would spark imitative behavior. In this case, more women smoking in the streets. Bernays, a nephew of Sigmund Freud and perhaps the greatest public relations genius of the 20th century, understood a fundamental law of any kind of sell. The moment the targets know you're after something, a vote, a sale, they become resistant. But disguise your sales pitch as a news event and not only will you bypass their resistance, you can also create a social trend that does the selling for you. To make this work, the event you set up must stand out from all the other events that are covered by the media, yet it cannot stand out too far, or it will seem contrived. In the case of the Easter parade, Bernays, through Bertha Hunt, chose women who would seem elegant and proper even with cigarettes in their hands. Yet, in breaking a social taboo and doing so as a group, such women would create an image so dramatic and startling that the media would be unable to pass it up. An event that is picked up by the news has the imprimatur of reality. It's important to give this manufactured event positive associations, as Bernays did in creating a feeling of rebellion, of women banding together. Associations that are patriotic, say, or subtly sexual or spiritual, anything pleasant and seductive, take on a life of their own. Who can resist? 
people essentially persuade themselves to join the crowd without even realizing that a sale has taken place. The feeling of active participation is vital to seduction. No one wants to feel left out of a growing movement. Number 3. In the presidential campaign of 1984, President Ronald Reagan, running for re-election, told the public, it's morning again in America. His presidency, he claimed, had restored American pride. The recent successful Olympics in Los Angeles were symbolic of the country's return to strength and confidence. Who could possibly want to turn the clock back to 1980, which Reagan's predecessor, Jimmy Carter, had termed a time of malaise. Reagan's Democratic challenger, Walter Mondale, thought Americans had had enough of the Reagan soft touch. They were ready for honesty, and that would be Mondale's appeal. Before a nationwide television audience, Mondale declared, Let's tell the truth. Mr. Reagan will raise taxes, and so will I. He won't tell you. I just did. He repeated this straightforward approach on numerous occasions. By October, his poll numbers had plunged to all-time lows. The CBS News reporter Leslie Stahl had been covering the campaign, and as Election Day neared, she had an uneasy feeling. It wasn't so much that Reagan had focused on emotions and moods rather than hard issues. It was more that the media was giving him a free ride. He and his election team, she felt, were playing the press like a fiddle. They always managed to get him photographed in the perfect setting, looking strong and presidential. They fed the press snappy headlines along with dramatic footage of Reagan in action. They were putting on a great show. Stahl decided to assemble a news piece that would show the public how Reagan used television to cover up the negative effects of his policies. The piece began with a montage of images that his team had orchestrated over the years. Reagan, relaxing on his ranch in jeans, standing tall at the Normandy invasion tribute in France, throwing a football with his Secret Service bodyguards, sitting in an inner-city classroom. Over these images, Stahl asked, How does Ronald Reagan use television? Brilliantly. He's been criticized as the rich man's president, but the TV pictures say it isn't so. At 73, Mr. Reagan could have an age problem, but the TV pictures say it isn't so. Americans want to feel proud of their country again and of their president, and the TV pictures say you can. The orchestration of television coverage absorbs the White House. Their goal? To emphasize the president's greatest asset, which his aides say is his personality. They provide pictures of him looking like a leader, confident with his Marlboro Man walk. Over images of Reagan shaking hands with handicapped athletes in wheelchairs and cutting the ribbon at a new facility for seniors, Stahl continued, They also aim to erase the negatives. Mr. Reagan tried to counter the memory of an unpopular issue with a carefully chosen backdrop that actually contradicts the president's policy. Look at the handicapped Olympics or the opening ceremony of an old age home. No hint that he tried to cut the budgets for the disabled and for federally subsidized housing for the elderly. On and on went the piece, showing the gap between the feel-good images that played on the screen and the reality of Reagan's actions. President Reagan, Stahl concluded, is accused of running a campaign in which he highlights the images and hides from the issues. But there's no evidence that the charges will hurt him because when people see the president on television, he makes them feel good about America, about themselves, and about him. Stahl depended on the goodwill of the Reagan people in covering the White House, but her peace was strongly negative, so she braced herself for trouble. Yet a senior White House official telephoned her that evening. Great peace, he said. What? asked a stunned stall. Great peace, he repeated. Did you listen to what I said? she asked. Leslie, when you're showing four and a half minutes of great pictures of Ronald Reagan, no one listens to what you say. 
Don't you know that the pictures are overriding your message because they conflict with your message? The public sees those pictures and they block your message. They didn't even hear what you said. So in our minds, it was a four and a half minute free ad for the Ronald Reagan campaign for re-election. Interpretation Most of the men who worked on communications for Reagan had a background in marketing. They knew the importance of telling a story crisply, sharply, and with good visuals. Each morning, they went over what the headline of the day should be and how they could shape this into a short visual piece, getting the president into a video opportunity. They paid detailed attention to the backdrop behind the president in the Oval Office, to the way the camera framed him when he was with other world leaders, and to having him filmed in motion with his confident walk. The visuals carried the message better than any words could do. As one Reagan official said, What are you going to believe, the facts or your eyes? Free yourself from the need to communicate in the normal, direct manner, and you will present yourself with greater opportunities for the soft sell. Make the words you say unobtrusive, vague, alluring, and pay much greater attention to your style the visuals, the story they tell. Convey a sense of movement and progress by showing yourself in motion. Express confidence not through facts and figures, but through colors and positive imagery appealing to the infant in everyone. Let the media cover you unguided, and you are at their mercy. So turn the dynamic around. The press need drama and visuals? Provide them. It's fine to discuss issues or truth as long as you package it entertainingly. Remember, images linger in the mind long after words are forgotten. Do not preach to the public. That never works. Learn to express your message through visuals that insinuate positive emotions and happy feelings. Number 4. In 1919, the movie press agent Harry Reichenbach was asked to do advanced publicity for a picture called The Virgin of Stambul. It was the usual romantic potboiler in an exotic locale, and normally a publicist would mount a campaign with alluring posters and advertisements. But Harry never operated the usual way. He had begun his career as a carnival barker, and there the only way to get the public into your tent was to stand out from the other barkers, so Harry dug up eight scruffy Turks, whom he found living in Manhattan, dressed them up in costumes, flowing sea-green trousers, gold-crescented turbans, provided by the movie studio, rehearsed them in every line and gesture, and checked them into an expensive hotel. Word quickly spread to the newspapers, with a little help from Harry, that a delegation of Turks had arrived in New York on a secret diplomatic mission. Reporters converged on the hotel. Since his appearance in New York was clearly no longer a secret, the head of the mission, Sheikh Ali ben Mohammed, invited them up to his suite. The newspaper men were impressed by the Turks' colorful outfits, salams, and rituals. The Sheikh then explained why he had come to New York. A beautiful young woman named Sari known as the Virgin of Stambul, had been betrothed to the sheikh's brother. An American soldier, passing through, had fallen in love with her and had managed to steal her from her home and take her to America. Her mother had died from grief. The sheikh had found out she was in New York and had come to bring her back. Mesmerized by the sheikh's colorful language and by the romantic tale he told, the reporters filled the papers with stories of the Virgin of Stambul for the next several days. The sheik was filmed in Central Park and feted by the cream of New York society. Finally, Sari was found, and the press reported the reunion between the sheik and the hysterical girl, an actress with an exotic look. Soon after, the Virgin of Stambul opened in New York. Its story was much like the real events reported in the papers. Was this coincidence? A quickly made film version of the true story? No one seemed to know, but the public was too curious to care, and the Virgin of Stambul broke box office records. A year later, Harry was asked to publicize a film called The Forbidden Woman. 
It was one of the worst movies he had ever seen. Theater owners had no interest in showing it. Harry went to work. For 18 days straight, he ran an ad in all of the major New York newspapers that said, Watch the sky on the night of February 21st. If it is green, go the Capitol. If it is red, go the Rivoli. If it is pink, go to the Strand. If it is blue, go to the Rialto, for on February 21st, the sky will tell you where the best show in town can be seen. The Capitol, the Rivoli, the Strand, and the Rialto were the four big first-run movie houses on Broadway. Almost everyone saw the ad and wondered what this fabulous show was. The owner of the Capitol asked Harry if he knew anything about it, and Harry let him in on the secret. It was all a publicity stunt for an unbooked picture. The owner asked to see a screening of The Forbidden Woman. Through most of the film, Harry yakked about the publicity campaign, distracting the man from the dullness on screen. The theater owner decided to show the film for a week, and so, on the evening of February 21st, as a heavy snowstorm blanketed the city and all eyes turned to the sky, giant rays of light poured out from the tallest buildings, a brilliant show of green. An enormous crowd flocked to the Capitol Theater. Those who didn't get in kept coming back. Somehow, with a packed house and an excited crowd, the film didn't seem quite so bad. The following year, Harry was asked to publicize a gangster picture called Outside the Law. On highways across the country, he set up billboards that read in giant letters, If you dance on Sunday, you are outside the law. On other billboards, the word dance was replaced by play golf or play pool and so on. On a top corner of the billboards was a shield bearing the initials P.D., the public assumed this meant police department. Actually, it stood for Priscilla Dean, the star of the movie, and that the police, backed by religious organizations, were prepared to enforce decades-old blue laws prohibiting sinful activities on a Sunday. Suddenly, a controversy was sparked. Theater owners, golfing associations, and dance organizations led a counter-campaign against the blue laws. They put up their own billboards, exclaiming that if you did those things on Sunday, you were not outside the law, and issuing a call for Americans to have some fun in their lives. For weeks, the words outside the law were everywhere seen and everywhere on people's lips. In the midst of this, the film opened on a Sunday in four New York theaters simultaneously, something that had never happened before, and it ran for months throughout the country, also on Sundays. It was one of the big hits of the year. Interpretation Harry Reichenbach, perhaps the greatest press agent in movie history, never forgot the lessons he had learned as a barker. The carnival is full of bright lights, color, noise, and the ebb and flow of the crowd. Such environments have profound effects on people. A clear-headed person could probably tell that the magic shows are fake, the fierce animals trained, the dangerous stunts relatively safe. But people want to be entertained. It's one of their greatest needs. Surrounded by color and excitement, they suspend their disbelief for a while and imagine that the magic and danger are real. They are fascinated by what seems to be both fake and real at the same time. Harry's publicity stunts merely recreated the carnival on a larger scale. He pulled people in with the lure of colorful costumes, a great story, irresistible spectacle. He held their attention with mystery, controversy, whatever it took. Catching a kind of fever, as they would at the carnival, they flocked without thinking, to the films he publicized. The lines between fiction and reality, news and entertainment, are even more blurred today than in Harry Reichenbach's time. What opportunities that presents for soft seduction. The media is desperate for events with entertainment value, inherent drama. Feed that need. The public has a weakness for what seems both realistic and slightly fantastical, for real events with a cinematic edge. Play to that weakness.
stage events the way Bernays did, events the media can pick up as news. But here, you're not starting a social trend. You're after something more short-term, to win people's attention, to create a momentary stir, to lure them into your tent. Make your events and publicity stunts plausible and somewhat realistic, but make their colors a little brighter than usual, the characters larger than life, the drama higher. Provide an edge of sex and danger. You are creating a confluence of real life and fiction, the essence to any seduction. It's not enough, however, to win people's attention. You need to hold it long enough to hook them. This can always be done by sparking controversy, the way Harry liked to stir up debates about morals. While the media argues about the effect you're having on people's values, it is broadcasting your name everywhere and inadvertently bestowing upon you the edge that will make you so attractive to the public.